So before we start with our uh, first uh, speaker, Judy Hoffman, uh, I would like to give a brief overview of uh, of the workshop. So uh, the aim of this workshop, which has been going on for uh, five years now, is to promote the research in computer vision for methods and algorithms that uh, operate in adverse domains. And this means not in the context of adversarial examples that we're also used to, but in the case where the input is normally recorded, uh, but still there are the, the signal to noise ratio can be very low, for example, uh, in low light conditions such as nighttime or in poor visibility conditions such as under dense fog. Uh, so in these conditions, uh, normal uh, methods that are developed uh, for, for visual perception typically uh, break because they make some assumptions. For example, for the LIDAR uh, sensor, we make the assumption that the light which is emitted from, uh, from the transmitter of the sensor can actually propagate to the object and then back. But this might not always be true because there might be a, a certain thickness of the atmospheric medium. Uh, so for, for this workshop, we are interested both in uh, high level recognition methods, for example, segmentation, detection, uh, but also at low level techniques for processing and enhancing the inputs that uh, we get from the visual sensors. Uh, now, as to the uh, practical organization of the workshop, uh, this year we will have uh, nine keynote speakers uh, who will present their latest research on this topic of uh, adverse conditions and uh, robust, uh, robust vision algorithms under adverse conditions. And we will also uh, present an overview of the challenge that we organized in the context of this workshop. Uh, it's named the ACDC Challenge 2023, and it's based on our uh, ACDC dataset for semantic uh, perception in adverse conditions. So we'll give an overview of the challenge results, and we'll have also some presentations by the winning teams. So more concretely, to give you uh, an overview of uh, today's schedule, we will start with uh, three invited talks by Judith Hoffman, Tim Barfoot, and Erin Aksoy. Uh, then at 10.30, we'll have a coffee break. Uh, we will continue before lunch with two more invited talks by Daniel Kremers and Robbie Tan. Then we'll have our lunch break from 12 to 1.30. And then after the lunch break, we'll have Werner Ritter uh, to continue with the talk. Uh, we'll follow at uh, two o'clock uh, with the results of the ACDC challenge. We'll have another coffee break at three, and then we'll finally have three the, the three final invited talks by Patrick Perez, uh, Felix Heide, and Adam Kortilevsky. And then at five o'clock, uh, hopefully if we are in schedule, we will uh, wrap up the workshop with uh, a short conclusion. So uh, that's all from my side. And we can start with uh, Judy. So just a moment, Judy, before, before you start, I can give a short introduction uh, to our audience. Um, just a second. Yes, yes, perhaps it's better like that. So we have the HDMI cable here. And yeah. Okay, uh, Lucas. Uh... <coughs> ah, okay, okay. Uh, okay, good. So I'll just... Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let me talk. So, while Judy is preparing her connection, I can briefly introduce her to you. So, Judy Hoffman is a, is an assistant professor 
in the School of Interactive Computing at Georgia Tech and a member of the Machine Learning Center. Her research lies in, at the intersection of computer vision and machine learning with specialization in domain adaptation, transfer learning, adversarial robustness, and algorithmic fairness. Uh, she also serves this year at CBPR 2023 as a program co-chair of the conference. So welcome, Judy, and we look forward to hearing your talk. Great. Thank you. And thanks, everybody, for showing up at 9 a.m. for a talk. That's great. Um, so today I'm going to be not good. Oh, you want me to use my audio? Got it. This does my big internal view. Oh, yes. Perhaps that's one type of appearance change that we think we should be able to have systems that can accommodate. That's something that people can do. Maybe that's something we should be able to do. But even if we think that that gap is too far, still, if you've seen an elephant at the zoo, you would hope that you'd be able to recognize an elephant who went on safari. Now we see an elephant as it appears out in the wild. And if you've seen them out in safari, I hope that you would still be able to see them if there's fog. So these are all different appearance shifts of the same object category that we have no trouble disambiguating between. But our systems can struggle with these different variations. So overall, what we really love to be able to have in a nutshell is a vision system that is somehow reliable against the appearance changes that it might experience at deployment time. And so this talk is going to focus on two key aspects of this that can take us towards this overall goal of building reliable vision systems. The first one has to do with robust training. And what I mean by that is we wanna be able to design a training technique that can leverage as much data as possible in order to be able to adhere or um, be able to handle all kinds of variations at test time, just out of the box. That would be ideal. We have one system that we've created, we've incorporated all of our data, consumed as much as possible, and now work in as many situations as possible at test time. And the other key aspect of this is what I like to think of as robust analysis. So very frequently, the way that we evaluate our models is that we focus on having a static test set. And in that static test set, we have a fixed number of samples, and we use that to benchmark the performance of our system. But of course, this is inherently limited because that static test set can only capture a small portion of the world. And so you can't truly know what will happen at test time. So what we propose instead is to think about dynamic test sets that are generated in response to a particular model. All right, so let's get started with robust training. So we think about any type of real world data scenario. Self-driving cars is a great example. It's an outdoor recognition path. You wanna be able to recognize all of the salient things that you need in order to solve the driving problem. You need to know where the pedestrians are, the road, the street signs, and you need to be able to do it at different times of day, through different weather patterns, through different lighting conditions, 
you need to do it in urban environments, you need to do it in rural environments, and so on. So overall, if we kind of think about this problem and think about the distribution of images that you need to be able to accommodate, it's really quite vast. There's lots and lots of potential for change. And this is not the only application area where this is true. Of course, any application area that has to do with outside or uncontrolled environments is going to have to be able to accommodate lots and lots of different variations. But in something like self-driving, where you need to be able to label at a pixel level or at least at a level that can help you to solve all of the control problems that you need, annotations for this type of data can be really expensive. So if we think about the fact that we need to have lots and lots of data, okay, maybe if you're a self-driving car company, you're going to take the approach of let's drive around as much as possible, collect as much data as possible. Maybe if you have a huge budget, you're gonna label as much as possible. But still, it's only going to be a sparse sampling of the overall world. Even the same drive through the same portion of the city at a different time of day is going to look different. So of course, by all means, we should capture as much data as possible in that way. But it's always going to be missing some key aspects of the world. And very likely the key aspects that's going to be missing are in fact the ones that are more rare. So maybe you miss seeing accidents or you miss seeing a pedestrian jumping out in front of you unexpectedly. So a lot of the community has taken the approach of saying, can we augment our real training data with synthetic training data? Or maybe in the extreme, even train solely on synthetic data. The idea here being, well, first off, if you can generate the data, you implicitly have the labels, so that's very cost effective. And secondly, you can change the distribution of what you see. So you have those rare scenarios, you can just create them. Now you have examples to train from. But one of the key limitations of using synthetic data out of the box is of course, what's called the sim to real gap. And what that means simply is that when you train on synthetic data, the model that you've created is not likely to have exactly the same performance when used out of the box with real data. So for example, here's a standard challenge problem that people look at where you train first on the Grand Theft Auto data set. This is a fairly high fidelity simulator. The images look decently realistic, still not perfect. You train on that data. And if you were asking for a generalization problem, you would say, how well does this synthetically trained model perform out of the box on a real driving data set, like the city states data set shown here on the right? So let's look at an example of something like that running. Here is a test time cityscapes image. It's a real image taken from a driving environment. The goal here, if you're doing semantic segmentation, would be to be able to produce an output pixel annotation like this. You're recognizing not only the easier classes like the road right below you, but also the harder, smaller classes like the street signs in the background. Those ones are really important for being able to solve this task at hand. Okay, so this is what we would like to be able to have. But if we take our model that was trained on the Grand Theft Auto data set and just evaluate it on this image here, we make all kinds of mistakes. And again, those mistakes are distributed across all the different classes. They're, they adhere to both the road as well as missing the street signs in the background. So the first work that I'm gonna talk about today is called PASA. It's a data augmentation strategy that is designed to help close the sim to real gap. So more specifically, we're targeting this problem of sim to real generalization, where we'd like to be able to train on synthetic data and then evaluate the performance of the model that was trained on that synthetic data out of the box across not just one real environment, but maybe lots of different real environments. So we want to be able to see how well this system works out of the box. And we're going to do it across a number of different tasks, so object recognition, detection, and semantic segmentation. In an ideal world, the model that we would create would be very, very simple. It would help to close the sim to real gap, but wouldn't necessarily interfere with any other parts of the visual processing pipeline, any other algorithms that people had developed. And to that end, we also want it to be architecture agnostic. So we want to be able to use this tool specifically to help to be able to improve the training on synthetic data without necessarily impacting any of the overall, let's say, semantic segmentation or object detection pipeline. 
So broadly, when we think about the centripetal generalization problem, prior work falls into one of two camps. We have on the left side, the camp that focuses in on domain randomization or data augmentation. So changing the inputs in order to affect the variety of the diversity of the inputs that you have available to you at training time. And on the right-hand side, we have changes to the learning approaches through integration of regularization terms or different loss functions. PASA is gonna be in the first camp. We're proposing a data augmentation approach. And to understand the approach that we propose, we have to first think about what are the differences between synthetic and real data. So of course, when we think about the appearance gap, some of the key differences is that you might have just rendered the images with different low level statistics, different contrasts, different um, brightness conditions, but you also might have different textures and the content itself, meaning the actual cars that you generate might look a little different than what you see in the real world. So for this work, we were inspired by prior work that looked at the Fourier spectrum of image space and found some striking properties. Namely, if you take the FFT of an image and you look at the amplitude image or the phase image, you find that the amplitude image very frequently corresponds to things that we think of that have to do with the style of an image. And the phase has to do more with what we think of as the content of the image. And inspired by that, some prior work has thought about ways in which we can change the amplitude image as an augmentation strategy to help us to be able to mimic, let's say, the style of another domain. So they might do something like a mix-up strategy where they take the amplitude from an image from a different domain and replace it with the amplitude of an original image. So in our case, what we'd really love to do is we'd like to be able to, to take these insights and design a general purpose solution that can help us to augment in this frequency spectrum in the amplitude image to be able to close the sim to real gap. And we wanna be able to do it before we've even seen real data. We just wanna make the synthetic data more real-like. So we can start by performing an empirical study where we evaluate what is the difference between the data in this amplitude image from the synthetic and the real data sets. And we do that, you can see the blue line here is an example of the synthetic data and all of the red lines are three different real data sets. And what I'm plotting here is on the y-axis, I'm reporting the essentially variance in the amplitude image. So not necessarily the magnitude of the amplitude image, but rather how much diversity there is in this amplitude image. And on the x-axis, we have frequencies ranging from the low spectrum all the way to the high spectrum. And what I'm highlighting here in this gray box is the fact that there's a striking difference in the amount of diversity in this amplitude image especially at the high frequency components between synthetic and real data. There's a lot, lot more variance in the real data than in the synthetic data. So this motivates our algorithm PASTA, which is that <laughs> we want to be able to inject artificially a random amount of perturbation into this amplitude image in order to make it such that the synthetic data at training time has more diversity akin to the real data. So overall, if we put that together, what this looks like is we start with a source synthetic image. We take the FFT in order to get the amplitude and phase spectrum. What we're going to be doing is we're going to be perturbing this amplitude spectrum. In order to perturb it, we need to think about what is uh, the structure of that perturbation. For us, we choose a Gaussian structure where this Gaussian is varying with the frequency. And from those Gaussians, we have a Gaussian for every frequency component, we're going to be able to sample a perturbation factor. So overall, it looks something like this. If you're interested, the paper is online. The key here is just that we are making sure that we're perturbing with a stronger amount of variance as you get higher and higher frequencies. Okay. So altogether, once we sampled the jitter for each one of these frequency components in the amplitude image, we can just apply it as a multiplicative factor in order to get a perturbed amplitude image. The phase corresponds somewhat to content, so we're not going to modify that at all. And now we can reconstruct the image with an inverse FFT with the pristine phase and the augmented uh, amplitude image. 
So here are some examples of both pasta augmentations and another popular augmentation strategy called RAND aug. Now it's very important and worth noting that the goal of pasta is not to create images that look more realistic. In fact, they do not look realistic. What we are doing is we're making sure that the amplitude image at the high frequencies has more variance, which allows the model to be less tripped up by having only a few, like much fewer amounts of variance at training time, which allows it to generalize better out of the box to the real data. So I'll show you some examples of that. This first one, what we do is for semantic segmentation, we train on the Grand Theft Auto data set. This is a deep lab V3 model uh, with ResNet 50. And what you see here is that the baseline model, meaning just training on synthetic, evaluating on real, gets around 27 IOU. And this is average across three different real data sets. So this is a single model trained on GTA, used out of the box on cityscapes, BDE, and mapillary. When you apply the pasta augmentation, you can take that number all the way up to around 43. In fact, that number um, is quite good and it was in general beating a state-of-the-art performance that made modifications to the training pipeline. So where you could actually couple that together with our approach, ours is just a data augmentation strategy, very easy, just add it into your transforms function of your data loader. Okay. We can think about um, changing the architecture. Here's an example with a transformer-based architecture where we also have significant performance improvement over a baseline model. Here's an example for object detection where we can take the performance for a faster RCNN ResNet 50 from 39 up to about 56. And you can combine this together with other augmentation strategies like RANDAUG to get a little bit more performance improvement. And in fact, this number was already beating significantly the out-of-the-box performance of um, a domain adaptation uh, algorithm. In the case of unsupervised domain adaptation, you have access to the real data. So you can specialize your model to the particular test situation that you're considering. So altogether, this is a very, very simple plug and play approach. Code is available online. You pass it into your data loader and it helps you to close the sim to real gap. Okay, for the remainder of the talk, I'm gonna move on to talking about robust analysis. So PASTA was a technique to help us to close the sim to gap, improve our training, um, the robustness of our training when we have synthetic data to start with. Up next for robust analysis, I'm gonna talk about this work called Lance. And actually the lead author is in the audience, Viraj. So this work is really focusing on trying to design a dynamic test set. We can think about the motivation as such. Oftentimes in the vision community, we have benchmarks that we use in order to measure the performance of our model over time. This is great. It allows us to compare against one another. And so we can create plots like the one on the right, where we look at state-of-the-art performance on a task like, let's say, ImageNet famously, and how it improves throughout the years and how it compares all the different models that are competing in a challenge at a time. Now, the problem is, is that once your model is getting close to the 100% point, you start to think about deploying it. And all of a sudden, this static test set that was really great for comparing a bunch of different models is not necessarily encompassing all of the scenarios that you might see at deployment time. And so we need to have a new type of evaluation protocol where we can directly inspect the model, where it will fail, and understand the ways in which it's making decisions. If we go back to our example from before of the self-driving scenario, of course, we have all types of variations and any static test set that we collect, even if we try our best to collect examples across all the types of variations that we can enumerate, it's still not going to capture everything that you might see at test time. And this is a problem when you're dealing with a high risk application because you really need to be able to have some measure of trustworthiness and reliability before you deploy a system that could impact people's lives. So our proposal, is to be able to directly inspect a model using dynamic test sets. And here's how it works. We have an example test image. This is taken from the hard image data set. So this example image already has a goal prediction, uh, which in this case is dog sled. So it's an image, it has some dogs there, it has <clears throat> a person a little bit, kind of hard to see in the background because I have uh, this label at the top. But regardless, what we see here is that our model, in this case, we're inspecting an off-the-shelf ResNet 50 model, 
our model is able to correctly predict dog sled. So under a standard evaluation protocol, you would think that's great. We're getting it right. We're evaluating the model and we're getting the correct prediction here. But if you look closer at the image, actually the dog sled is not really visible in this image. So probably the model has learned some type of correlation in the data. Maybe that has to do with this particular layout of dogs with snow, that it's likely there is a dog sled. Okay, so you might say that's fine. This is a beneficial correlation. It helps us to be able to solve the problem. The difficulty with that is that we don't necessarily know what are these correlations that the model is leveraging in order to solve this problem. And if we don't know that, then we have a difficult time understanding under what conditions, if we were to remove some of those correlations, would we stop being able to perform this problem? So for that, we're going to be proposing to generate language-guided counterfactuals, or LANs. And what will happen is we're going to take this original test image, and we're going to ask what would happen if we made some small change to it. So for example, what would happen if instead of a husky, we changed it to be a golden retriever? Would we still predict dog sled? In this case, yes. In fact, the strength of the prediction even gets higher which is odd. Or if we change it to Labradoodle, we no longer predict dog sled. And certainly if we change it to Pomeranian, we no longer predict dog sled. Okay, so perhaps there's something about dog breeds that has an impact on whether or not we're going to be predicting this particular category of interest. And you could do this all kinds across all kinds of different factors. It doesn't have to just be dog breed. So overall, the way that this Lance approach works is that our, our goal here is to be able to evaluate an off-the-shelf model, right? We've already done the static test set. We already know this model works pretty well in our lab type environment. Now we want to understand why it's working, how it's working, and when it might fail, most importantly. So because we already have this off-the-shelf model, we can, of course, think about how it performs on a given test set. In this case, here's an example taken from that hard image data set. And here it's correctly predicting the category of interest, which is how they're monkey. So what we can do is we can use an off-the-shelf captioner, flip two in this case, in order to generate a caption for this image. And this caption is a black monkey sitting on top of a tree with green leaves. Now using our Lance approach, we're going to impose a structured perturbation. This is something that we have to learn. We're gonna start with a large language model, fine tune it in order to perform the types of structured perturbations that we want for exploring the deficiencies of our model. In this case, we're going to change green leaves to be orange leaves. From there, we can use a text, a, a prompting-based image generation protocol that's also constrained by um, the original image in order to produce a modified image that adheres to the new caption. In this case, it now has orange leaves. Okay, so now from this counterfactual image, we can ask how well does the model perform? And in this case, even though we didn't change anything about the subject, we just added orange leaves, the model is now predicting a different class, gorilla. And we can do this programmatically across lots and lots of types of variation. And in order to monitor the results, in order to find the most salient and interesting deficiencies in a model or the things that have the highest impact on the performance of the model, we can just measure how much the prediction of the ground truth class changes across a set of perturbations. Now, in general, there's lots of different ways that you could perturb a caption. You could do it randomly. You could just pick a, a word and you could ask to do um, mask prediction. In our case, we found that it worked much better if we used some type of a structured perturbation strategy. And that structure adheres to five different types of changes, subject, object, adjective, domain, and background. I'll show you some examples of that. So the first one, subject edit, is the example that we saw before. Here we have a photo of a group of husky dogs pulling a dog sled across a snow-covered field with people in the background. That's our original image. If we do a subject edit, we might change this dog to be from a husky to a schnauzer. And we can look at what happens. In this case, the prediction of dog sled goes away. If we do an object edit, we might edit some object in the background. So in this case, these are monkeys that are on in a forest. We could change it to a bamboo forest and we could see whether or not that has impact on the performance of the system. In this case, it doesn't really. 
We could do a background edit. So we could take a playground and we can make it a snowy playground. In this case, you start to see hallucinations occur. So when you have a snowy <laughs> playground, the horizontal bar prediction is still there, though with much, much less um, confidence. But what emerges, which is incorrect, is ski and pole. So this is illuminating a type of correlation that is between snow and a person and assuming they're skiing. And the last one I'll show is domain edit. In this case, we can take a photo of a monkey and change it to a sculpture of a monkey. And we can again monitor the performance. In this case, it's changing uh, the prediction of this monkey. So we can quantitatively evaluate how much these Lance perturbations impact the performance of different off the shelf systems. In this case, we're evaluating a ResNet 50 model, a VITB model. These ones are trained on ImageNet, ConfNex B, and then a CLIP model. And you could do this across lots of different models. It should be agnostic. All you need to be able to do is evaluate the model on an image. Okay, so just to ground ourselves, we can start by evaluating the performance of these systems on our original static test set, which in this case is the test set for the hard image data set. These models seem to perform pretty well. And to make sure that our generation process isn't introducing too much bias into the whole pipeline, we can also imagine taking our model or taking our image that has been reconstructed without changing the caption um, in, and ask how well does our model perform on recognizing on those images. This will basically test whether or not our model is dropping in performance just because the generator is bad. In this case, we find that the performance doesn't change too significantly, so that's good. It means our generator um, is something viable to use for this purpose. We can study what would happen if we were to use random perturbations, so randomly select an, a word um, and be able to predict the mask that was missing. In this case, there are some minor changes. Um, they're noticeable, but nowhere near as significant as if you do our structured perturbation strategy. In the structured perturbation strategy, you can find or you can illuminate a lot more types of counterfactuals that have dramatic impact on the performance of the system. And I'll show you just one example of this. So in general, you can do this at an instance level. You can um, generate a counterfactual. You can ask what would change um, on this particular image and this particular prediction. But of course, that's inherently noisy. We'd like to be able to do data set level statistics. So one way in which you could use this tool in order to get closer to the data set level statistics and understanding something more systematic about the model is you could do what we call class level perturbation. So for a particular class, in this case, it's Howler Monkey, we could take a number of different images, I'm just showing here three on the slide, and we could perform a consistent type of intervention. So in this case, we're gonna be changing color. The color that we change might be random, but we're going to be perturbing color always across the whole set of Howler Monkey images and asking how much does the performance of the model change in response to these color changes. The idea here being, if it changes a lot, that means that perhaps the model's predictions on this category howler monkey are inherently tied to this perturbation factor of color. So for these examples here, the first one, we have leaves behind the monkey and we can change them to orange leaves. And we can ask what happens. In this case, the performance or the predictive performance of howler monkey changes, we start to predict spider monkey. For the second image, actually originally the model gets it wrong and is predicting black bear with the highest performance. And once we change it to be in a pink field, it starts to predict howler monkey. So it's still a change in the performance. There's still some type of um, color association. And the last one, we can change it to snowy leaves. And in this case, the prediction doesn't change that significantly. So we have lots of other examples of this in the paper if you are interested. But because we are short on time, I'm just going to conclude today's talk by reminding you of the two different key broad areas that we focused on towards this goal of developing reliable vision systems that work out of the box at deployment time. The first one was a data augmentation strategy for closing the centripetal gap, helping us to be able to train on synthetic data so that we can see all kinds of variation at training time in a cheap, cost-effective way. And the second one is dynamic evaluation to be able to modify our images in a structured way that can help illuminate any of 
the implicit correlations the model is leveraging in order to make decisions. I tried to highlight some of the key authors before I presented those works, and I encourage you um, to talk to them throughout the conference. Uh, but I also want to thank all of the lab members um, from our lab at Georgia Tech, all of whom contributed to these work through discussions and um, lots of support. I'll take any questions you have now. Thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. So I guess we have time for a couple of questions. Uh, is there any question from the audience? If you want, you can come also to the microphone. Um, perhaps in the meantime, I can uh, I can ask a question. So uh, regarding the first part of, uh, of the talk where you uh, referred to data augmentation techniques, so uh, we see that there is a lot of work uh, about on augmentation at the level of the style or let's say the uh, the appearance the contrast the brightness the texture uh, i was wondering if you if you have some um some like uh, intuition about the structural level augmentation so if if we would like to perturb uh, the, the the synthetic images, for example, in, in a way that they the, the content or the let's say the configuration of the scene is closer to what we would get in reality or to something that we, we, we know it's challenging and we want to train on that to get a better performance. What would be your uh, what would be your take on that? So there's a lot of work, um, which has not been by our lab, but there's a lot of work out there in the literature that are, are trying to make synthetic data or, or simulators more realistic in general. I think that's probably the right approach if you want to make a content intervention. We have a lot of tools to be able to design and, and develop new content. The difficulty, of course, is that even as we make them more realistic, at least until now, they've still not been able to mimic exactly reality. And so the performance of the model still degrades. But I think in the case of augmentations and interventions that are more generic, that's more helpful for things like low-level statistics. If you want to make large changes to the images, we should leverage our graphics colleagues and we should be able to be pushing forward in the simulator development. Okay, yeah, that certainly uh, makes sense. Uh, any other questions perhaps? Okay, yeah. Um, on the dynamic evaluation, uh, can you please come? Can you please come to the microphone because we also want the Zoom participants to be able to to listen to the question. <laughs> yeah. Um, Thank you. So on the dynamic evaluation part, it seems like we're trying to understand what's the relationship between other things in the environment and the prediction. Like, is this a howling monkey given that they use a green? Um, and it seems like that's kind of like a bug, but in some cases, is that like a feature? Um, yeah, absolutely. I think that the first example I showed of the dog sled is, is a prime example of how sometimes these correlations can be a feature. It correctly predicted dog sled, even though perhaps you would say that the object of interest is not even really visible. It was using correlations of the types of dogs, the configuration of them, things like that. Um, and that's Fine. There's no there's no judgment on whether or not a correlation is good or bad, but the issue is if you don't understand any of the correlations and you can't understand when the model will fail when that correlation is no longer present. All right, let's uh, thank Judy once again. And uh, we can move on uh, with our next speaker, uh, Tim Barfoot. Uh, Tim will join us online on Zoom. So let me first replug my laptop. Move Zoom to or you have to Zoom. Uh, okay. Uh, so Tim, uh, you can uh, unmute yourself. 
Let me give a brief introduction of you to the audience, and then we can start with your talk. Sounds good. Great. So uh, Tim Barfoot is a professor at the University of Toronto and the head of the Autonomous Space Robotics Laboratory. The purpose of his lab's research program is to advance visual navigation of mobile robots. His work finds application in transportation, planetary exploration, mining, warehouses, offices, and military scenarios. And today he will be talking about uh, expanding operational domain for localization and mapping. Uh, team, uh, the scene is yours. Thanks a lot. Great. Just a quick sound check. You can hear me okay? Here uh, at the uh, at the conference room, we can hear you fine. I guess if we have some problem with Zoom, we can uh, we can see it uh, uh, as the top rounds. Sounds great. Okay, so thanks so much to the organizers for the invitation, and I'm particularly disappointed that I can't be there in person since uh, CB Power is in Canada to, this year, um, and I'm in Canada, but uh, it is what it is. So here we go on Zoom. Uh, so just really quickly, what does our lab do? I come from a slightly different community than, than maybe the, the mainstream CVPR community, mainly from robotics. So uh, my lab is focused primarily on creating different autonomy algorithms that across the entire autonomy stack. So localization, mapping, planning, control. And we do get involved with real world applications pretty often. So we, we like to take these building blocks that we've built up and deploy them on real robots to kind of test our assumptions. And probably like most good robotics labs, this interaction of you know, bottoms up and top down approaches to research uh, really allows us to make good progress. So today, this is my, my outline of the talk today, just to fit the theme of the workshop, I wanted to give a bit of a progress report on our long-term efforts uh, to, to look at localization and mapping in challenging environments. Um, I'll talk a little bit about using cameras for navigation uh, which is something we've been doing for, for quite a while, and we're doing that mainly off-road in challenging lighting and weather conditions. Then I'll move to the on-road scenario where we've been looking at different sensors, radar and LIDAR for, for localization on the road and trying to understand sort of the advantages of each of those. Uh, then I'll talk about what may be a new sensor for some of you, something called a Doppler LIDAR, which is a, a fun new thing that we've been playing with for the last year. And I don't think there'll be time for this last fourth topic since the talks are pretty short, but uh, I may briefly mention uh, some work we've been doing on the back end to improve robustness there. So just moving into the first part, let's talk about on off-road navigation using cameras. So it's been a long-term effort of ours to build up a technique that we call visual teach and repeat. And the idea is you take a robot to an off-road environment and we don't assume that there's any structure that we can exploit. Um, and the idea is that a user will demonstrate to the robot all of the paths that it's allowed to operate on. So you could imagine this scenario over here on the left. There's a bunch of paths in this abandoned mining environment. We use a single demonstration of each path uh, and build up maps of each of these little segments and connect them together in an offline mapping. Well, it's online, but it's a, it's a pre-mapping step. And then we want to deploy the robot and have it operate on this network of paths. And we call this the repeat phase. And so the idea there is the robot needs to use just its live camera data to match against the maps that we built in the, in the teaching phase in order to know exactly where it is. And that's good enough to get the robot to drive very accurately within its tracks uh, across uh, lots of different types of environments. It's pretty efficient in, in the basic form. This only really requires one laptop, one stereo camera, and one training example of each path. It's lightweight in that it does not require GPS. And in, in the basic version, it doesn't even require DNNs. So that might be blasphemous at this conference. Um, and we don't really require any semantics or structure. And the technique is composable in the sense that we can drive paths that are combinations of these smaller path segments um, that weren't seen in the teaching phase. And it's also kind of a nice paradigm for lifelong learning in that as we're repeating these path segments many times, we can generate new training data sets in order to improve different components within our autonomy stack. Um, and under the hood, basically the way this mapping phase works is as we drive the robot, it's carrying out visual odometry and estimating the relative transforms along its path. It's also storing all the landmarks that it sees uh, relative to the poses at which they were originally observed. And that constitutes our map. So it's really this purely relative structure that's sitting under the, under the hood. 
At repeat time, we have a new pose that we want to localize against this. We reobserve some landmarks, and then we can figure out exactly where we are relative to the path. And that's good enough to know within a small number of centimeters where we are compared to the paths that we've taught. And as we drive, we estimate our motion using visual odometry while interleaving that with map matching. So as long as one of these two is working, we can continue to drive because we know where we are. And as we think about control, we can look forward at the shape of the path and we can use something like model predictive control to generate the best inputs to keep us close to the path as we move. So that's a quick summary of how visual teach and repeat works. And that's good enough. You know, If you were to zoom into any one of these path segments, it would look like this map structure under the hood. That's good enough that we can build this up and drive very accurately in our tracks when the lighting and weather is cooperative. So how do we deal with things like lighting change? So I've talked about how we have this teaching phase and a repeat phase where we need to match our live scans back to the, the map that we've built. The challenge is what happens if the lighting has changed significantly from the teach phase to the repeat phase? And I think this is a problem that underlies a lot of localization and mapping. So here these videos are about seven hours apart. To us, it's very clear that we're in the same place, but to the underlying algorithms, you know, 10 years ago, if we were using uh, handcrafted features that would not be good enough for matching. And one of the things we thought about 10 years ago uh, was the idea of putting in bridging experiences. So we might not be able to directly match the current imagery back to the ones that were acquired during mapping, but if we had actually driven the route at some point midway between the teach and the repeat times, the lighting change would be smaller, and then we could try to match sort of through these bridging experiences. And not just one, but maybe two or four or as many of these bridging experiences as you like. And you can kind of see here that we can then treat this as like one giant spatiotemporal pose graph where we can match features uh, all the way back to the, the teach phase, even though we might not be able to directly match anything. So this, this was sort of like seven years ago. This was good enough to teach a, a map in daytime, keep driving as the lighting changed, and still be repeating at nighttime with headlights on, even though we couldn't directly match the, the live imagery back to the map. And we continue to work on this localization and mapping paradigm. Um, we've deployed this on a lot of different robots over the years in a lot of different types of scenarios, everything from planetary to military, mining, in the air, underground, all kinds of different places. Uh, you can actually download this software from GitHub. It's built on ROS2, uh, and you can deploy that on, on your robot. Um, it does work with cameras. We also have a version that works with LiDAR, and we're soon to put out a version that works with radar, which I'll talk a bit more about later. So now that's sort of a, a quick recap of this teach and repeat paradigm. But really, you know, deep learning happened since we started working on this stuff. And one of the things we started asking ourselves in the last couple of years is, could we actually get away without using these bridging experiences at all? So although we were driving well in our tracks, we required the, the idea of repeating the routes at some intermediate time in order to gather this extra data. So could we actually get away without that? And here are some examples of you know, the same place, but at different lighting conditions or the same place in different seasons. And the question was, was deep learning the savior that could actually allow us to match these things directly? Um, you know, there's been many different approaches to looking at even just learning features. Of course, there, there are people that have tried to regress pose entirely. Uh, this slide is just a, a non-exhaustive list of some of the people that have looked at trying to deep learn features that could fit into the pipeline that I just talked about. Um, the one that we kind of latched onto was this one down here called Under the Radar, uh, where they're, they were actually learning features for radar localization, but they were doing that in the context of the localization problem itself. So they were sort of end-to-end -end learning these features that would be good for radar localization. So we were inspired by that. Um, and we built a similar type of scenario uh, where we were using camera images and we wanted to come up with a network that could output features, scores, and descriptors that could be matched uh, in order to produce good localization. And the way that we did that was uh, we actually only learned the, the feature extraction part of the problem. And the rest of this localization chain was actually fixed, although we built it in a differentiable way so that we could back propagate. Uh, actually, yeah, we, we could back propagate all the way through the pipeline in order to learn just this part and then effectively throw this part away and then plug the features into our existing uh, visual teach and repeat pipeline. Now, the question is if we're doing this in a supervised way, where can we get these labels? Um, and in fact, we don't really want to have to 
provide labels at the individual individual feature level, we'd like to provide that at a higher level. So uh, in this paradigm, the only supervision that's required is, is actually knowing the pose of this feature, this image with respect to this one. But even then, the question is, where do we get that pose? Um, you know, you could think about trying to do that with GPS, but already GPS is not, it's very difficult to get that precision of, of pose labels out of a GPS system. And so we actually, what we did was we used the multi-experience version of localization that I already just told you about uh, to build labels to then try to train features that would not require these bridging experiences. Uh, so this is kind of, uh, you know, looking back at that spatial temporal pose graph, we could actually grab any two images and figure out what the pose transform is between them by working through the, the poses that we've already solved for with our older system. Um, and so you can generate as many of these, these training labels that you want. And what we did was we took data from 2016. We had a, some large data sets that we built up. Those are publicly available uh, that deal with lighting change and weather change. So this is gathered over 30 hours. This is gathered over three months uh, just outside of our lab. Lots of different lighting and weather conditions. And we trained the, the features using that paradigm that I just told you about. And then last year, we taught new paths. Now the features are fixed. We taught new paths in a similar, but not exactly the same area to see if we could then use these features to localize and repeat paths that uh, the robot had not seen before under quite different lighting and weather conditions. Well, actually mostly lighting, I should say. So here's just a qualitative example of that working. Uh, we've got the robot repeating a path uh, that was taught at daytime sort of midday without sun flares, and now you're seeing repeats at a lot of different conditions. The red dots are the features that it's able to match from the, the condition you're seeing in the image back to this sort of midday overcast kind of condition. So even at nighttime with headlights on, we're finding enough features that we can continue to drive, even though those features are being matched back to quite a different condition. Uh, here's a more quantitative view of what that looks like. So we caught the path at midday, this is a plot of the time of day and the number of features that we're able to match as a sort of proxy of the quality of the localization. And we can see, you know, at the, at the time at which we taught the path, we get the most matches. And as the time sort of falls away from that, it is, is more different, uh, the number of features falls away. And this is sort of the, the break at uh, daybreak from, from night until the sun comes up until the early morning. So it does drop off quite a bit, but this is still quite a few features and it's enough for us to continue to drive. We were actually able to measure how well we could repeat these paths um, and sort of got down to the four centimeter root mean squared error on repeats as measured by a high quality GPS system. Um, and that's across all the different lighting, all the different lighting conditions within a, a single day. We even did an experiment, a bit of a longer experiment where we taught a path at midday in a, in a day at the beginning of September and then continued to drive all the way through to the end of November. And you can kind of see the number of features that we're able to match back to this hot map way back here. We are starting to get some failures out here in October and in November, but by and large, it's actually doing quite well. Um, you know, I was a bit of a, I guess, a, a, a late adopter of, of deep learning, but this is one of the first times in my own lab where I saw deep learning do something that was quite impressive to me, because we certainly could have been able to do this type of thing even just a few years ago. Um, so the paradigm I just described was a supervised learning approach to learn these features that we that we then used for localization. I won't get into the details, but we just presented at ICRA a couple of weeks ago the unsupervised version of that, where we didn't require the labels uh, from that multi-experience localization approach, because you wouldn't want to build that and then not use it. So the question was, could we do this unsupervised? And it turns out that you can, and it does just as well as the as the supervised version. Okay. Coming back to the outline, so that was my little uh, explanation of what we're doing with cameras off-road. Let's talk a little bit about using other sensors, radar and LiDAR, for on-road localization. And I just want to start by mentioning that we just put out a new data set from our lab called the Boreas data set, the Boreas All-Weather Autonomous Driving data set. Um, there's lots of driving data sets out there. There are not that many that are great for localization, uh, and we so we decided to build one of our own. And the key feature is that we actually drive the same route, the 10 kilometer route, about 40 plus times over the course of a year in a lot of different lighting and weather conditions. There's at least five snowstorms uh, in the, the repeats that we've got there. And we've got cameras, LiDAR, and radar uh, in the sensor suite. 
So you're welcome to use that. It's on AWS. There's a leaderboard for odometry and localization so far. Uh, so I won't bore you with the details of how we build up our localization. It's very similar to how we do this with cameras, uh, but we're doing it now with LiDAR and radar. One of the things that we were interested in is the question of, you know, is radar something that we would want to look at to help us with adverse weather conditions? There's a lot of talk about radar being really good in fog and snow and rain and all these things. But the question was, does it actually help us with localization? So we decided to build both a LiDAR and a radar localization pipeline and directly compare them to see which one was doing better, particularly in these edging corner cases, like in the middle of a snowstorm. And it was a little bit surprising. So the, the spoiler is that our, our LiDAR actually does pretty well for localization, even in bad weather conditions. Uh, we're able to measure that it does about five centimeters accuracy uh, across all of the different conditions that we tested in, and radar is doing about 10 centimeters. It's a less precise sensor, so that's that's somewhat to be expected in nominal conditions. The surprising thing is that LiDAR actually does pretty well even in difficult weather conditions for localization, as we found. Um, the other thing to mention is that uh, one of the things we saw is that the, the radar and the letter do actually see a lot of common structure, which begs the question of, could you build the maps that you want to localize against using LiDAR, using maybe a, an expensive survey vehicle that's operated in good weather conditions, and then use the, the radar in really bad weather conditions to localize against those maps? So we actually, we actually compared a bunch of different things, LiDAR to LiDAR, radar to radar, and radar to LiDAR. So we built the maps with LiDAR and, and localized with radar. Um, here's actually another thing I'll just point out is that I think the next talk is going to talk quite a bit about this. Here's some data from LiDAR in a, in a snowstorm, and you can kind of see all this clutter. These snowflakes are being detected. Um, the thing with localization is because we've got Ransack in there to kind of reject any of the, the bad data associations, we can actually filter those uh, snowflake detections out pretty easily. And here's an example of the, the data points that were actually used for localization in this frame. The rest of the snowflakes were actually easily filtered away by the algorithms. Um, I won't bore you with all the details. This is sort of, I already gave you the spoiler. LiDAR to LiDAR, we're sort of down at state of the art sub five centimeter accuracy on the road for our accuracy of the of localization. Radar, we're actually doing a little better than this now. We're at about 10 centimeters longitudinal and lateral. And radar matched to LiDAR maps were actually, originally we weren't doing quite as well as the radar to radar, but now we're sitting somewhere between ladder to ladder and radar to radar. So my numbers are a bit out of date on this slide. But I guess the answer is we can actually localize pretty well with all of these different sensing modalities and even cross modality uh, from LiDAR to radar. Okay, I'm keeping an eye on the clock. Um, someone stop me when there's only two minutes left. Um, the last, uh, the second last thing I wanna talk about is uh, as a new sensor called a Doppler LiDAR. And I'm not sure if, if that's come up yet at CVPR, but uh, it's something we've been using for the last year that's pretty exciting. And I'll just start by showing you uh, some of the data. Uh, so this is a LiDAR point cloud. And normally you would imagine this would be colored by altitude or something like that, range. This is actually colored by radial velocity. So for every single one of these LiDAR points along the direction of the, the LiDAR beam, we can actually get the velocity of the object or the relative velocity between the radar and whatever object it's detecting. And you can see here when the car is sitting still, we can actually see all the vehicles moving around. So you, you almost get some kind of segmentation for free. Uh, we're working with this, we're working with a company called Eva out of Silicon Valley uh, that builds uh, and sells these LiDARs. Uh, it's a really cool product. Um, we've been looking at using it for localization and for, in particular, for LiDAR only odometry. So I'll tell you a little bit of better progress on that. So if you kind of assume that the scene is static and we're the only thing that's moving, we can try to estimate our motion using this velocity information. Uh, for those that don't know how a Doppler LiDAR works, it's another, another name for it is a frequency modulated continuous wave LiDAR, which is the, the technology that's typically used for, or the ranging principle that's used in radar. Only now it's being used in the optical spectrum. So somewhere in the sort of 1500 nanometer spectrum. And the idea is that you can modulate the, an outgoing chirp. Uh, and when you get the reflected signal, you can kind of measure the, the shift in the frequency, and that is sort of the range that can be converted to range by using the, the slope of this modulation and the, the time of, you can work out the time of flight from the slope of that modulation and the shift in the frequency using this formula actually. 
Now, there's a slight problem, which is that if there's a relative velocity between the thing that's being imaged and the, and the LIDAR, you also get a bit of a shift in the frequency due to the Doppler effect. And the way to disentangle the, the range delta F and the Doppler delta F is that you send two chirps, one with an up going slope and one with a down going slope. And then you basically get two equations and two unknowns that the range delta F changes sign as you flip from a positive slope to a negative, whereas the Doppler one does not change sign. So you just get two equations and two unknowns. You can solve for the two delta Fs and then you can compute both the range and the, the velocity for every point. Uh, so that, that's pretty neat. And it does a couple of interesting things for us. Um, one of the things that was a little surprising is that if you look at this first video over on the left, I'm first showing some Velodyne data in a snowstorm. And now we're looking at the EVA Doppler LiDAR in the same snowstorm. And you can kind of see these, these uh, spurious detections, this clutter from the snow is actually pretty much automatically removed by using the Doppler LiDAR. And it's because when you go to solve those two equations into unknowns, the first chirp might have hit the snowflake and the second one probably would not, or vice versa, in which case you just sort of get a bad solution and you can automatically detect and remove those points at the hardware level. Uh, of course, we get new velocity information. And then one of the things that turns out to be very cool is that even in geometrically degenerate situations, we can start to estimate our motion with this type of information. Uh, so this is a bit of a busy slide, but we built up a, a LiDAR-only odometry pipeline where we um, are doing a couple of things. We're, we're building, it's a sliding window filter. We're building up a, a, a map of points. We're matching new scans back to that map. So we have, we have uh, factors in our, in our cost that we're trying to minimize to do with matching back to the map. We also have some motion consistency. Um, factors, and then we have these new velocity factors as well. So we kind of put all of these three different sources of information into a single cost function and minimize that um, using sort of the standard factor graph approach, uh, and that can produce our motion over time. And it's, it's quite neat. You know, in nominal conditions, we kind of do similarly to a, a standard ICP style algorithm, but when you start to get into more challenging situations involving tunnels, our accuracy is, is quite a bit better. And even if you start to go into something like a highway scenario and then maybe even range limit the data a little bit, um, you can start to see the difference between a standard ICP algorithm and this one that makes use of the velocity information. Uh, here's an example in a tunnel. This was the Robin Williams tunnel. Uh, it's a 300 meter long tunnel. You can see the, the ground truth in dashed blue. A standard ICP algorithm, even one that's motion compensated, is sort of this orange estimate, which falls quite short of the, the actual length of the tunnel. And then our algorithm that's got the new velocity information is, is very close to the ground truth. So even in this sort of geometrically degenerate degree of freedom along the tunnel where ICP typically would fail, the velocity information can kind of help reduce our drift in that degree of freedom. And here's just a qualitative example of the of the odometry working. So we're somewhere out on the highway. And I'll just try to see if I can go a little bit further into the video here. I'll just move a little further. So here we're about five or six kilometers, seven, eight kilometers into the into the motion. And we're still doing pretty well at tracking the ground truth uh, quite precisely. Um, the other thing we've been doing with this is so that was sort of trying to take velocity information and put it into a standard ICP style algorithm. Um, the other thing we can do is actually maybe just design a totally new algorithm that just makes use of the velocity information. You can kind of imagine like an optical mouse. You can measure your, your uh, velocity in every degree of freedom. You could actually just integrate that to get pose. Um, and so we've been building a really fast correspondence free ladder odometry algorithm. So we don't even need to match back to a map anymore. We're just going to take this radial velocity information, convert it into something about the velocity of the vehicle itself, and then integrate that over time to get to our pose. Um, and it turns out there's some observability issues due to the fact that we're only measuring radial velocity. So with only one LIDAR, uh, you're actually three degrees of freedom degenerate in terms of what you can measure about uh, the LIDAR's motion itself. Um, but with either multiple LIDARs or one of these LIDARs plus uh, something like a heading gyro, you can do pretty well at estimating your motion um, very quickly. So we can actually build now something. Um, it's actually a, a linear estimator that runs in about five milliseconds per frame uh, without, uh, without a lot of optimization already. 
Um, and that that's actually uh, kind of intriguing. Here's It's not as good as if you were to sort of match it back to a map, but already just this very fast algorithm is this green estimate that's, that's quite close to the ground truth. Um, and of course, you could maybe interleave this with the occasional matching back to a map, and that's probably good enough to, to localize even in uh, geometrically degenerate situations. Uh, so we've been we've been pretty excited about that, and of course, there's many other things you could do with this lidar, uh, more on the sort of understanding the semantics of the scene. If you get this sort of free segmentation due to the velocity of the the other moving objects, there's lots of other fun things you could probably do with it. How am I doing on time? I, I guess we need to wrap up. <laughs> okay, I won't talk about this last topic except to say that uh, we've been playing around with algorithms uh, that can guarantee something about global optimality of the all of these estimation problems I've been talking about can be basically set up as optimizations. Um, of course, they're non-convex optimizations. So there's some there's been some really interesting work over the last years uh, where people are looking at how to certify. Uh, the global optimality of solutions that come out of these types of algorithms. And we've got a couple of papers coming up on, on that. Uh, so I will also put up a slide with all of the, the collaborators and students uh, and thank them. I got to do all the talking, but they did all the work. And thanks, of course, to our, to our many sponsors of this, uh, this work over the years. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thanks a lot, team, for the great talk. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? If yes, please come to the microphone. There is a question. Hi, uh, it's Amy, but thanks for the talk. I have uh, two questions. One about the vision-based uh, methods. I see you're lucky to live in an area with a diverse uh, set of conditions of weather. What happens with conditions that you don't have any data for? How do you look at that situation? And the second question is about uh, using multiple sensors. So I understand you do the fusion in the level of the 3D map. Uh, how do you look at fusing in earlier stages? Uh, let, let me ask, ask, uh, answer the first one, and then I didn't quite hear the second one. So um, the first one, I guess the question was, what happens when you test in, in uh, conditions that, uh, that we didn't have any training data for? Yeah, obviously, that's not going to do all that well. But I guess the hope was that we could, for something like lighting, everyone, everyone can experience lighting change wherever you are on the globe. So you can always gather some training data for that. The hope was that we could gather some lighting change data, train features that would be robust to lighting, and then have that work in uh, geographically distinct areas from the training. And we were able to show that that sort of works. I think if it was geographically very distinct, if you, if you trained in Toronto and then went to the middle of I don't know, South America or something, there might be some something that, that doesn't work all that well there. But um, um, you know, weather change, I think might be might be more difficult to make that leap. But I guess our hope was that we could train in the lighting and weather conditions, but then transfer to geographically distinct areas uh, reasonably well. And then I didn't quite capture the the second question. You showed that using multiple sensors, the camera and the LiDAR for localization. And if I understood correctly, you do, you fuse the 3D map. So you have maps from different sensors and then you try to use them or use both of them. And uh, the question was, were you, did you try to using both sensors before uh, generating the map. So already generating the map using the raw data from the sensors. I'm still not quite sure I understand the question. I mean, in in, in all of the all of the scenarios I showed you, we built a map with one sensor, and usually we localize with the same sensor against that map. The only the only uh, outlier from that was that we did this work where we built a map with lidar and then localized radar data to that lidar map. Yes, I think that is. Okay, I'll take it. Thanks. Okay, thank you. All right. Uh, uh, since uh, time is a bit uh, behind, we can uh, uh, move on to our next speaker. So let's thank Tim once again. Great. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of your workshop.
Okay, so uh, Aaron, oh, okay, you're there. Great. Yeah, I'm there. Um, so our next speaker is uh, Eren Erdalaksoy. Uh, Eren is an associate professor at Halmstad University in Sweden and coordinates a Horizon Europe project titled Roadview, which focuses on robust automated driving <coughs> extreme weather. His research interests include action semantics, computer vision, AI, and cognitive robotics. He has been actively working on creating the semantic representation of visual experiences to achieve a better environment and action understanding for autonomous systems such as robots and unmanned vehicles. Uh, so welcome, Aaron, and uh, the, the scene is yours. Thanks a lot. Thank you very much. Um, first of all, thanks a lot for host having me here. Uh, it's a great pleasure to give a talk about our very recent uh, uh, European project called Roadview, which stands for Robust Automated Driving in Extreme Weather. By the way, I assume you see my full screen, right? Before I just dive into the details. Could you please confirm that? Yes, yes, we can see your screen. All right. All right. So, um, all right. So we know that this, uh, the, the, the autonomous vehicle market is very hot, right? There are so many uh, giant companies investing a lot of manpower and uh, person months on uh, developing new tools and components and solutions for autonomous driving. Not only companies, but also academic institutions, they're also investing a lot of uh, uh, manpower on that. And if we take a look at the uh, market estimate, we see that uh, for 2023, uh, the uh, estimated market size is about $170 uh, billion, which is supposed to be go up to 10, 10 times more in 2030. Uh, also, the growth rate between 21 and 30 is more or less like 40 percent, huge amount of uh, change. Um, so uh, we have to really uh, see this uh, rapid development in the in the market. So we have to really target the right things uh, to make use of this invested money in a smart way. Um, oops, I'm pretty sure you have seen those uh, fancy videos uh, on YouTube. Um, there are, again, uh, different cool companies like Tesla, Waymo, and so on. They have uh, released uh, nice videos showing that you can have those nice robot taxis or uh, autonomous vehicles already up and running in some uh, restricted areas. Uh, also, too simple, the company have just released last year saying that they can autonomous to, uh, go, uh, they can use uh, their autonomous truck going even at night uh, over, I think, 160 kilometers. It's great success. We have to all appreciate. And uh, we, we know that those companies have uh, collected uh, giant data by uh, driving over millions of kilometers. But not every kilometer driven is a cool, unfortunately. So most of those automotive vehicles have been primarily test trained and tested under very clean optimal weather and clean road conditions. So it's not really realistic. The real challenge starts when we start talking about the impact of harsh weather conditions. So challenges really starts when we talk about uh, heavy fog, rain, and snow, which are substantially affecting our uh, downstream tasks. Here, I'm going to briefly summarize different challenges coming either from the sensor itself or the, the per downstream perception task. So in the first round, we can say that the sensors may get covered by snow, ice, water drops, and so on, so that your measurements may get uh, degraded. And you have to handle uh, different amounts of noises because it's not uh, 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 normally distributed. And the detection, of course, will be uh, mis uh, will be full of false positives if you can get any, of course. Um, so you have to handle these misdetections in the uh, detection pipeline because uh, we are talking about safety critical applications. So any kind of uh, misdetection here may cause uh, very harmful consequences. So we have to be extremely careful about this challenge. Another challenge is not only the, uh, about perception, but also about the control. So the friction, for instance, on the road surface may change rapidly so that you have to really adapt your control mechanism to handle this kind of uh, cases. And even if you claim that your perception and control solutions are working to some degree, you have to unfortunately test it and validate. Well, there is no metric that we can rely on right now to make sure that this, uh, uh, these uh, solutions are optimal for real world uh, uh, cases. Here I'm going to give you a very simple example. This is a 
uh, LiDAR data captured from the uh, uh, Velodyne 100, Velodyne 264, uh, sorry, it's from the Kitty data set. Uh, on the right, we see the corresponding camera. It's very clean data, nice. You can run nice uh, object detection algorithms. You can get set of thought results, fine. But the real problem starts when we talk about, for instance, heavy rain. And this data is coming from Waymo data set. And you, as you can see, if you have the harsh, if you have a heavy rain, you are going to get this kind of water um, particles. Uh, I call them uh, ghost particles that you can handle. Even for human, if you are not uh, very much in the field, it's going to be very hard for you to detect that those are the noise particles. And even if you take a look at this nice RGB image, it's really hard, even for humans, saying how many vehicles there are and uh, where are they located. So challenges are there. We have to be really aware of that because they will negatively impact our uh, perception algorithms. Um, before diving into the days, I would like to give you the landscape of the field when it comes to, uh, you know, investments. Um, this, like the slide, this is the time period between 2015 and uh, 2027. And we are talking about the Roadview project, which just started like nine months ago here. With your, this is a four-year project with the total budget of 10 million euro. Before that, of course, we are not the only one, right? So before our project, there were this, uh, I call a chain of projects uh, that was uh, uh, actually um, uh, coordinated by the very same person, uh, Werner Ritter. I think he's also one of the key speakers here today. And the consortium is also pretty much the same, but they're heavily dealing with the perception only solutions for when it comes to harsh weather conditions. So it's very highly relevant. They are doing an amazing job, but they are uh, to some degree not talking anything about the control side. And around the same time, we, there's also another, there are also other uh, European projects. For instance, the events got funded from the very same call for three years. But uh, these and other like high drive and award projects, they are dealing with the harsh weather conditions only as a use case. So it's not the main scope of the project. And they are just willing to show one use case from demonstration when it is like uh, when there is a heavy rain and so on. So the, the road view is actually unique here because it is just talking about the harsh weather conditions and it is dealing not only with perception, but also control mechanisms. And we want to really show these solutions and innovations, I'm going to talk about them soon, uh, on different vehicle types. And um, by the way, these are only European projects. I didn't even show anything about the uh, projects from the US. And uh, also, there are some companies directly dealing with the harsh weather conditions, like Zuex as an Amazon company. And they are testing the uh, hardware, the sensor itself, under heavy rain and so on. But they are not dealing any, they are not doing anything with snow. And the truck company Embox, the startup company, they just like a couple of months ago, they said that they claimed that uh, they had the first autonomous truck uh, journey testing uh, phase under heavy snow. But there is no video or anything that we can also uh, rely on. So, road view is actually talking just about weather-related challenges by developing robust and cost-efficient embedded in vehicle perception and weather-aware decision-making systems for connected and automated vehicles. So that means we are willing, we are willing to provide not only perception, but also control solutions that are considering the weather aspects. And we are also dealing with, or we are also interested in having this V2X communication, which is like how we can share the information between different agents, between different vehicles, or also between the sensors coming from the infrastructure. Can we really boost the performance of our system by this kind of communications so that we can enhance the performance even under harsh weather conditions? So this diagram is basically summarizing the overall project. So we, in one phase, we are using different sensor setups to have improved perception systems. Uh, it covers not only the VRUs, but also the, the road surface when it comes to control, right? And our decision-making system is weather aware, we claim here. It is considering the, uh, it's getting feedback from the uh, environment directly to control the velocity and so on. And once we have those solutions, we are having a test and validation phase before deploying our solutions to real trucks. And our aim is to close this uh, research gap and collecting data from different uh, ODDs, operational design domains, to move uh, towards system at uh, 
technology readiness level seven. What does that mean? We are really willing to show a prototype demonstration in real operational environment using a real vehicle. I will give you more concrete examples very soon. So Roadview is coming with several groundbreaking innovations. I'm going to briefly summarize them here. And one of the uh, uh, innovations is early sensor noise filtering. So again, on the left, you have a, a corrupted point cloud data captured under heavy snow. And normally what we can do is we can train uh, advanced deep learning networks uh, based on this corrupted data. But what we claim is that instead of doing that, maybe we can run a filtering algorithm that can in the first place clean the data and then you can run your downstream tasks. So we call it uh, early sensor noise filtering, which can be done in an unsupervised manner as well. Um, we are also proposing this data readiness level like this TRL technology readiness level, we are proposing a uh, quality assurance for the data itself. So when you have corrupted data or when you say you clean the data, uh, how clean it is and how ready it is for the downstream task. So we are willing to introduce a metric that is uh, distributing the quality level of the data before even sending them to the downstream task. And another innovation is adaptive sensor fusion. Uh, here we are having vehicles with multiple LIDAR, multiple cameras, riders, and so on. So at some point, we will have the problem of redundancy, right? So we are willing to uh, have a system, roadway system, that can figure out the redundancies in the sensor setup itself on the fly so that we can come up with a cost-effective multi-sensor setup. So maybe the system will say, when it comes to rain, you can rely on uh, multiple cameras, but when it comes to heavy snow, maybe do not use multiple cameras, instead use only two LiDAR, for instance. Okay, I'm just making up the numbers. So we have to provide some uh, scientific evidences to, uh, to ground our uh, hypothesis here. Um, another innovation is the collaborative perception. Again, we are not relying only on onboard perception. We are going to have sensors in the infrastructure where we are going to get the symbolic information and we will send this thing back to the uh, egocentric vehicle to improve the perception. So this could be like didactic object bonding boxes or this could be semantic segments coming from other sensor modalities in the infra infrastructure. Um, again, uh, perception is not the only thing. Uh, we are also dealing with the decision-making control or planning and control mechanisms, which are in this case, weather aware. So we are willing to send a feedback from the environment about like, for instance, the slipperiness of the road surface so that the vehicle can adjust the uh, velocity accordingly. And, uh, well, we, we are dealing with uh, safety critical, critical applications, right? So autonomous vehicles uh, should have critical decisions. So this is why you can't rely on black box solutions as, as such. Here, we are also proposing uh, that each module uh, dealing with this perception or control should also come with certain level of explainability. So we are not talking only about Ad, ad hoc solutions, but also modules that are designed, that are interpretable by design. So uh, our filtering or object detection modules or sensor fusion modules to some degree will be uh, a grayish, in this case, grayish boxes um, to explain the decisions that are taken on the, on the fly. And last but not least, before deploying all those solutions, we are willing to have weather capable, capable uh, X in the loop environment testing uh, uh, case where we can validate uh, that the, the solutions before deploying them in the in the real vehicle. So this covers the softwares that we have, like uh, DNN models. This covers the hardware, like the sensor rings. Uh, are you using automotive graded sensors? Are you using uh, multiple sensors? Are they uh, filling some criteria, standards, and so on? And then also the vehicle in the loop test, so where you can also test the dynamic of the vehicle. So those are the innovations uh, that are coming with the Roadview project. Uh, overall, this project relies on three pillars. In the first pillar, what we do is we collect synthetic data. We create a digital twins on the environment and so that we can inject uh, different levels of noise uh, to the system. And before going to the third pillar, which is just about real world data collection, we are using the second pillar which is called controlled rain fog tunnels so that we can bridge this gap between two uh, 
not fundamentally different, but two different domains. So uh, to close this into a real gap, we are having uh, rain tunnels where you can inject different amounts of uh, rain and fog to the system so that you can validate your results. And all these uh, solutions will be, or the perceived data will be sent to the sensor fusion where you are having downstream tasks with coming with explainable explainability. And then this perception modus will go to the control side, and you can also have the V2X communication here. Once you have the solutions, you can test them in the X in the loop system before deploying them to the uh, uh, different environments, different vehicles. For instance, we are going to have different demonstrations, different use cases. Uh, one is going to be in Germany. And this is the vehicle that we are going to use for vehicle in the loop test. And we are going to have an autonomous truck in Turkey uh, up and running in the uh, highway scenarios. Um, this is already uh, uh, running in Turkey in highway. We are willing to show that the we, our road, road, road view uh, solutions can uh, be deployed to trucks as well, not only to uh, vans or passenger vehicles. For instance, another demo, we are going to use this van and it will be tested in Arctic Circle. So we'll go all the way up to the north and there you get the worst weather that you can ever get. So um, we want to really have the uh, one of the latest demonstrations there to show how the system is uh, uh, running on the heavy snow cases. The last demonstration is going to be in Germany by using a passenger vehicle. As you can see here, we are dealing with different uh, vehicle embodiments. So each, for each vehicle, you should use uh, slightly different sensor setups. So you cannot use the same LiDAR configuration uh, on the truck with the one show in, the, in the passenger vehicle. So your innovations should also uh, be agnostic to the vehicles that you are using. Okay, those are another, those, this is another challenge that we, are, we have to deal with. And the consortium is very big. We have like 15 different partners coming from different uh, parts of Europe. And we have also an advisory board from uh, partners from uh, different European countries. And we are also having international collaborators uh, from US and South Korea. These collaborations are basically about exchanging data and also sending sensor rings to each other to run some tests. All right, so far I, I, I did my best to briefly uh, summarize the uh, project. So we are now here in month nine, and now I would like to explain you what we have done up to now. So I would like to share our early results uh, when it comes to those three pillars. Okay, Again, we have three pillars, simulator, controlled environment, and real world. So I, I would like to share our early findings with you so that uh, we can see how far we are from the real, real world. Um, the, in the first pillar, again, we are dealing with the synthetic data. We have one of our partners, Lapland University of Applied Sciences in Finland. They have implemented this winter sim. It's a nice simulator. It's uh, already there. You can download and play with that one. It's very parameterized. You can change the parameters to just uh, change the amount of accumulated snow, for instance, on the roadside, or you can even change the uh, snow particles, the thickness of or the density of snow particles, and you can change the vehicle dynamics and so on. And it's based on Carla, which is already available. So what we are doing right now is we are developing digi diff different digital twins. So we created uh, the digital twin of Lapland playing ground. So this is the playing ground in Arctic Circle. Again, we have to go there and do real tests. But before doing that, what we did is we created the digital twin of that one. Now we are um, adding different noise models here to simulate uh, different uh, extreme cases in this digital thing. And also we created different outdoor test facilities, digital twins of different uh, test facilities, like the one from uh, Germany, it's called uh, Charisma Group, uh, where you can have different uh, rain in the system. For instance, this is a pillar two. I'm going to show you how we you make use of this outdoor rain simulation facility in Germany. So what we do here is um, we have uh, different uh, rain, rain measurement tools like sprink, uh, sprinklers. We inject different amount of uh, raindrops here to the system. And we have here buckets. We collect different amount of water here. And we measure how much water we get. And we have here a uh, distrometer, which is measuring the amount of rain in the system. And we have an uh, anemometer, which is basically measuring the wind speed in the environment. Okay? And we also have a sensor setup. Uh, this, this is representing our sensor ring to be tested. And here we are having all automotive grade uh, sensors like RGB camera, thermal camera, LiDAR, uh, which is in this case 128 in noise. And we have also 4D RIDAR. 
Okay, that's coming from ZF. And what we did is uh, we just, of course, measured the amount of uh, rain and the wind in the environment. So this shows the distribution of the collected wind and the rain. From that, you can see like you have here about, so hold on, here we have this uh, sensors and here we have the buckets and here you have the sprinklers, okay? And this shows like uh, how much water you collected while there is wind in the environment. So if you have this light grayish area, this shows like your rain intensity is about eight millimeter per hour and your wind average is about 1.2 millimeter per second. Okay. As you can see, since we are in the outdoor, since there is wind, this distribution is non-uniform. That's fine. No problem, but that is uh, showing how the sensors look like. As you can see, the LiDAR sensor readings are very corrupted. You do not have any readings here in this environment. It's full of black, right? You do not have any points in this, in this cloud here. And those are kind of uh, squares are representing your LiDAR readings. Okay, and as you can see, they're also very noisy when you have the system. And here I just show on the snapshot of the RGB camera and thermal camera. We have also in the ring a thermal camera, by the way. So now, what, what does that mean? That means you have a control environment, you know how much rain there is, how much wind there is, and you know uh, the, the corrupted data, right? And you can do the very same experiment in a more controlled indoor environment. We have one in, uh, in France, a partner, Serama, has indoor weather test chamber. You can do the very same experiment so that you can have uniform rain distribution when it comes to the test. Okay, why is that important? It is important because now we can compare our uh, results, these uh, this, uh, real results still under control environment with the one coming from the simulator. So here, uh, the partner Warwick, University of Warwick from the UK, they are basically defining a metric to compare different point class and different images. So uh, when you have readings from uh, the uh, test environments, you can directly compare it with the simulated data to see how similar they are or is your noise representing the one from the one in the real environment okay we, they have also defined a metric to compare the to, to they have also defined a, a mathematical formula to represent the noise in your in your in your ladder point cloud and also in your image okay they are available in this paper uh, this is about the those two results are about the point pillar 1 and pillar 2 now we go to the real world pillar 3 and here i'm going to show you a real vehicle with a different sensor setup when we take a look at the sensors, we have Velodyne 128, we have an RGB camera, and we have three thermal cameras here, okay? And we have also a georeferencing data, this is GNSS plus IMU on the onboard. And we have also different from the other vehicles, a Vaisala MD30 sensor, which is actually giving you reference measurements about the slipperiness of the road surface, okay? So I will be quick just to make use of the remaining time more efficiently. Um, this slide is basically showing you how your camera image looks like when you superimpose your thermal camera, which are synchronized and calibrated well. You can see that your three, three camera readings are uh, matching very nicely with the RGB data. Now you can put your uh, uh, LiDAR range data or even your LiDAR reflectance data on top of that. And you have also this uh, me uh, reference measurement coming uh, from the reference uh, sensor, Wyzala, and this is basically a point measurement, okay? It's not giving you a measurement about the surface or a region, but only instead a small local region, a small amount of data you get uh, from this sensor. So this video shows how it looks like when the vehicle is moving. Um, we have the real test scenario, real snow case in Finland, so no escape from snow. And you can see that RGB and superimposed with this um, uh, Wasala data, those are again, uh, lightish color means like more slippery road surface. And you can see how thermal camera and LiDAR point class are superimposed on this data. What we, what we are doing here is we are now taking a look at those small patches and extrapolating these things to the road surface so that we can create the ground truth data. So this is not human labeled, but instead we are relying on this sensor, which is really reliable and giving you more um, uh, slipperiness information about the road surface. Now we are extrapolating to the road surface so that we can uh, use this thing for, um, for instance, detecting the road slipperiness. And this video is actually showing our early results about the inference. So we are not talking about the training here. This is real inference on the snow road surface. Here, um, this is the test data. And by the way, we are not doing any kind of segmentation. Okay, this is why you have this lightish color everywhere. But imagine you have you extract first the free space and then apply this, then you will have 
the ref, uh, yellowish area only on the road surface, okay? So this yellowish color is representing the slipperiness of the road surface. That means when you have the, uh, this uh, setup coming with this uh, reference measurement, you can nicely annotate the data and train your network that can detect the slipperiness of the road surface, which is quite important when you wanna control the vehicle. And I'm going to briefly also talk some talk about some uh, findings from my own lab. Um, this is done by one of my PhD students. He's actually also sitting there in the uh, in the seminar room. Um, so what we did is we asked, okay, you have multiple lidar, multiple camera, and you are now uh, driving on the highway with full speed, right? But what if all of a sudden your camera stops working? What can we do? Right? This is a very important problem. No one has talked about that at all because everyone is talking about sensor fusion and so on. But what if, our, what if some of our sensors are not functioning? What we can do currently is just a full stop, emergency stop, right? But this is not smart enough, right? We are talking about intelligent systems. So we should have an intelligent decision here. So what we claim here is we can actually do sensor to sensor mapping. We can have, assume your camera is not working, then you can rely on LiDAR data, you can take uh, during training, okay, you can take LiDAR, segmented it, okay, meanwhile during training, you can also take a look at a real camera, segmented it, and also you can estimate the depth from the real camera, which, right, you can send all this information to a, a generative model, which is basically converting LiDAR segments into camera segments, and also estimating the depth, okay, those are the fake camera segments. When you send this segment to another generative model, which it will then convert these segments into RGB data, okay? So what does that mean? Yeah, once you are done with the training, during the inference, you will forget about this camera and depth, okay? When you have LiDAR full scan LiDAR data, you can basically convert into segments and depth information. And here we have the, earlier, we have the final results. So this is a camera image that is generated by our system, modular pipeline, which is just relying on existing LiDAR data. LiDAR 64, and this is from the Kitty data set, semantic Kitty data set. So you can have the RG, fake RGB data, you can have segments, and you can have even the depth information. And by the way, this got uh, also best uh, paper award at Ichikai workshop uh, two years ago. Why is that important? It is important because now you can use this information for sensor fusion and downstream object detection tasks. We are currently running some experiments on that. Unfortunately, I cannot really share any results, but uh, we, we, we claim that this will boost the uh, uh, object detection performance uh, uh, when it comes to LiDAR only object detection. And last but not least, I would like to also show some results when it comes to cleaning uh, noisy point cloud data. Um, unfortunately, there is only one data set, real data set in the world, which is called winter adverse driving data set, uh, captured under snowy data, snowy cases, and also coming with point wise labels, like there are 20 classes following the semantic kitty, but they have additional like snow points like shown here. What we implemented is we implemented very naive KNN based tree convolution layer, which is basically ignoring the local spatial relations, but just relying on uh, KNN based neighborhood relations, okay? Uh, but it's not preserving the uh, localization of the neighbors. And we are just defining two layer residual connection between those and run like uh, filtering, binary filtering, okay? So it's like uh, either there is snow or not, that's simple. And we compare this thing with other state-of-the-art uh, state networks, like there are different classical, uh, uh, statistical based methods or different state-of-the-art deep neural networks in the field doing uh, semantic segmentation, like multi-class semantic segmentation. But when you treat them as binary classification to detect, no, uh, to detect snow, uh, you, you see that the maximum you get is like 90%, but they are super, uh, heavy models. They are really over-parameterized. Actually, this figure is showing it nicely. Like you have those state-of-the-art models here. They're very giant. And what we propose here is extremely light and you have less, you have super real-time performance and you get the comparable results. It's just like 0.5% uh, for 0.5% less accuracy than the state-of-the-art, but we are, uh, uh, we are extremely light. And here, if the video works, I'm going to show you, uh, I hope it will work. It didn't work. Okay, here it comes. Um, here on the left, you see a real point cloud captured under snow. These black dots are representing the snow. And here, how it looks like when we apply our filtering algorithm, which is now to some degree clean. And here, 
what does that mean? It means now instead of running the object detection here, now you can happily run your system here. And this is super fast when you do want to deploy to uh, real uh, autonomous vehicles. With that, I'm done. I would like to now spend one or two minutes to summarize what I have just talked about. In a nutshell, Roadway project is focusing on solving weather-related perception and control challenges by testing in all kinds of conditions, including the best bad weather, uh, the one that we can also see in Arctic Circle for the test plan. Roadview creates a test environment in Europe because we are uh, providing uh, simulated data, we are providing digital twins, we are having control environments where you can inject different amounts of uh, noise and fog. And we have also, we are going to also release uh, real world uh, data, corrupted data, uh, corrupted by snow and rain, so that you can test your solutions. And Roadview provides vehicle agnostic perception solutions for various test platforms. Again, if you remember our slides about use cases, we have trucks, we have passenger vehicles, and so on. The dynamics is different. And our solutions should be uh, vehicle agnostic. This is extremely important for us. And also, we are uh, having this weather aware X in the loop testing platform that can be used uh, be, uh, to test, the, to validate our solutions before deploying them to our uh, real vehicles. Last but not least, Roadview enables vehicles going from, we call it going from autonomous to snow autonomous hopefully in the remaining three years. With that, I'm done. Thank you very much again for having me here. And uh, now I can take questions. I think I am not running out of time. I can't hear you if you are talking. Sorry? I can't hear you. Yeah, yeah, I was not, uh, I was not talking. Now can you hear Okay, me? sorry. Okay, yes, great. sure. Great. Uh, so, uh, yeah, are there any questions from the audience? Yes, please come to the microphone. Hello, uh, I found you that you have tried many. Have I can barely time? hear you. I'm terrible, so I can barely hear you. Either you will translate or you please come to the microphone. Yes. Uh, thank you. I noticed that you have conducted some experiment, experiment with synthetic data and the real web. Have you tried to perform the synthetic to real transfer with the LIDA data? And we have do something on that, but we found some noises in the real data, but the synthetic data team seems to be very uh, clean, you know. So have we right. noticed that, how to solve this? Right, so that is our hypothesis. We know that if you take a look at the state of the art, when you go from uh, simulated data to real world data about the LiDAR based object detection, uh, the performance is not super good. People are reaching maximum 50% accuracy. Uh, this, so there's a huge domain shift. But here, what we claim is, we are not there yet, by the way, is that if you use this control environment where you can inject different amount of noises to your system, like uh, remember, please recall this slide where I was showing uh, raindrops and buckets and so on, because there you know the amount of rain, you know the amount of wind, and there you can, uh, you can predict the level of noise. And if you have a real mathematical uh, representation of your noise, then you can uh, adjust the simulator to approximate this noise level. This is exactly think, what we are doing. I say you then, mean the, then, then we will noise. clear. Pardon me? Uh, you mean to simulate the noise, right? Yes. Or oh, okay. simulate the noise in a way that it will approximate the real, real uh, uh, control environment noise, oh, which okay. is uh, one step closer to the real world noise. Yeah. Oh, will you release the synthetic data set? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, any other questions? Uh, perhaps I have a question like related to, to the previous one. Uh, you mentioned these two pillars, uh, pillar two and pillar three, where pillar two is more controlled in terms of like the, uh, the conditions and what, what level of rain you might have, what visibility, for example, the fog chambers, uh, and then the level three, uh, sorry, pillar three, which is the actual uh, traffic situations that we need to handle in autonomous uh, driving. Uh, my right. question here is that um, we have like a great gap in the scene complexity and also in the diversity uh, that we can get in the two uh, in the two pillars. Um, for example, you might have this uh, downtown. 
uh, dense traffic scenarios with uh, tens of cars and hundreds of pedestrians. Um, or, and in the in the control environment, you you can have like really um, you know uh, more more limited uh, uh, ability to to have uh, this this complex traffic, and also you cannot create easily a lot of different scenarios. So, uh, do you have uh, some uh, some idea how this gap could be uh, somehow filled or? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Wonderful question. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't have time to talk about this part, but uh, we have work on that. So, in the first nine months, we have also talked about. Uh, we also work about creating the taxonomy of uh, uh, ODDs, operation domains. Okay, there we said there are three parameters that are super important, like the road surface slipperiness, like and also traffic density, and we are we are used density of uh, pedestrians and so on. Those are three important parameters when you want to when you want to design different use cases and scenarios and we had that now we are willing to have a public paper on that which will come very soon uh, because the work is done uh, based on that we are creating those digital events right so here i'm just showing you one digital event of a playground okay, it's not a real city driving that's for sure but we are also having a digital event of uh, city driving there when you have this digital twin there, you can change those parameters. Like you can change the amount of uh, rain uh, in the scene. You can change the amount of slipperiness on the road surface. You can change the uh, level of uh, you know difficulties in the scene just with those parameters. That simple. And then you can uh, close this gap to some degree. I'm not I'm not claiming that we are going to close this gap fully, but we'll definitely have a better approximation of the real world challenges when you have this parameterized digital twins. Which are just on the way. Uh, we we are done with the work. We have to just uh, uh, publish the paper. Great. I'm uh, looking forward to uh, to seeing the, this work of yours. Uh, it makes sense because you have also the, the synthetic data. This uh, the tier yeah. one that can somehow uh, complement the, what what you have from the real world from pillar two. Great. Okay. Yeah. We need to to close this part of the workshop. So uh, let's thank uh, Aaron again. Thanks for the Thank great you. talk. All right. And uh, now we will have a short break uh, until 11 o'clock. And uh, at 11, we will continue with more uh, with more talks. And we will have uh, a talk by uh, Daniel Kremers uh, following up. Thank you. Hi, how are you? Thanks for coming. Uh, yeah. Have you met the uh, people? This is uh, our co collaborator from the web of the group and also co organizer. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah. Hi, yeah. 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 So this is um uh for the sound, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, and I don't have that. Yeah, that's what though. I don't think that I need that. I mean, yeah, because my computer doesn't have that. Okay. Yeah. 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 So let me. Yeah. I can just put it here and that because I don't. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Just check with the screen. Yeah. So, uh,
do you have any update for, for the patent uh, process for Ozan's work for the uh, visual grounding? Because you said you had some internal discussion about yeah, 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 yeah. That's, I think we should. Uh, it just has a, I'm basically it's <laughs> more challenging to work with later. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. for uh, a paper with Nico. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they proposed yeah. to delay again. Oh, so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's uh, Nico told me it's not the same uh, attorney that was yeah, assigned exactly, as like yeah. previous but, times. Yeah. Okay, okay. But yeah, yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> And then we also have now the, the, the judge's favor from like the jury's uh, permission or so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, and then we look into the picture of the release of the inside. Of the IBIS, yes. So uh, I think we will go for the TCPY. Yeah, I'm, I'm fine with the TCPY. Fisher somehow, you know, was more convinced about this other license. Yeah, everything's good. Everything is fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, but uh, yeah, I also didn't knew that I didn't know that before. So, uh, so the problem is that yeah, yeah claiming that it would take intellectual property better, but mm -hmm. we do that with the patent application. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And then the uh, license itself, so it's basically allowing any type of use. Any type, yeah, <laughs> like even commercial use. Yes, like, which we don't want. To. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Of so course. So. for me to sell it internally. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. I, I, I. Uh, also for, for the other work, like for the condition by its public condition, like I just directly proposed the CCI. Yeah. Uh, it has been working like yeah. uh, <laughs> I guess uh, yeah, we from the age side, you know, uh, we don't have so like, let's say severe restrictions no. mostly from from Toyota side that we really want to be careful with how we release the code. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, thanks for replying for IDUS. Uh, I think Luigi has already released uh, okay, the, the, the form of the CCPY. Uh, I just saw it. Uh, uh, that one is on Thursday yeah. afternoon. Yeah, so it's a lot. The very yeah. last <laughs> one. Yeah, 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 yeah. And are you uh, going back? Uh, I'm leaving on Saturday, so we'll okay. still stay on Friday. Uh, I'm leaving like uh, Friday. Evening. Friday. Oh, okay. Friday. Uh, is it a direct flight to Brussels? No, or? I have to go to Montreal and wait there for 10 hours. Oh, cool. <laughs> but it doesn't have enough time to actually get off the airport, like go to the city, look at the yard. Let's see what happens. Yeah. Uh, the border I want to go to the bathroom. Yeah, I'm going to go to the coffee. Yeah, you stay I'll here. Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> yeah.
Yesterday I gave a talk and then the projector stopped. Oh, and sometimes that happens if there's no power on a laptop. Yeah. Surprising, but sometimes someone someone told me like so it's cool. the laptop doesn't have power and it's on the battery mode, and then sometimes it doesn't something. It's a nice lecture. Yeah, it's not too loud. The big ones have a pair of acoustics. So yeah, also when I mean, always feels empty because you never feel you're not. Yeah, I think I might. So, the chin center is in front of the thing. to change the setting. So that should be fine. The camera looks good. So you can turn my microphone is probably already switched to the right one. Yeah, that's all good. Mm -hmm. Can you play audio? It comes. I'm not sure. I, do you have videos with audio and presentation? Yeah. Then it doesn't matter. Oh, it's in the sound right. it's yeah, so this is all connected to the mic. Uh, you have to remember to unmute your okay. website. Mm -hmm. And maybe you can already share your screen. Yeah. Uh, do you have a presentation? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs>
Now it's all good. I was sitting in the front row, and when I was passing a step, I would need to push my own legs. It's nice to speak after the break. Yeah, and every time in the world to sit up, yeah, it's, it's, it's not so ultra large then. Because we still need some of them to get it. You know, there were some delays on the yeah. floor, yeah. before, yeah. and then like, there was a coffee break, and everyone gets restless yeah. before the coffee yeah. break. Let me check one more to yeah. see if this slide I changed the music. How we want to do that? Do you think it's fun? No, 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 Yeah. And uh, I saw before that when I muted my we have to turn the audio off. Like we so when I when I muted uh, mine, there were some people that wrote that they couldn't hear the speaker. So we can try with unmuting Daniel can you and mute me. If we see that, yeah, there is audio come out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, can so it, it should work? Now work fine. Yeah, okay. <laughs> because also we heard ourselves from there. Okay. I mean, okay. Okay. Up and there. All right. So if you want, we can uh, sit here or go to the other. No, no, I'm, I'm good. I will just sit there. Okay. In that way, then we can also see me. I can basically yeah. count down the minutes. Yeah, yeah. It's all good. All right. All right. Um, and we just yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. and yeah, that goes to the And uh, yeah, if during the talk you can try to think of a couple of questions in case there is none from the audience, yeah, yeah. you can feel very good. <laughs> it sometimes helps you saw it before us. <laughs> Okay. We can perhaps leave uh, a couple of minutes after 11 to, to get more people you know, before we start. We are already, you know, we will have lunch break anyway, so time is okay. Mm -hmm. Ah, yeah, yeah, I can come to that side. Okay. Sure. Oh. Is it
Yeah, I'm unmute now. Oh, it's already unmuted, so it's all good. Hello and welcome back to the Vision for All Seasons workshop. Uh, we are happy to welcome Daniel Kramer uh, to this workshop. Daniel Kramer holds the Chair for Computer Vision and Artificial Intelligence at TU Munich. He has co-authored over 500 publications in computer vision, machine learning, robotics, and applied mathematics, many of which uh, received some awards. He was listed among Germany's top 40 researchers below 40, he received the Gottfried Wilhelm Leibniz Award 2016, the biggest award in German academia, and he is member of the Bavarian Academic of Sciences and Humanities. Further, he is initiator and co-director of the Munich Data Science Institute, the Munich Center for Machine Learning, and Alice Munich. He has served as founder, advisor, and investor to numerous startups. The stage is yours, this Daniel. Thank you very much for the introduction. I hope you can all hear me and see me online as well. <clears throat> very good. Uh, this is on dynamic 3D scene understanding for autonomous vehicles. And uh, the work that I'm presenting has been largely done by current and former students of mine, in particular, Felix, Lukas, Nan, Jacob, and uh, as external collaborator, Christian Ruprecht. Um, I should say some of it has also been supported by a startup that I've helped get started, a startup called Deep Scenario. Uh, I'll talk about uh, three parts, my own beginnings in the field of autonomous driving uh, and driver assistance and self-driving. And then in the second part and the third part, I'll talk about capturing the 3D world and there in particular, the challenge of dealing with uh, changing weather and lighting and seasonal variations. And lastly, I'll talk about capturing the dynamics of the world, how we can kind of capture human driving so as to create simulation engines where every simulated agent really behaves like a human driver. And when you say like a human driver, obviously you all know everyone drives differently. And I think one of the things that is really necessary to assess and evaluate the performance and test self-driving cars is you need to have a really thorough understanding of how do humans drive. And this is what the last part is about. Well, where did we start? Well, <clears throat> I became a professor in 2005 in Bonn and shortly thereafter, uh, the company Mercedes came by and said, we'd like to collaborate. And so we put cameras in cars and recorded videos such as this one. Initially one camera, eventually uh, we were allowed another camera, two cameras. Uh, and, and then, you know, obviously this is an important challenge. You want to understand the world in front of the car. And a lot of people in public often ask, why are self-driving cars not hitting the markets yet? Why don't we see them in our everyday life? I think the public underestimates the challenges that we're facing, the challenge of really understanding the world in front of the car. And that has many levels of, of understanding here. For example, you want to identify obstacles, but you may also want to estimate the 3D motion. And this is what we did back in 2008 at UCCV. We developed scene flow algorithms that worked in near real time at that time, and they estimate lots of 3D motion vectors called scene flow vectors. Here, color coded in red. Red is moving with uh, in world coordinates, so we can subtract the ego motion and, and distinguish things that move in the world from things that are static in the world. 
Uh, and, and that motion obviously allows to, to generate predictions, right? If that same obstacle keeps moving at the same speed or velocity, it will be in the driving corridor, say, in the next few seconds. And obviously, the further you can predict into the future what's going to happen next, the better you can react and the more you can save lives. So this was our beginnings back in 2008. People were not much talking about self-driving cars. In fact, even at companies, people didn't really believe in this direction. The manager at Mercedes then called Daimler. When I said, can we put the second camera? He said, no, it's too expensive. Yeah. And, and, and nowadays they equip cars with 20 cameras, with lighters, with everything, right? Why? Because they want to enable driver assistance, they want to enable self-driving. But that manager back then did not see a value even in the first camera. That was a waste of money in his view. Right? So you see in these companies, people back in 2005 did not see the self-driving cars coming. And many people still don't see them coming today, but they will come and we're working towards it. In fact, one of the things you to note in the last few years, I've seen quite some momentum being picked up, coming through different levels of autonomy, hitting the markets, different companies like Cruise or Waymo or others uh, deploying self-driving functionalities, but also legal uh, legislation following suit, enabling self-driving cars to actually engage in human driving, right? And for many years, there will be a phase where self-driving cars have to interact with human drivers and human drivers tend to be, I mean, you've all driven, you know, sometimes they're very erratic, right? And you have to be able to understand and anticipate. And one of the key challenges that remains on, on the road to autonomy uh, is that, you know, you need to test and validate and train algorithms to, to scale these techniques, to make them really safe, safe and, and usable across the globe. And that requires you to really know and understand how, how do humans drive. And I'll come back to this challenge in my third part, how we can kind of tackle that challenge. But let's first go into capturing the 3D world. And here I go way back in history. This is one of the pioneers, Krupa. And for those who are familiar with this multiple view or view geometry world, they will know his name. He proved more than 100 years ago that if you observe two, uh, five corresponding points in two images, you can reconstruct the location of these points in 3D and the motion of the camera between the two frames. This is quite a pioneering result. And sometimes I wonder why he came up with that. You know, he certainly didn't have a computer to do anything with this, right? I mean, this is well before the advent of computers, right? But as we all know, this, these kinds of results achieved more than 100 years ago paved the way for modern 3D computer vision for what was often called structure and motion or structure from motion, and nowadays often called visual slam. There's a lot of real-time capable methods that started emerging around 2000. I think one of the first ones in Stefano Suato's lab at UCLA. <clears throat> uh, many of these works actually follow very closely in Krupa's footsteps. And one of the messages I typically give to all my students is, no matter how pioneering a pioneer, you should always question whether what they did is really the right thing. And as I said, Krupa didn't have a computer, right? <laughs> Nowadays, we have computers and we have cameras, and you can ask yourself, is that really what we should be doing? Should we take two images? Should we assume we have corresponding point pairs? I mean, who does, right? We don't have points, we have colors, and we don't have any notion of correspondence. We can try to estimate point correspondence, but what if we make an error, right? Then these classical methods, they first extract these points, then they put them in correspondence with some you know, heuristic strategies with feature descriptors. And, and once they have corresponding points, then they can reconstruct structure and motion. Right? But if you make any mistake in the point uh, association in step two of your method, then all subsequent processing will be doomed, right? You cannot necessarily recover or it's not easy. You can do ransack and it gets to be very difficult. 
And so one of the things we've been advocating is to go a different route and to try to go straight from the raw sensory data, the brightness values of your sensor, to a reconstruction of camera motion and 3D structure. And these are techniques that we coined direct methods. And one of these uh, on this way was a technique called LSD SLAM for large scale direct monocular SLAM. Here you see it in action. There's the camera held by Jacob Engel, the developer of this technique. And on a simple laptop CPU, it generates in real time, large scale reconstructions of this kind. Large scale at the time meant not only a desktop environment that was already possible at the time, but you could really take it outside and walk around and create fairly large and fairly undistorted maps of the world as you see. We went a little bit further. <clears throat> And um, so one thing to note about LSD SLAM is it worked fairly nicely. It became extremely popular, but it still isn't optimal in the sense that we estimate 3D structure and camera motion alternatingly. So we have two threads that kind of run in alternation and it's not really done jointly. Yeah. And if you look at Krupa's work, one of the key messages he had is that this is a coupled problem, the structure and motion problem. And so you need to solve it really jointly. And this was the, the start for the follow-up work that we call direct sparse odometry. There, there are several differences, but the main difference over LSD SLAM is that we really jointly estimate camera motion and 3D structure in a single Gauss-Newton optimization. And here you see it, there's even some people walking through the scene, it's extremely robust to moving objects, and it can track a single camera over hundreds of meters and map the world in real time. The reason why we can do it in real time, although everything is estimated jointly, is that we do a windowed optimization over the last K keyframes that are jointly being optimized. Um, still, you will, Drift, you will make errors in estimating the camera motion and these aggregate into what's called uh, drift. Here, you see the bicycle on the top left is actually reconstructed twice here, right? So there is that drift. And we've been trying to reduce the drift. Um, one way is that you uh, feed inertial sensory information into it. Uh, this is DMVIO, a delayed marginalization visual inertial odometry. And here you see we can start in a room and then uh, we can go out into the hallway. It's a single camera with an inertial sensor. So much like what you have on a smartphone, right? And so you can walk out into the main hall. You can get, go up a flight of stairs here. And then in our building, we have a slide. If you haven't been to Munich, please come visit. There is a slide that takes you three floors down. Most visitors ask me, why do we have a slide like that? Here's the answer. We can, we can you know, test our algorithms in the slide. And halfway through the slide is complete darkness, but still we can track the system at unprecedented precision and robustness, where we can really map the whole building with just you know, basically the types of sensors you have on your smartphone. I do believe this is possibly the most accurate you can get with visual and inertia. And it works, you know, since it's not a learning-based system, it's a classical optimization approach. So it doesn't, it doesn't tune to a specific environment. You don't need training data or anything. So you can run it indoors. You can put it in a car, you know, single camera, inertial. So it's dirt cheap as well. This is something I learned from working with automotive companies. Cost is a huge factor there. If you can make something work with just one camera and an IMU, you know, and it's just an off-the-shelf IMU. There are very expensive IMUs out there. This is not one of them. It's fairly simple. But still it works. It maps, as you can see, very precisely at, at large distances with just a single camera. And it kind of is one of the cornerstones, in my view, to really establish the camera as the lead sensor for autonomous vehicles. To date, companies still heavily rely on LiDAR for 3D sensing. We don't need LiDAR we can work with cameras and you'll see more. But one of the things I wanted to mention in this particular workshop is how we deal with variations in lighting and weather and season. This is the Oxford uh, Robocar data set and there are images in there at different seasons, right? Winter and summer. And so 
what we looked at is how can we do an image alignment and the direct methods are all about aligning images in order to localize the, the car you want to get the relative transformation between images so you need consistency and typically you assume color consistency but the colors are not the same because we're looking at the same scene in completely different lighting different weather different seasons right and so one of the things that Lukas von Stromberg developed is an, a loss function and a neural network that is designed to kind of uh, come up with the feature descriptor for each pixel, which is designed to, to be optimal for a Gauss-Newton type SLAM optimization. And I don't want to go too much into detail, but the key uh, here is the idea. You assume that you have mapped the world in, with a white point cloud uh, shown here or the gray point cloud. And then you drive through the same scene in a different uh, season, different time of the day, different lighting, and you want to relocalize yourself with a blue point cloud in the previously created 3D map. Why are we doing this? Well, one of the aims is to come up with techniques that allow you to localize a car in an environment without GPS. Nowadays, we typically rely on GPS, but in cities, GPS is very unreliable. In parking garages, tunnels, in the forest, typically it doesn't work so well. And here, we can actually get away with just aligning to some previously created map. But it requires us to deal with the changing weather conditions, and this is why we introduced the Gauss-Newton loss and the gauss -Newton. We also came up with a data set uh, for quantitative evaluation, multi-weather localization benchmark, we call it. We use data from Kala and from robot car, but we simulated different you know, lighting, different seasons, et cetera, to, to get a, a data and a kind of a benchmark challenge out of it, where you want to do alignment or, or localization in, in, in across different uh, seasons or weather, sunny overcast, sunny rainy. And then he trained this network. And what was interesting is the network was trained on sunny, rainy and overcast. It was not trained on snow. It had never seen snow, but still it actually generalized fairly well also uh, across unknown uh, kind of lighting and, and seas. We recorded then a more significant own data set, a much larger one called the Four Seasons data set uh, for um, uh, multi-weather slam in autonomous driving. And it involves, as you can see, spring, fall, winter, uh, also daylight, nighttime, clear sky, so the, you know, rainy, etc. So very different weather conditions, different lighting, different seasons. But always kind of the same environments that we drove over and over, in fact, we had a lot of uh, diverse and complex scenes. We have centimeter accurate geo-reference six degrees of freedom pose for all of these sequences. And we have accurate pixel-wise correspondence between images. How did we do it? Well, this is work that we did through our startup Artisans uh, that develop sensory systems involving typically stereo cameras, inertial uh, sensors, RTK, GPS. So all of that is, is here. Uh, and then we drove over 350 kilometers rec of recordings, nine different scenarios that we traversed multiple times in different times of day, different lighting, different season, et cetera. And that makes up this whole benchmark. Moreover, what we did to get the ground truth, this is important here, is uh, we did first uh, a stereo inertial odometry. Uh, then we fused with RTK GPS to get kind of global reference. And then in addition to correct errors or drift, we introduced loop closures and pose graph optimization. So here's one example. This is a an example of a trajectory that goes into a parking garage, several levels of the parking garage. You see it here on the, on the top view. And uh, the issue is in a parking garage, you have no GPS, right? And so you don't have any absolute information. And so the visual, purely vision inertial based system will invariably drift a little bit if you do multiple loops. So the parking lot at the end, the red trajectory, there is a drift. And we close that drift by doing a post graph optimization, which basically means we, aim, we um, do an optimization of the trajectory to make things globally consistent. 
something that we'd introduced already in LSD slam. Uh, here you see it in a perspective view. <clears throat> we also have, as I said, uh, correspondence across, you know, different weather, different season, different daytime, nighttime. In addition, what we did is we trained neural networks to generate semantic 3D maps. Once you've created a 3D point cloud of the world, it's fairly easy to tap into neural networks to extract the semantics of the world to distinguish drivable area, sidewalks, pedestrians, uh, vegetation. And we deployed our sensors in a whole fleet of car. And within just a few hours, uh, we actually mapped 8,000 kilometers of the top distance, a large part of Berlin that we mapped semantically. And I'm sure you've seen a lot of semantic segmentations, but typically they're image segmentations. And I think one thing that's very important for self-driving in particular is that the vision, the, the computer vision community has to go more towards the 3D world and start to reason not so much about images, but about the world that we see in these images. And this is what we're doing here. Next, we can train neural networks to enhance SLAM. So we can train networks to predict the depths to predict the pose, to predict an uncertainty. And then we can feed all of these predictions into the SLAM pipeline. Basically we say, find a global reconstruction of the world such that for every keyframe, the world is consistent with the depth prediction of the network and the motion prediction of the network for consecutive frames. And these deep network predictions, they stabilize everything and in particular, they bring in the scale of the world. Because when we predict depths from a single frame, uh, we actually get metric predictions of the depths. And once we feed all of that into a SLAM pipeline, we get a, a result, uh, a, a system that can track a single camera. So this is just one camera, no GPS, no inertial, no IMU, nothing, just one standard camera. And as you can see, we can create very large maps from just a single camera and the system generates the depth predictions that it needs to, uh, to stabilize the approach. And then, you know, you can drive around blocks and there's essentially no drift, especially compared to the monocular baseline approach. This deep learning enhanced system is extremely precise and robust. And what's nice is it generalizes also quite well to different scenarios. So we, when we train on Kitty and test on, on other data sets, it, it still works quite well. Here's the evaluations. We evaluated the visual odometry. Here, comparison to classical methods. There, comparison to deep learning methods. And you see this approach that we call D3VO is significantly more accurate. In fact, it is also on par in terms of performance with top stereo inertial methods. So having a deep network that generates predictions allows you to basically compensate for missing sensory information. You can make up by the network hallucinating. Okay, thank you. Then we can go further. We can train neural networks to actually generate the dense world. We do so here by a technique that we call monorec. It starts by taking a sequence of consecutive images, creating a, a brightness cost volume, and that gives you a more, more reliable depth predictions. And then we have a math module that filters out moving objects. And uh, uh, that way we can map the static 3D world, even if there are cars driving around. So we can take kitty sequences where there are typically always some cars driving around, and we can create a reconstruction of the static world that is not affected by the moving objects. They're essentially filtered out. This is not perfect. It's not fully photorealistic, but note it's fairly detailed and it's quite large scale and this all runs in real time. So this allows you to go from just one single camera, you can create copies of the world. And I think it shows that there is a hope that we can replace LIDARs for 3D sensing because what you get out here from just a single camera is a fairly dense 3D world. And possibly the point cloud is not quite as precise as a LIDAR point cloud, but it's significantly more dense and it's colored. And I think it's sufficiently accurate to enable self-driving. 
But we went further because here you only get the fronts. You don't get the backs of the car because we don't see them, right? So this system doesn't hallucinate things that are not visible. And then uh, the lead author, Felix Wimbauer, uh, he went further and developed something that will be presented next week at CVPR conference. It's a technique that he called behind the scenes. The idea is it's a little bit related to NERF. You, we, you know, everything nowadays is NERF. This is different from NERF in many ways. So NERF basically uh, generates this uh, density, uh, but it also generates color. So a volumetric encoding of color, this radiance field. Um, but here we predict the density only. We don't predict the color because we have the color in the input images. So we don't need to predict color. And as a result, we can get away with, it, with a significantly smaller MLP that also runs much faster. Typically, I think five frames a second is roughly that runtime for this, right? And it, it's also the other difference is it's an egocentric perspective. So it's designed for self-driving. I don't think NERF would actually apply here. Because with NERF, you typically need a lot of multi-view images to recover a 3D scene. Here, we just drive through with this one camera. We predict a density for every pixel. And that allows us to really look behind the scenes, as you see here. So the top is the input video. And on the bottom, you see uh, the 3D reconstructions that we are generating. So we're not only generating the front of the car here, just comparison, but also the back compares them to pixel nerve and also compares them to mono depths too. Mono depths is really a depth prediction. It only offers a single depth for each pixel, but we offer a full 3D kind of density that allows us to generate a voxel occupancy as you see. And so this is the first step, I think, in, in trying to get the full 3D reconstruction from a single camera drive through. Last part of my talk, uh, when, uh, how do we capture the dynamics of the world? If you want to test and train self-driving cars, you know, do you have a complete understanding of the human world, of the critical scenarios? If you have agents that in a simulation world, do they really behave like humans? Do you have a complete understanding of how humans drive? And, and how do we get to this understanding? Well, there are three ways uh, um, uh, of... Um, um, uh, getting data of the world. One is the common one that a lot of car companies also deploys. You put cameras in the car. I've shown a lot of that. But you can also nowadays tap into surveillance cameras that give you video uh, for hours. And you can tap into aerial data, uh, drones in particular, to get like a, a bird's eye view of, of things and you get a much more complete coverage. Right? If you drive yourself and the car in front of you breaks, you typically have no clue why it breaks. But if you see the whole thing from the air and you have all the agents in place, you can start to really understand and, and model uh, uh, the dynamics. How do, do we do it at deep scenario? First, we generate a static reconstruction of the world, classical multi-view, then we track uh, the objects and we track them not with 2D bounding boxes, but with 3D bounding boxes. Uh, here's video, sorry, this video doesn't really play terribly well. I don't know, there's something with the encoding, I guess. But there are other videos, here's more videos. So here, for example, we see accidents, right? Three, two, one, bang. And you see why the accident happened. It's a common thing, right? You know, he tries to get across, but the other one stops because there's pedestrians. We also track pedestrians and cyclists. So it gives you a very complete picture of, of uh, uh, human driving and traffic. And what you see when you do when you do this analysis is that reality is really beyond imagination, at least for someone like me with a German background. I guess it, if you grew up in Mumbai, then a lot of this is completely normal to you. <laughs> For me, you know, not so. <laughs> uh, here's more examples, uh, busy roundabout. I'm now in the UK, they really love roundabouts. 
And, and so driving is very different. And, you know, someone was asking yesterday, uh, you know, if you drive on the left or on the right, is there a big difference? For me, no, it's not the driving on the left that gets me, but it's the roundabouts with, you know, five lanes going around and the, and the street crossing the roundabout. It's pretty, and then traffic lights, where I think wasn't the point of the roundabout to get rid of the traffic lights, <laughs> but you can combine, very clever. <clears throat> Right. And, and here, this is now examples of a surveillance camera, right? And this is nice because surveillance cameras give you a very cheap access to endless data, right? And they have networks that can track all the cars in 3D bounding boxes at very high precision. So you can start to really get a lot of data about human driving and you can start to uh, fill simulations. And this is what they do also to transfer this observed data to simulations. And they've been recording in many locations across Germany, in the US and many other countries. They have a lot of customers in the field, in the automotive field. Most of them were not allowed to disclose, but this is a few of the customers that we were allowed to disclose here. And if you're interested in this field of self-driving, uh, then do reach out to Deep Scenario. They, they are really keen on collaborating and creating more data uh, for understanding human driving. So I'll come to the end. I think at the end of my talk, I talked about the beginnings, my beginnings in driver assistance and self-driving. I talked about direct visual SLAM. I talked about deep learning enhanced SLAM approaches, about semantic 3D scene understanding, about monocular dense reconstructions of the world, and lastly also about capturing the 3D dynamics of uh, human driving. That's it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this great talk. With that, we are open to questions. So go ahead. Maybe you can pass from here because the microphone is connected to you. Great. Hi. Um, it seems like there's a long tail of kind of rare chance events in driving that are very difficult to overcome. So I'm wondering. Um, do you envision these approaches as uh, tackling those as well, or do you need like separate uh, approaches for the for the long tail? So I think that's a, a very good question, and that's somehow exactly what they're what they're aiming for is the rare cases, the critical cases, and 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 the issue that that we see is when when you do self driving, and you know there's a lot of companies on on the west coast who boast that they've driven millions of miles and recorded, you know, tons of data. But, you know, when you drive in the Midwest for millions of miles, you typically never see accidents unless you are involved in an accident yourself. But then if you go to an intersection and a roundabout that has been, yeah, you know, in Oxford, I think there are roundabouts where I would bet my head that there's on average one accident a day because it's, it's really, you know, some, some of those crazy. And if, if, if you then put a drone there and record for hours, you'll get a lot of accidents and you will get all the critical cases that you never see when you just have a camera installed front facing. If you're a safe driver, you'll avoid accidents and the self-driving companies certainly do not want to be involved in accidents. It's bad for the reputation of the whole field, right? So they really avoid accidents, which means in their data, they will typically not have any accidents. But here you've seen, we have a lot of examples of accidents and, and really crazy driving that we see when you have a drone because we can go to locations that are notoriously you know, challenging and then we'll see all the critical cases unfold. And that's the aim to, to, to really get all the corner cases and make sure that we have all these extreme scenarios in our data. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And the introduced SLAM works uh, generally use one single camera. I understand that can be, you know, cost. Uh, Require a lower cost, uh, but have you considered to use multiple cameras or north techniques to uh, can we will this derive a better representation or results for the slam? So that's uh, yet another good question. Definitely, um, I was arguing cost. Cost is a big issue. 
But at the same time, it's clear the more sensors you get hold of, the better your estimates. That's always the case, right? Even with deep learning enhanced systems, if you have more sensory data, the better, right? Uh, but it comes at the price, right? And the price is cost, but the price is also size, right? LiDAR, for example, is very bulky on the roof. You know, no customer wants a bulky LiDAR scanner on the roof, right? And, and, and if you equip a car with, uh, you know, lighters and other sensors and you drive it, uh, you make it drive autonomously, but just the sensor stack is half a million dollars, then I say really great achievement, but who's going to buy that car? I won't, right? So, so cost is an issue. And so we should try to focus on low cost sensors. That could be ultrasound, radar, cameras. Cameras are cheap, so, you know, and I would recommend putting 20 cameras. But NERF is different because you typically need multi-view coverage. And this is why we developed this behind the scenes approach because it's kind of a, a variation on NERF that makes it work for monocular camera trajectories. Thanks a lot again. Thank you. So we will continue with our next. This is the area director of analysis and analysis of the department of the
and then you have the all right. So it seems to work now. Yeah. Um, is there any way to get rid of this panel? Oh, okay, so it's already removed. Right. Good. Um, okay. Thanks, everyone. Uh, okay, so the talk that I give today is on the night images, uh, especially from the perspective of image enhancement and object detection. All right. So, so this is the typical night images that we have if we take uh, a, an image in this time of, of the day. Uh, normally, night images uh, is dark and but not totally dark because there should be some light uh, in, in, in the scenes. And night images associated with low light. And um, although it is low light, there are some information that actually in night images because of the presence of these uh, light sources. And that's how we, if we boost it, just multiply with something and be careful with the gamma function, of course, if you know the gamma function and it's linear, then you can boost it as much as you want. And then that's what the image that you will get. There's actually, from this image, there's a lot of information that you can actually see, a uh, machine can see, right? Uh, but of course, uh, there are still some areas that are still dark. For example, this area here is still dark and that area here also still dark. And of course, if, this is, if there is no signal at all from the scene, then it is impossible to get anything uh, from, from the, the image. But perhaps there are some information that's still there. Right? And this information, if we zoom in the area of that you think is dark, like this area here, or the area near th this window, or the area near the trees here, then you will see this kind of image. Uh, it seems to me, if you look carefully there, there are some structure. And this structure is, of course, very, very noisy. So if you, if you see here, I think this is part of the house and this is part of the roof. Uh, and there are still very, very weak signals. And these weak, weak signals are actually degraded further with noise. So that's why low light images associated with noise. So if I can show you, uh, this is low light, real low light, there's much light in this image on the left, uh, especially. Uh, you see that there's a lot of noise. There are some structure, so if you, the right, figures is actually when we have the light, proper light, right? The exposure time is very high, but the left one, the, prop, the exposure time is very short. Uh, so that's why you have a lot of noise and low light condition. And low light is associated with noise. But of course we want in, in this uh, specific problem of noise is that we want to get the structure out of this noisy uh, data. But aside from noise, we also have, see a problem of color or appearance. The color here is washed out in some way, degraded in some way. So the blueness here is it, actually the same thing uh, as because it's taken from the same scene and same camera. Uh, you can see that the, the blueness is here, for example, it's not as blue as here, right? And also many, the green here, for example, is already degraded a lot. So this is the problem of low light and to some extent, the problem of nighttime. One is noise, how we can get the structure from these noisy scenes. And the second thing is the color or the appearance of the, of the image. So I will, in this talk, I will not talk too much on the, on the noise side because noise, there's a lot of denoising algorithms, but I will talk more into the color, the appearance of these scenes. Right, so the appearance of the scenes depends a lot, as I mentioned, on gamma function. I'm not really sure if you are familiar with gamma function. So every camera has a gamma function because of the range of the light uh, is much, much higher in the, in the of the value uh, compared to the pixel value. So pixel value is basically some, from zero to two five five, but the range of the light from zero to infinity, right? If it's a sun, it's very, very bright. So that's why there is a, there's some uh, function to transform this fluctuation of light in the natural world to pixel value, to 5.5. And to be able to get bigger range, uh, the manufacturers, the camera manufacturers uh, use this gamma function. So the y-axis here is actually the, the energy uh, from the light and the x-axis 
is the pixel value. And normally this gamma function is not linear. So we have to linear, linear them first, which is called uh, calibration, uh, photometric calibration, in order to get the uh, real color when you boost the image. So if you boost the image without calibration, the color will be very different. So for example, here, uh, assume that this one and this one are the, the same kind of color, for example. If you don't do the calibration, if you don't linearize the gamma function, then color will be different. Uh, different from, for example, if you see this one, this is a linear correlation between this purple and this purple here, but this is very different now from here to there because the, the in the middle one, the gamma function is not uh, actually uh, calibrated. But so, those, so that's one problem. Uh, if you want to boost the, the intensity of the image, we need to take care of the gamma function. And the other things here, as you can see, uh, the top left is the input image of low light. And then the other figures are the channels, a different channel or in R, in the red channel, in the green channel, this is red, uh, this is red channel, this is a green channel, and this is blue channel. As you can see here, the distribution of the information and the distribution of the noise are different for different channels, right? So the, for this, typic, uh, this type of cameras uh, that we use here, for example, and this type of scenes uh, that we have, this scene is reddish uh, because of the light color perhaps is kind of reddish. So there's more information of, of the red channels, right? And less, much less information in the blue channel. But in terms of the noise, the noise distribution in the red and the blue are much higher than the, the noise level in the green channel. So we need to be aware of this because we, if we want to optimize the information that we want to gain from night images, we need to find which channel that give you more information and which channel that have more noise specifically. Right? So that's one thing that you keep in mind. Uh, another problem in nighttime is that it's not just low light. It is also the distribution, uneven distributions of the light. So in one side, it is very, can be very bright. So this one is a bright side. And the other one here is a very dark side. So there's an even distribution of the light so that you have to be careful when you want to boost the information, when you boost the intensity, because we cannot naively boost every pixels with the same number, right? Uh, because the, the unevenness of the light distributions. I will talk about this later on for the details, but let's see uh, the first things that uh, we propose in our paper back in CPR 21 is uh, to have this uh, gamma function estimation. So we have a pipeline here uh, to boost the intensity of the nighttime images. One is to have this uh, gamma function, uh, automatic gamma function estimation, and then we decompose uh, the image into low level or, or low frequency and high frequency. And then we push the image using HDR. So this is the basic pipeline in our proposed method. So first of all, the basic idea of uh, gamma function estimation is that we have these patches. So if you have four patches here, for example, these patches, these patches, and that patches and this patches, so that we have four patches. And each patches here has some boundaries, color boundaries. So this one is the color boundaries between blue and, and black. And then we have red and black and so on and so forth. So color boundaries give you some information, uh, some cues on gamma function. Why is that? Because if you have RGB space, in RGB space, in three dimensional space, and we plot the pixels here, every pixels on this line, on this, in, on this blue line, then we will have this kind of blue uh, uh, line distributions. And if the gamma function is linear, means that uh, you know, uh, RGB are linear, then it should be a straight line. In this space here, it should be straight line. So if it is not straight line, then that means that the gamma function is not linear. Right. So that's a constraint that we impose here. But of course, not every pixels or not every patches have this information. For example, if you take one patches from this white board here, there will be nothing there because there's no gradation, no, no changes of RGB value. Right. So that's the basic idea that we have here in our paper. We use uh, this knowledge, 
this physics knowledge or camera formation knowledge in developing our deep network. So uh, our deep network will train using this unsupervised training, and then we can predict uh, this kind of function uh, from a single image, even for night images. Uh, night images is much difficult from daytime because it is much noisier and the information is less. All right, so once we have this uh, radiometric calibration, then we can boost the image. So this is the boosting of the image from nighttime uh, to uh, uh, somehow brighter version of this nighttime. And this is the ground truth. The ground truth is basically just taken the image using higher uh, you know, uh, exposure time. And as you see, the color is more or less the same compared to the other existing methods. So if you don't care about this gamma function, the color uh, profile of this building, for example, can be different from the ground truth. And if you do the, the, the quantitative evaluation, it will be misleading because you know uh, the quant they cannot be the same. And if you, you will suffer because of that. I mean, your number will be suffer uh, will suffer because of the uh, difference between the RGB value and of the ground truth and your and your output. But in our method, we don't really suffer that one because we have a we linearize or knowing the gamma function uh, for this specific camera. So that's one thing. The other things uh, in nighttime, we also have this problem of light effects or glare in this case. So the glare is because of this uh, sign light from the car from this from the car it is red when it when it's red then the surrounding will be red and if we boost this intensity of this image it will be much redder and the visibility will be much more degraded so that's something that we don't want so that's why we want to decompose the image into low frequency and high frequency so why we have to do this uh, because uh, in low frequency uh, so that's the point one number one here that we want to have low frequency and to in low frequency we believe that the glare reside in the low frequency but in low frequency it's not just glare or light effects there's many other information as well so we have to remove the glare effects from the low frequency and to get this uh, to get rid of the uh, light effects or glare, we have a few constraints. For example, in this case, the gradient has to be smooth uh, for the light effects or the glare. And then there is a gradient exclusion uh, constraint to, to maximize the distance between the light effect uh, layers and low uh, frequency layers. And then we assume that the, the world is a gray world for the layers that is free from glare, that is free from uh, uh, light effects. And this is the illustration that we have. We have an input image, and then we have low frequency, the original low frequency. And then we, this is the decomposition of the glare or light effects from the lo low frequency. Now the low frequency information is independent from the glare. Right? So once we have this, then we can combine the low frequency back with the high frequency. And this is the output, the final output that we have. Now we have uh, low frequency and high frequency together uh, without the light effects, without the glare. Right. So that's the basic idea of the first paper that we have. So this is the comparisons. This is the input image. This is our output. And this is the existing method that use just push the, the, the intensity. Again, if you just push the intensity, the glare, the light effects will be boosted as well, and that will reduce or degrade your image even further. Okay, so this is another comparison here. And now we look at this uh, light effects or glare effects even further. And this is, for example, the image that, uh, that we work on. As you can see here, there's the glare on the, on the front side because there's a very bright light. But on the other hand, on the back of this, image here, it is very dark. We cannot even see what, I've, what things here. It seems like a house there, but we don't really have much information of the, this house, right? And again, if you want to see, hey, maybe perhaps we can boost it. Uh, of course, the, the front side will, will be degraded, but at least we can, can see what is the, the things behind there. So if you boost it further, that's what we have, right? So the glare actually even degrade uh, the things behind. So that's the problem that we want to solve. 
And in order to solve this, we know that the low frequency and high frequency is effective. But uh, the problem is uh, with low frequency and frequency is that it is not directly solve the problem because in the low frequency, we have to do the further decomposition, right? So instead of low frequency and high frequency, we use intrinsic image decomposition. So in this case, if you are familiar with intrinsic image decomposition, it is basically only two layers, the reflectance layer and the light layers or shading layers. But in this work, we have three layers. We have uh, reflectance layers, we have uh, light layers or shading layers, and we have glow layers or light effect layers. And for this one, uh, then we can have three networks, try to output all these three layers together. So we have G here is a glow layers, L here is light layers, and R here is reflectance layers. Everything here is unsupervised because we don't have ground truth, right? So from the beginning, actually, we, uh, our method is uh, unsupervised in nature because to have the ground truth of clear and non clear is very, very difficult. So, and <clears throat> this is the output that we have, uh, the glow, uh, lightness or shading and reflectance. We have initial uh, supervised training without the glare. When we have the glare input image, we don't have the ground truth anymore, right? Uh, so from the initialization, we can have this kind of uh, estimation, and then we can have this uh, predicted uh, initial prediction of, of the scene without glare, without light effects. And then we refine this further using our refinement. And our refinement here is a generator, basically just uh, any generator that you can find, UNET, for example. But on top of this UNET, we also have a classification. So the classification is actually just a very simple classification, binary classification, whether the input image has glare or not, have the light effects or not. So we have two set of images uh, unpaired. Uh, one is have a light effects and the other is uh, uh, clean night images. So in that case, we will have this, the, the features or the, the a cam that can, in, uh, that can focus on glare effects. So this is the glare effects that is found by our network. And this glare effects can be our attention. So we put attention here multiplied with the features that we have. So if there's uh, glare attention, glare features, then it glare feature will be uh, propagated, will be uh, augmented with, uh, with this uh, attention. Right. And this is the, what I just mentioned, that we have this classification uh, and the input is a pair, uh, unpair uh, images, for example, this one and that one. So clean, uh, we have blank layers, but if it is uh, light effects image or clear image, then we can have this layers and the image itself. So we train this network offline and then we can have this kind of cam information for any input that we can uh, process. So aside from this, so uh, the network here, we have uh, layer decomposition in the, in the beginning, uh, there's a glow light or shading and reflectance. And then we have this unsupervised unit, uh, but with, with cam in, inside it, and then we can have output. And because we don't have the ground truth, then everything here must be unsupervised. So we have this unsupervised uh, method uh, from the input. Of course, if you use the input, the problem is that input has the light effects, has the glare in it. So as I mentioned earlier, if you look carefully in the RGB channels, they have different information. So for example, if it is red glow like this, or red glare like this, the, the red channel will be suffer a lot. It will suffer more glare than blue channel. So we choose which one is not affected uh, by glare, and then we can have a less glare uh, input. It's still, glare is still there, but much less. And then we use a structure consistency and high frequency consistency with our output. Okay, so that's how we can use the unsupervised uh, learning here because we have unsupervised loss, unsupervised losses in this case. So this is again the input that we have, and then that's the output. So the difference is quite significant, I think, because now you can see even how many windows uh, on in the back. Right. So now com compared to the existing method, this is the existing method that can do is uh, fail to, to get the any information behind uh, that clear. So this is another example of the, our output and this one as well. 
So the good thing is that uh, we can suppress the light, but at the same time, we can see more on the back. So this is the comparisons. Uh, uh, this is our input here, this is our output, and the rest is the existing methods. Okay, so uh, I, this is the last part of my talk today is uh, object detection. So we also have a high level of object detection uh, to find cars or pedestrian or traffic lights. So the basic things that we propose uh, in this conference, the coming conference, is that we have a student teacher framework uh, to deal with the case because we have the source image uh, that is daytime with uh, annotation. And, but the problem is that for nighttime to get the annotation is very difficult. Even for human to do the annotation pondering boxes for nighttime is almost impossible because uh, far away scenes will be very difficult to, to, uh, to be annotated. So that's the problem. We don't want to uh, have the annotation for the target image, but we do have a lot of annotation for the daytime. So the daytime is not possible; it's still possible for human to do the annotation. So basically, that's the the setting that we have. So first of all, uh, in the initialization stage, we use the daytime image uh, with some augmentation to train our network. So this is our teacher network. Uh, it is supervised because we also we already have the bounding boxes, the annotation for the daytime. So this is the typical uh, uh, augmentation that we have. We use a lot of different things like adding noise, uh, reducing the intensity, uh, using frequency. Uh, in the earlier uh, talk, they, uh, they also used frequency. We also use frequency for our augmentation and other things. And once we have this initialization, now our network somehow have the knowledge of night images. It's not perfect night images, but somehow have some, some knowledge on accessing uh, this image here. So the one that is uh, accessible from this uh, data augmentation is something that easy, something like this one, for example. This we call easy cases. So with certain con high, uh, with certain level of confidence, we can find easy cases. And this easy cases is already useful for our student teacher network because now the teacher can teach the students at least for the cases that are easy, like this one that I mentioned here. For the one that is difficult, like, like hard cases like this one, it will miss out. But that's fine because we can learn that later on bit by bit. The key idea of the student and teacher framework, why this work, is because we deliberately degrade the input for the students. So we make the student's life more difficult than the teacher. Right. So in that case, if the students can solve this easy case, which is not easy case anymore for the student because it's already degraded, then it will learn something more significant than the teacher because the teacher have the easy case for, for the estimation of this. And this easy case is important because the student, uh, the teacher need to give good guidance uh, to, the to the students. If there's no good guidance, if there's no correct guidance, everything will be uh, will break down, right? So there's two key here. One is to give a challenge to the student by de de deliberate degradation. And the other is good guidance from the teacher. Now, with, if this assumption works, then the, the, the iteration will give you better and better learning process. Uh, the accumulation of the learning process will be there. So that's what we did. Uh, we de degrade the students. And, and for easy case, and that will accumulate the knowledge from the student and the student will become a teacher in the future using EMA, using the average of the student's models. And we also found uh, in this framework that, you know, uh, one stage only will make the process of the learning slower because what we learn here is that when the, on, only when the teacher is very confident, when the teacher is not confident, that knowledge will not be passed on to the students. So we don't want to have this a very slow process of learning. And for that one, we accelerate this using two frameworks, uh, two stages uh, of learning. How we can do that first is that the student give us give guidance, conservative guidance, because the, the teacher has to be very confident. And that confidence, uh, conservative, uh, knowledge will be passed on to the, to the students 
But because the student have more challenging tasks, more challenging life, the student will be better than teacher by the end of the batch. By the end of the batch, the student will be better than uh, the teacher because the teacher doesn't learn anything. It's, uh, it's frozen. Now, once the students learn something, then the students can also propose some knowledge. So in this case, the students will propose some region that may be some objects. So this is the, the object proposed by student, not proposed by the teacher, but proposed by the students. Right. And then once the students propose this uh, uh, bonding boxes, the teacher will check. But now the threshold is reduced, not with high confidence threshold, but less confidence threshold. Because in the first place, the, the student already proposed something. So the threshold should not be that high. The, the threshold has to be uh, lessened, the, to be lesser than, than the previous one, less conservative, more liberal. And, and in that case, uh, of course, they still have some threshold because uh, uh, you know, uh, if it's really, really not confidence, we, we cannot teach that to the students. So with that, uh, the process of learning can be much faster. And this is the AP or the stabilization study that we have. If you don't do anything uh, using just vanilla student teacher, we can only reach 31.7, uh, but with student teacher that uh, we have uh, with two stages, uh, C here is two stages uh, uh, process, we have a much higher uh, number. And if all other components will have a lot in this process. And also in our paper, the most important thing when you do the degradation for the, for the students here, uh, we include scale. We're scaling down uh, the, the, the image deliberately. And that makes the life of the student even also difficult. Anyway, so we can see here that our process is getting better and better, means that the accumulation of the knowledge, even though it's unlabeled, is, uh, is going up. I mean, not the accuracy. And yeah, so this is the uh, output, the qualitative output. So this is the things there. And actually, if we brighten up, uh, it is not that bad. Uh, but still, the, 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 the appearance of this nighttime compared to the daytime are so different. They are not actually the same. And even further, if we study dark like that, and if we brighten up, even for human, it's quite difficult because of the noise is there. But even for this difficult case, our network with the challenging uh, task for the students and good guidance from the teacher, it can learn something and accumulate knowledge. All right, so that's all my talk today. This is my team that are working with me in this uh, topic. Thank you, everyone. Thanks a lot, Robbie. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? Uh, yeah, please come ahead and then I will, we will take also your question. Yeah. Hi. Yeah, thank you. Very interesting talk. Yeah, thank you. Um, so uh, I assume because you're talking about the R's, the G's, and the B's, it's mostly like bigger filters for the majority of this. Um, how well does your method extend to other color filter arrays if you have tried that? Yeah, so um, in my view, very mosaicing filter, filters are. Uh, will not affect our result that much because we are not trained on specific uh, camera uh, images. Uh, we use uh, different images for different cameras. So actually some of our images are taken from the internet. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Great, and then we have a question. So what would you say in glare around more bright spots? Are you able to cover Yeah, a good question. So the question is the saturated regions uh, of this input image, right? So there is a there are some pixels that are saturated there, but actually we don't really process them. So because uh, saturated pixels or zero value pixels, basically nothing that we can gain from them. Yeah, thank you. Any 
So in the calibration of the gamma function, where we were using the edges, uh, are those affected by things like motion blur or lens efficiency? Definitely, yes. Uh, so motion blur will affect the, the, the distributions, but affect the distribution in a good way because we can have more gradual changes of the intensity, not abrupt changes. Yeah, thank you. Great, so let's uh, thank uh, Robbie once again. Thanks for the great talk. Yeah. So uh, we will have a lunch break now and we will
One, two, three, four test. Is it working? Yeah. Okay. One, two, three. One, two, three. The check was on all slides are running well. Just asking people on Zoom because. Yeah, yeah, no, no, it's always complicated. Yeah, yeah I, I, I am on Zoom and I can see the slides and hear you. All right, great. Thank you, Amir. <laughs> All right, so the other is also. Yeah, yeah, this is yeah. the beginning is uh, similar to the last. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but I have to yeah. take all the, yeah. the guys with me. So <laughs> without this introduction, yeah. it's difficult. Yeah. So, uh, but the do, results. Do you are... guys know each other actually or not? No. So, so uh, Werner, hi. This is Wim. Is our uh, collaborator. At, okay. uh, we have the project with uh, Toyota Motor Europe. Oh, okay, great. Uh, trace project, and we are collaborating with him. Yeah, so, that's great. Yeah. And Werner is uh, at uh, Daimler, right? Yeah. yeah. Oh, Mercedes now, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> okay, yeah. <laughs> okay. That's why I asked. Yeah, yeah we changed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we also did a lot of nice work on adverse conditions. Yeah. I remember already, I think the first. Daimler was presenting their stereo system, so they've been at it for a long time. <laughs> yeah, 2009 is a pretty long time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I just uh, playing with my mm -hmm. slides a little yeah, bit, yeah. seeing whether everything is working. You have some videos that, uh, yeah, yeah, seems yeah. to. And, uh, okay. A lot of slides and uh, not enough time. But... Yeah, well, as always. Right? Yes, yeah, it's <laughs> But I can shorten it. So mm -hmm. if I don't present every every intermediate result, that's also okay. <laughs> then I'm done. Yeah. Okay. All right. Cool. Um, so do you want to back. leave it like this? Yeah. Now, uh, yeah. I don't know if you need your laptop. But... No, I don't need okay. it. Okay. Okay. Great. So it's just best go, to yeah, yeah. I just want to go back yeah. to the start. Yeah, I don't start. know. Okay. It, can you press? Yeah. Uh, let me see. I'm fine. No. Function. Normally it's function ah. five. It's ah. also not working. Mm -hmm. Then I have to somehow escape. To yes. Like, like, escape. Yeah. And, and then, then go back. Yeah. Uh, now this one it starts at the beginning normally. Yeah. 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 No, ah. not. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's new. Okay. Then uh, let's use. Uh, this one, just a moment. Okay. Don't see it. If we can scroll up. Yeah. No, uh, uh, because this, this is uh, overlaying. Uh, uh, ah, system. yeah. I the see, I see, press. I see. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Normally, this starts yes, at the yes, beginning, yes. but. Okay. So yeah. now, uh, short mm -hmm. any uh, presentation yeah. at the beginning. Um, so, okay. okay. Then I'm done. Cool. Go. Yeah, we, we have to actually quite good on the yeah. idea optimization something. Mm -hmm. 
and uh, uh, get it for, like, for, for the sensor part, uh, even a few vision for like yeah, like the waveform thing. Yeah, we started for the so we mm -hmm. extended that further now, mm -hmm. and now nice. we are optimizing the whole DSP. Oh, nice! Yes. And uh, the idea is like to at some point combine those bits. Oh, maybe can do something um, again. So you're also working with the you know the water film on the surface, or so the, the method we do now. Um, is, is purely for good weather yeah, yeah. because you have still this multi part effects on, on object edges, and yeah, they yeah, still have to decide first or last because you have the whole, you know, the whole angle. Yeah, you yeah. have the whole scene, yeah. solid angle of, yeah. the, of the, you know, the cross section of the liter, yeah. 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 and part of it will reflect on the optics, part of it yeah. will uh, go further. And that is the question like, how to select, how to adjust the power. You can yeah, also yeah. adjust power differently for different layers yeah. and so forth. So it's a lot of people actually. Really yeah, yeah. About it. yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> true, yeah. true. So, and it's something. Okay. When when is uh, when when are this uh, process? Uh, tomorrow, 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 tomorrow. I have to look at the time. Okay. But they are at the so, same time. So okay. Now, <laughs> did, uh, did the organizers not optimize for that? No, no. They they are placing us next to them. One is pushing ah, okay. either the other one is pushing. Ah, so it's <laughs> really. <laughs> Okay, at least you can, you know, jump uh, from one to the other is <laughs> nice, nice. Okay. Yeah, how how did the workshop uh, this challenge go with the with the ACDC? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, we had some participants uh, and uh, actually for the domain adaptation part, uh, the state of the art was uh, was improved uh, yeah. considerably, I would say. And now we have also two new tasks. Uh, for the data set because we augment the annotations with uh, instance level masks. Okay. So now we have also object detection and the panel documentation. And we're preparing also the extension of the, of the data set uh, for uh, like a subsequent paper because the original paper was only with uh, some other documentation. So, yeah, so I guess that's good. You also added the clear level, right? That's something you said you were we, planning to do. Yes, yes, we still we still haven't done it yet, but it's also uh, you know in progress. Is Tengsi also there actually today? Or uh, no, he's not here. He he's uh, organizing the yeah. workshop, but that he, he did not come to Zurich. Yeah. So yeah. Uh, me and Lucas Hoyer, uh, mm -hmm. another colleague from ETH, uh, uh, taking on with uh, and have you met also with uh, Will? This is Mario. Nice we collaborate you. also for the leaders' common simulation. Yeah, yeah, he's now at Princeton. Okay. Yeah. Are you a good time? Definitely. It's, uh, it's a nice place to be. And we'll also have a talk by Felix, Felix Heiser. Felix also here? Yes, yeah, he will come to come. Yes. Mm -hmm. Well, because I saw on Sunday there was a uh, lesson about point to point uh, optimization at the whole feeling. So, mm -hmm. but yeah, we don't have people looking into the process. It's pretty short of time. Did you have to check the comment now? Yes, there's yeah. a lot of time change for those I mean, yeah. 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 yeah, one hour yeah. and one five months ago. Yeah, I was going to the CA to the Oh, yeah, yeah. It's time for the class. Yeah, there was a table machine that was in the back of the night. You know what happened the first time? Uh, same you mean with uh, the for our uh, for uh, 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 u
At some point, you asked me about uh, basically what was the startup and what's the problem that can solve. But after a few months and you know, before before preparing the challenge, he said that he decided that he can do the last software. So now you're doing it. So now I'm the first doctor, but not jointly with uh, our one who was a uh, colleague of them. So, oh, so, much okay. uh, okay. so mm -hmm. yeah, so we will. Uh, and he is taking most of care about the new uh, passes okay. for the extension, like uh, object detection. Uh, do you have any idea when you do uh, We would like to do it uh, before the end. Uh, from my side, uh, what I want to do is update all the uh, uh, compiles and all the sort of uh, also using what we have from the compiles that we have. This is a bit of a Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Yeah, but I wanted also at some point to stop the topic and other ones. It was the chain of the order. So I would say I'm still now like maybe in each other. And also, there was a significant amount of effort for updating the website, the evaluation yeah. server, uh, because for the child, yeah. yeah. uh, we have to update you know, the data. Ah, that's awesome. yeah. 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 So, yeah. To the back end, doing all the. Yeah, but uh, like we call it, the games are together well. We had also some solutions for the new and we'll have the winners present their submission. Uh, no, I see him often. Yeah, but he's traveling a lot. You know, but uh, we have our Zoom meetings most of the time. And, uh, yeah, I also see him a lot. Now I want to, you know, because like I want to focus more and uh, perhaps have some regular meetings with him so that you know we are more on the same page. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he is, uh, I think it's in Ukraine. Ah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because I also have been Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that project has been like. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, but uh, Luke is very passionate. He doesn't want to retire. He wants to stay in the business. Yeah, yeah. I don't mind. I think it's starting out this year. So yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, true. true. Because this whole thing is new. Yeah. There's it's, another. It's very valuable. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, there's this uh, professor from ETH, Martin Betcher. Uh, uh, he is like the architect of this whole uh, effort. Okay. He's also from Bulgaria, but he, he has been a professor at the So he's behind the whole organization of this university, trying to improve 
it's like experienced professors okay. and making connections with uh, other institutions. He's also connected with the side. He's also inside. He's not uh, like just primarily inside, but I think he's collaborating, he's starting to collaborate. Okay, it would be good to get in touch with you because we have some projects. Yeah, he's like, uh, you know, if he's here, I don't know. I don't know. My guess is that he's more also in the human computer. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we have some projects in other areas. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Ron. Yeah, yeah. 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 I saw Ben Sheila, so he's here today. Ah, oh, yeah, he's here. Yes, I saw him also. But that it was like in the, the lunch, you know, with the old yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's nice. Uh, it's a bit like uh, a lot of Chinese people were yeah, flying. Yeah, 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 exactly. Yeah. For example, uh, for the camouflage uh, uh, object sound, uh, they couldn't go it. That's because he had it from the previous year. Okay, so he's here. But he's here, yes. But first of all, it was a very good thing. It's uh, very sad, uh, but what can I say? I mean, what it is. And, uh, and he is, he is in China or he's in Switzerland? Or? Karen uh, Gwale, uh, I think. Yes. I don't even know the reason yeah. that they are rejected. Is it because of the relations? Uh, like the real reason, or the, you know, the reason <laughs> that they put in the, in the decision <laughs> that uh, I think there is a national. Okay. Uh, uh, it's uh, really, really yeah. tricky yeah. because, you know, other people are missing out. Like being able to We set up uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, no worries. Yeah. No worries. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Werner, uh, would you like us to start so that you also yeah. gain like a couple of more minutes? Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, that's great. Yes, so. I think we will not have. So I need I need more than thirty yeah. minutes. That's why <laughs> I start now. Yeah. Okay, let me briefly introduce yeah. you to the audience. So uh, thanks for uh, coming again in the afternoon session of the Vision for All Seasons workshop. Our next speaker is Verna Rita. Uh, Verna received his Master of Science in Computer Science from the Technical University of Berlin uh, in 1988 and his PhD from, <laughs> from the University of Koblenz. Yeah. He has been with uh, Daimler-Benz AG uh, in the Driver Assistance Systems Division uh, since, uh, okay, I will admit that. <laughs> and continued his work in the same division at Mercedes-Benz AG on October 1st, 2021, after the split. Since uh, 2012, he has been responsible for research activities at Daimler, Mercedes-Benz, in the field of perception in adverse weather. In this context, he has worked on or managed numerous uh, publicly funded projects, uh, most recently, uh, projects such as Robust Sense, Dense, and AIC. So it's our pleasure to have you here, Werner. Yeah. And we're looking forward to listening to your talk. Yeah, thank you for the nice introduction. So because we are short of time and I have a lot of slides, I will go through my slides very rapidly. So uh, as mentioned, so my talk is about uh, a European research project, the last uh, research project, it's called AIC. And it stands for artificial intelligence to improve vehicle vision for automated driving in poor vision conditions. And I will present uh, the last uh, results uh, of uh, the project. So, uh, Bernard, can, I interrupt you? can you turn on? Can we turn on your uh, yeah to the camera please. so that we have that? Yeah. Uh, okay. I will, I will ask you to um, turn on. Yeah. And you should get this, and then we start also your video. Yeah. Okay. And so, then also. Uh, is okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And yeah, we started the project uh, AIC or uh, the predecessor project Dance uh, uh, because uh, we want to solve the question or we want to have answers on the questions of how we can ensure that uh, automated vehicles drive reliably even in adverse weather conditions. And uh, yeah, the goal uh, of the AIC project uh, was uh, or is uh, still to develop a robust fault tolerant, a robust and fault tolerant mobile sensing technology. And this is also important an associated AI. That's also the key, I think, which enables automated driving in all relevant weather and lighting conditions, uh, and which at the end should allow uh, safe driving 24 hours, 365 days um, a year. So the challenge is um, uh, a, a stress field. So uh, on one hand, uh, currently commerci commercialization of automated vehicles is difficult uh, due to their inability to drive under any relevant weather and lighting condition. So and on the other hand, so till today, uh, uh, testing takes place in small designated areas with good uh, weather conditions, mainly California. 
And uh, that's why, and that's still the case, I can show you afterwards or in my uh, presentation, uh, uh, prototypes still struggle, uh, completely fail in, in, in adverse weather. So <clears throat> this is uh, no problem uh, if you're talking about uh, so-called level two systems, which we have currently on the road, because uh, these uh, so-called hands on the wheel uh, systems, uh, uh, in this so-called hands on the wheel system, the driver is responsible for the driving task. So, and uh, in cause of a failure, uh, he immediately can interact. So, and this changes dramatically or significantly if we go to a level three systems, which we also have now the first one on the road, and we also have the permission to to run it in California. That's a newest thing. Uh, but uh, then, uh, with uh, uh, such an ADS, uh, uh, the system itself is uh, responsible for the uh, driver task, and this means it's liable uh, for in case of an accident. And uh, that's why uh, it is mandatory uh, that uh, that we have an, an, an a self monitoring process, uh, which takes care uh, or looks uh, whether this uh, ADS still uh, operates safely or. Uh, uh, runs into uh, uh, future in, uh, inoperability. So, and in case of, for the uh, adverse weather case, uh, this means the system must independently detect uh, its in, inoperability uh, caused by adverse weather. And uh, if uh, the system de detects it, it should be uh, uh, fulfill the driving task uh, safely till the handover is done. And here we are talking minimum 10 seconds. And uh, some of the higher manager are dreaming of 30 seconds. So we will see. Okay, that's uh, to understand uh, why we are doing all these things. So, and uh, nevertheless, uh, some of the OEMs or future OEMs uh, ignore, uh, still ignore this problem. Uh, yeah, here are two examples, and I can show you that, that is, uh, this is true what I'm saying. Uh, Maybe the reason is that uh, there are still a lot of other problems to solve. That's the same with us. So I hear it from my health management also uh, every day. So, well, first of all, we should blah, blah, blah. Uh, but we could not ignore uh, the adverse vessel problem uh, because uh, uh, in case it fails, so it, it, it's pretty expensive and, and also uh, 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 really bad for the company itself. So, uh, Thanks, God, uh, the, the uh, uh, admission uh, authority of California said, so, well, you, you can test these uh, cars only in good weather, not in that weather. So, uh, that's, uh, that's a good thing. They are, uh, are aware of it. Uh, but uh, nevertheless, yeah, and these are the uh, old-fashioned sensors, uh, normal LIDARs and normal cameras they have on it. And that's why, uh, yeah, it, it came as it uh, should came. So uh, in uh, April, I think, yeah, April, five uh, cars uh, uh, stuck uh, in the middle of the traffic of San Francisco. And the reason was uh, there's fog and it's just imagine. So uh, as they could test the, 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 the uh, system only from 10 a.m., I think, till in the morning at, at six o'clock and 10 before six. So. Uh, uh, sudden fog happen, which normally happens uh, uh, during sunrise or as the sun goes down. And yeah, and they, 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 they uh, stand there for at least 10 minutes. That's it. And, and, and the cars did, uh, did, did not really uh, know what to do. And for me, success uh, clearly say they, they know have an emergency uh, procedure. They did not have uh, recognized that the system is not working because of, of fog. So that's, that's, that's evident for me. Okay, uh, yeah. Uh, and as the reason is uh, uh, clear, so why the system will not work. So uh, this is a conventional uh, LiDAR in, in the middle of the big image. And we made this test five years ago in the predecessor project ends. And you see the results of the, of the LiDAR system. Uh, most energy is wasted. Uh, uh, these are the, the, the red dots uh, near uh, the sensor itself. And the pedestrians, which are important in this scenario, uh, uh, say, say vanish at the end of this small fog chamber. And the fog chamber has got a length of 32 meters. And uh, uh, fog density uh, with a visibility range of 50 meters means uh, at 25 meter, uh, so the uh, LIDAR will not work. Uh, that's really critical. And the same is true uh, if you uh, 
I use a standard RGB camera. This is top left. You also have problems to recognize, uh, even if you do some uh, image processing, the pedestrians near the car. So because the disturbing signal is uh, significantly overlaying uh, the, 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 the signal uh, of, of, of interest. Okay, the only camera which uh, is working under these conditions, this is a, it's a gated cam, but this is a, the gated cam where we do some research on it. So, and I will explain it uh, in more detail later on. Okay, yeah, uh, and just imagine, so yeah, you have such a system mounted on your self-driving car and you run into a pothole, uh, what will happen? Yeah, uh, so the question is, could we allow to, to, uh, to drive uh, such a car blind? Uh, you may say just for 10 seconds, this is a minimum uh, handover time. That says uh, 10 seconds means uh, 278 meters, or that you can better imagine uh, the length of three soccer fields. But I would say definitely no, uh, no chance at all, except uh, you are adrenaline uh, junkies and you can do it, but uh, I'm not. So, and I mentioned it beforehand. So, uh, now the higher management, not just from Mercedes, also from other car companies are, 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 are talking about uh, uh, running uh, future cars 130 kilometers per hour and uh, had over time of 30 uh, uh, seconds. This means uh, 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 that we should be safe, uh, allow a safe driving over one kilometer. Yeah, so this is really uh, a long distance. Okay, so, and uh, I very often use the argument that, well, it does not happen so much uh, at World Weather, so once a year or two times a year, that's not true. So uh, in, uh, I have uh, some statistics uh, with me, uh, rainfall and snowfall in, in the European Union is about more than 100 days a year. And you may say, well, uh, in California, we don't have this problem. It's also not true. Uh, you have uh, fog uh, in, uh, in the big countries in the U.S. Uh, for more than 100 days a year. So it's, it's really definitely that you will run into this problem. This is the thing what I want to say. Uh, thanks, Scott. Uh, the EU regulation authorities uh, uh, have uh, brought this new uh, law in, into the play, which means if you... Uh, want to run uh, a lane keeping system, which is the core of an uh, ADS, uh, then you have to consider, you have to take into account at worth as it. So, well, this is uh, pretty weak, but uh, if you think about it, uh, then the result is, uh, you'll find in my uh, introduction slide. So, you, yeah, you have to, yeah, to do all these things, so, which I mentioned beforehand. Okay, so, uh, and the solution for such a system running in in in, in under Adworth weather, uh, yeah, uh, we are developing in the AIC project. So here we are developing uh, uh, four no novel sensors uh, and uh, also an HD map, uh, which uh, is capable to run also in, in Adworth weather, especially in snow. So then you don't have uh, some uh, points uh, where you can. Uh, 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 fix the position of, uh, of the car correctly. Uh, you also have to develop uh, a novel processing unit capable uh, to work uh, with the signal, maybe to enhance the signal uh, so that we can uh, drive safely. And uh, that's also a lesson which we have learned from the predecessor uh, uh, process. You need a novel simulation, you need a good simulation of what we have because you can't get enough data from the real world. That's, you, you have no chance Okay, so, and uh, in the remaining time, now I will uh, make short deep dives uh, uh, to uh, uh, some components of the system. I don't have time to, uh, to, to go to every uh, detail. Uh, for that reason, I refer to the homepage uh, www.aic-eu.com. So at the end, I, I show it again. So, and uh, I want to do a deep dive uh, with the gated cam for uh, signal enhancement me methods uh, for fog and uh, spray, and uh, will close my talk with uh, a short presentation of a 3D object detector so that you have an imagination how it uh, could look like. Okay, let's start with the gated camera. Uh, you have already seen uh, some images uh, uh, or some results in, in uh, my previous slides. 
so one good thing of the way the camera it works also uh, in fog. Yeah, uh, as we can get uh, even in Edward Wesser images uh, uh, a relatively clear image which is usable for uh, 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 image processing uh, process. So why is it so? It's uh, pretty simple. Uh, it's because of the gating principle. And the gating principle is, uh, first of all, it's an active camera where uh, a pulse laser synchronized with a, with a gated camera. And uh, uh, the gate, which means, uh, uh, I always forget, I get this word, uh, <laughs> Which opens uh, the lens and closes the lens uh, at the uh, aperture. No? Aperture. 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 Yeah, the aperture uh, uh, is, uh, is is coupled with the, with the, with the, with pulse laser. Uh, that means uh, and uh, receives uh, only light from a certain distance interval, which we uh, uh, called uh, depth slice. And if the light comes uh, outside from the step slice, especially before the interest reach uh, here in the space uh, before the three, uh, then also disturbing signals uh, 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 caused by a reflection of uh, fog particles or whatever, uh, they are still uh, simply ignored. And that's why they, they don't overlay, they don't disturb uh, the signal which we want to use. That's, that's, that's the principle of, of the gated cam. And it works pretty well. And uh, the resulting image from the whole scene uh, we got by just uh, uh, adding all uh, these uh, sliders together and create uh, a final image. That's uh, the clear looking image or a, a handleable image. It's, it's one side of the gated cam. The other thing is that uh, from the gated cam, if we have at least three slides, overlapping slides, uh, we can compute a depth map. Uh, uh, with a resolution which clearly beats uh, 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 all current existing LiDAR systems and, uh, and uh, accuracy, uh, which is uh, enough uh, to, to, to solve uh, the problems, especially in the far distance. In the first version, which we have developed, uh, I think it was Mario is also here in, in this room. Uh, 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 we, we could uh, cover a distance range of uh, 80 meters and uh, the limitation of 80 meters was because we did uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, depths, uh, uh, I don't know what this uh, was, my, we just let it have a look. If you correct the depths, how is it called? Uh, I don't know. I have some. Oh, no, no, it was not the, the denoising uh, cells. Uh, Steffi, help me. Huh? No, uh, uh, self adapting self, uh, this, this is the depth map. Okay. It, oh, okay, so we, we, we used uh, for the. Uh, Calibration, self calibration. Oh shit, sorry about it. Uh, sometimes uh, I don't know. Uh, for the self calibration, uh, uh, for the calibration, uh, depth calibration, we used at this time uh, a LiDAR system, and the LiDAR was limited in the distance range to, to 80 meters. Uh, uh, that's why uh, uh, at, at the first shot, uh, we, we only could, could uh, work or operate in, in a distance of 80 meters. So. In the next step, so uh, which we have presented uh, at uh, the CVPR uh, last year, uh, we uh, uh, um, uh, developed a self calibration system which works only with uh, with a uh, uh, gate cam itself, and uh, that's why we could uh, extend uh, the range uh, where we can get uh, a, a good uh, depth map. And uh, for whom who is interested uh, to have a deeper look how it works, so uh, we uh, also published this at the CVPR uh, 2022. And uh, as a third step, so uh, yeah, and uh, with this result, we got a, clear, uh, a better uh, depth map uh, than compared even with, uh, with a normal uh, stereo system. So if the resolution is the same. Uh, and uh, as a next step, and this was the last step, uh, which we have uh, uh, performed uh, during the last year, uh, we extended the uh, single uh, sensor system to a stereo system. 
And uh, uh, by doing this, uh, we achieved a 50% better mean absolute uh, depth error. So why, why is this important? Uh, this is important because now we are capable also to detect uh, pretty fine structures uh, in, 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 in the long distance. Because uh, we still uh, have to get rid of uh, one problem. Uh, this, this is called the lost cargo problem. This means detect a small obstacle of a height of 15 centimeters in one of the 50 meter distance. And this uh, you have to fulfill if you really want to run a car uh, with uh, 130 kilometers per hour. So this is, this is uh, due to our regulations, uh, to the EU regulations, and this is fact. So you have to, uh, to be capable to do it. Uh, otherwise, you can't run 130 kilometers. So, and uh, with this approach, uh, this was possible. So uh, we made a significant step uh, solving uh, uh, this so-called Los Cargo problem, means uh, detecting really fine structures in, 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 uh, in a long distance. So, and uh, if you want to learn more, more about this algorithm, uh, Steffi and Mario uh, have a, a poster presentation, I think on Wednesday in the afternoon, and they can explain you in, in detail and discuss it with you how uh, this thing works. So uh, yeah, uh, a, short look, uh, a short look at, uh, at the architecture, you see that uh, uh, it works uh, with, a, with a five dimensional space uh, for, uh, as an input. This means uh, the three depth slices and also two stereo images and it uses all this uh, input uh, to, to, to create a, a really good depth estimation which beats clearly uh, all existing uh, stereo systems. So, but for more details and more discussions, uh, go to on Wednesday uh, for the presentation of uh, Steffi. And uh, now to the next point. So the management often complain, well, a uh, gated camera is good, but it is expensive and how to save money. This is always in the interest of the car producers. Uh, uh, you can save money by using still the, the, the old sensors, the standard sensors but at least you have to improve it. And how? We have developed several methods. The first one is from Mario. Uh, two years ago, he presented it also here at CVPR, and he uh, developed a uh, classifier uh, which uh, performs a defog defogification uh, of, uh, of such an image. And uh, to train this classifier, of course, uh, the standard method is, is still to, to use uh, a clear image and uh, a pair of a clear image and, and, and a web weather image, in this case, a fortified image, and learning the, the uh, 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 transformation uh, rule uh, from uh, clear to uh, adverse and vice versa, and uh, applying at the end uh, the inverse function. This uh, works pretty well. Uh, sorry, it's saying it works uh, pretty well, uh, we, uh, but we don't want to uh, show the driver, of course, a clear image. Uh, our, this is just uh, to show ourselves uh, that, that it is working, that we have an intermediate result. And uh, at the end, uh, uh, if you uh, want to install a 3D uh, perception tool, then, then, then everything is optimized along the uh, 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 whole processing chain. So, uh, but it shows uh, that it is work, uh, working and you can apply or, or develop or apply a similar approach for LIDAR and it's also working. So, and it, it improves your detection rate at least by 15%, for example. So uh, other things you can do, uh, yeah, for example, with a LIDAR system. So it's, it's, it's underestimated. LIDAR performs uh, bad in adverse weather, but uh, uh, especially in, in rain and, and snow, we have an additional problem, and this is spray. Uh, this is really a great problem. So, and uh, many people underestimate it. Uh, and spray occurs uh, as long as the road is wet. This means after raining, it's, the road is still wet, and you still have spray. So, and it's really uh, disturbing the detection process of LIDAR. Uh, first of all, uh, it decreases significantly the detection rate. Uh, second, uh, you have a lot of false alarms. And third, uh, the positioning uh, also uh, degrades significantly. This, this means if you want to perform uh, an overtaken maneuver based on, on this data, this is uh, yeah, uh, not the easiest thing to do. Okay, and uh, what we have done, uh, especially Dominic, he's sitting here, 
is uh, uh, that uh, he, together with uh, uh, some uh, colleagues from uh, the University of Darmstadt, uh, developed a spray simulator and uh, applied this spray simulator to uh, normal images, uh, backside of a car uh, sequence, and uh, generated a so called uh, augmented uh, data set uh, which simulates the uh, uh, spray scenes. And then he trains. Uh, uh, network uh, with the spray scenes and applied it uh, to uh, normal, uh, real uh, spray uh, scenes. As a result is that uh, we could improve uh, by this approach as a detection rate by at least 17%, uh, uh, which is uh, uh, signif significantly. So also, if you want to learn uh, or to read more about it, uh, I refer uh, uh, this week's uh, paper. I think it's now published, Dominic Gore. Yeah, it's, yeah it, it's handed in at least, so uh, normally it should be published. Okay, and yeah, just a short look at uh, of, of the results. So uh, also you with uh, uh, classifier train with augmentation uh, behave significantly better uh, than without augmentation. Okay, uh, yeah, and uh, uh, you can do Another thing, though, uh, normally we have learned that uh, the, the uh, LiDAR uh, companies uh, doing the optimization of, of, of the LiDAR system by hand, this means a handcraft system. So, and uh, uh, with separated processes, I think so. And that's why normally a uh, 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 LiDAR system uh, from, from uh, uh, from the shelf uh, don't work per perfect uh, in, in this uh, in an environment. So you can improve this significantly by doing point-to-point uh, -point optimization. So we have also some lessons here on, on, on Sunday I have seen. And uh, by applying this, uh, you can uh, uh, improve uh, the uh, AP rate at least uh, uh, by about 40%. That's, that's really good. And uh, if we want to learn more about it, it's also a presentation on the this year uh, CVPR, I think on Wednesday, Wednesday in the afternoon, there's also a poster and uh, you can ask uh, uh, Dominic and uh, Mario uh, and can uh, discuss the solution. The solution is uh, currently applied only for uh, normal weather data. The next step will be uh, that we apply it uh, for adverse weather data. And we also hope that we can significantly improve the performance of, uh, of a LiDAR system. So these are uh, so the normal steps we can do. And uh, we have also developed uh, uh, really using uh, uh, a new approach to, to, to PFOC uh, images. And this is uh, by a physical based inverse uh, neural rendering uh, uh, to remove the fog. And, and, and it, it sounds pretty simple. You, you take a RGB uh, sequence and uh, with the out, uh, you feed a, a herf net, uh, neural radiance fields. I think it's well known here. And uh, uh, you feed it in a way that uh, this system is capable uh, to rebuild uh, the scene, so to, to, to learn the, the most important terms uh, of, uh, of, of such an image, which is uh, air light, clear scene, uh, air light, fog density, pixel wise depths, uh, and albedo, and, 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 and so forth. And uh, by, by reproducing this image, you just uh, 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 delete uh, the, the, uh, in the reconstruction the, the scatters, this means uh, the, the, the fog. And you got a uh, dehistic uh, reconstruction. Uh, the mass uh, uh, mathematics is uh, pretty complicated. Uh, uh, I just want to uh, give you a, a short look at it. Uh, and uh, but uh, and, and they want uh, to not do a deep dive in it. I refer to the paper Scatter Earth, uh, which is also. Uh, which will also be published soon. At, uh, I think it's, it's submitted to the ICCV 2023, uh, and uh, it will, uh, my opinion, definitely will be accepted. Okay, uh, to abbreviate it, just some uh, short look at uh, uh, some results. Uh, if you com uh, compare uh, the scatter nerve uh, result, uh, uh, the defogification with the serial scatter, 
it's it's uh, even slightly better. Uh, and uh, till now, till this uh, uh, the zero scatter was our benchmark approach. Uh, but you can use uh, this uh, approach for other things. You can analyze uh, scenes, and you can use it to create uh, artificial scenes. Uh, just by uh, uh, during the reconstruction, you just have to vary the, the fog density in this approach. And uh, uh, for example, you, you can run it over existing uh, RGB system, uh, uh, sequence, uh, can that determine uh, the, the fog uh, in, in the sequence and uh, can uh, play around uh, the fog density, for example. The disadvantage of this approach is uh, really costly in, in, in terms of uh, computational effort. So that's why we want to in, improve this uh, uh, in, in, in the next year. This means to reduce uh, the fog. Okay, so uh, last but not least, I don't know how much time I still have. And perhaps a couple of minutes. Ah, um, yeah, I'm to also to ask okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, because I have to, no time here. Uh, so uh, I will close my, 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 my talk with uh, a short look at uh, uh, a 3D detector, and this 3D detector was also presented two years ago by Mario here at the ICC, uh, uh, no, at the ICCB, sorry about it. And uh, it gives you just uh, a feeling how, how good it works. So uh, uh, pedestrians which you can't detect, uh, uh, um, that's for true, but with normal RGB camera are detected by this approach. So, and we, uh, are improving this approach uh, with uh, every new uh, method which we have. And uh, yeah, we, are, we are quite sure that we uh, could solve with this approach uh, the lost cargo problem uh, with the later cam. So that now I am at the end of my rapid journey through, uh, through our development, sorry about uh, for this uh, a lot of information. But I think uh, if, if you want to, if you are interested in some uh, of these uh, approaches, uh, just read the paper or, uh, uh, and discuss it uh, with uh, uh, all these guys. Mario is here, uh, Dominic is here, and Steffi is here. So and now I'm at the end of my talk and I open for questions. Thank you very much, Werner. Um... I think I want, really want to ask you a question before we, we also get a couple of questions from the audience. So yeah. uh, I really want to hear your opinion on whether you think that adverse weather is indeed the main obstacle that is standing currently in front of the wide deployment of autonomous cars. And if yes, is sensor fusion from multiple different sensors with their own pros and cons the approach that we should follow as a community in the industry, in the, in the academia to solve uh, the autonomous car problem? I definitely will say this will cause a problem which we have to solve. So currently uh, the OEMs run uh, avoiding strategies. This means that they, if they uh, got the smallest hint of it with weather, they don't go on the road. It means, for example, uh, if the temperature is below five degrees, if there is uh, some wetness uh, on the road and so on. But uh, the result is that the availability really shrinks down to, I don't, uh, I'm not allowed to estimate it, but it, sh it shrinks down. You, you, uh, I personally would, would buy such a system. That's, 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 that's uh, the one bite. So the avoiding strat strategy will not work. And if a car company says, uh, well, I want to drive uh, all the in Edwards weather with a bit rain, with a bit fog, and so on. Uh, then you have to solve this problem because uh, with a bit of, uh, I don't know the word, uh, if, if, you, if you get a child, how is it as uh, English word? Oh, the pregnancy. Or... Uh, with a bit of pregnancy, <laughs> that's, that's not possible. You're pregnant or not, that's a problem. And the same is true if you, if you, if, if, if you uh, try to, to, to drive your system. Uh, uh, with a uh, with a small amount of adverse weather, but uh, if you st uh, start to do it, uh, then, then you have to consider weather. Then you need uh, this tool. And uh, now coming back, there are solutions uh, for this problem, but uh, the solutions cost a lot of money. So 
and 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 and, and that's a balancing which uh, which a car company currently has to fulfill. So, uh, how much we want to go, uh, what we would allow, uh, should it be rather a, a level two plus 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 system, or uh, should we really trust and go to this level three system? It's a it's a balancing, and uh, it we will see it in in the near future. So. I, I hope we will not see uh, 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 really bad accidents. Uh, it could happen uh, because fog walls happen. And if you run 130 in a, in a, in a fog belt, then definitely uh, it's, it's a really uh, a worst case if you have no uh, algorithm which can uh, check, oh, is there a weather uh, or not? And then, then you're, yeah, you're lost. So first of all, you have to develop uh, some techniques uh, to uh, estimate the degree of adverse weather. But uh, most uh, most of the developers are blank. So there's, there's no idea. Only really simple ideas which will not work. I don't want to discuss it deeper. Yeah, and it is as it is. If you if if, if you want to run a system. Uh, Although with uh, with a slider with weather, you, you you open the box. So that's it, and you can solve it if you have enough money, or if you're willing to pay for it. So that's it. Sorry. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, um, any questions from the audience for Werner? If not, ah, you, you were already. <laughs> okay. It, it was a yeah. <laughs> Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, I was wondering if you're training a neural network to remove the fog from those kinds of images, do you ever run into sort of hallucinations um, when you use that in the real world? Uh, I didn't get it. Uh, Mario, did you get it? Yeah. Oh, okay. So you're trying to re remove the fog from the real world image? Yes. So hallucinations you can have in the future. But it's kind of the good thing about doing such kind of signal enhancement methods, let's say for autonomous driving, is you have the knowledge about the change in the signal. That means in order to know where the stuff was impacted, you also get some kind of uncertainty measure. So if it changes that much that you additionally have a car or a car disappears, you also know that a lot has changed. So knowing in detail knowledge about signal enhancement gives you not only a clear signal, but gives you also a better idea of what the premium weather is the most the image. So yes, it might happen. We, did, we didn't observe it, um, but still we have to fall back onto the normal channel. Okay. Thank you. You can do it better than I do. I, uh, I, I didn't get the, 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 the question. I understand it completely, but yeah. Okay. Um, like perhaps one last because we need, yeah, go ahead. Thank you so much for the presentation. Uh, I just wanted to ask if you had any thoughts on maybe using uh, like raw images or if raw images like pre ISP uh, images for camera only systems have any role in helping. Uh, yeah, we use always raw images, uh, only raw pre -ISP. yeah, 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 of course. Okay. So, because you lose a lot of information if you, if you, uh, yeah, um. Processes images somehow, so it's always wrong. Okay, okay great. Let's thank Varna again. Um, thank you.
Uh, hello, is my audio working properly? Okay. Uh, so he hello everyone. Uh, now I'm, com uh, I'm going to share my uh, winning solution for the ACDC challenge track one, uh, which is the domain adaptive segmentation. Uh, uh, my presentation will be divided into five parts, the challenge overview, the baseline, uh, the method, the results, and the summarization. So let's first look at uh, the track one. It is the normal to adverse domain adaptation of semantic segmentation on the cityscape to the SADC. The unsupervised domain ad adaptation method aims to transfer the domain invariant knowledge learned from the labeled source domain to the unlabeled target domain. In this challenge, uh, the model is trained on the training set of the cityscapes with about uh, 3,000 images, including their annotations, as well as the training set of the AZDC dataset with about 16,000, uh, uh, 1.6 thousand images, but without annotations. And the final model is evaluated on the test set of the AZDC dataset. Uh, most of the images in the uh, cityscapes are in the clear conditions, and the images in the ACDC uh, are in the varying, varying adverse weather conditions. Uh, so for this, uh, for our solution, we used the baseline uh, masked image consistency as uh, as the baseline. Uh, uh, it it uh, it is a module that is built upon the HRDA, which is a multi resolution approach for the UDA problem that combines the advantages of high res images crops and the low resolution image crops by uh, by the attention based uh, reweighting uh, and the uh, mask image consistency is a module that utilizes mask images to facilitate the learning of uh, context relationship between the Target, uh, within the target domain. The model is trained to utilize context clues by enforcing context consistency of predictions between partially masked images and the original images. And for our method, the overview of our method, we, we use uh, three techniques, which is the, uh, uh, we adopted the FAN fully attentional network as a robust backbone and we use the knowledge distillation and a model soup uh, to improve the performance. And we, and for the, the F, 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 FAM backbone, in the previous UDM method like the HRDA, a mixed transformers is used as an image encoder. It has shown that robustness is an important property in order to achieve good domain ad adaptation performance because it fostered the learning of domain invariant features. In the ACDC challenge, the domain gap between the target and the source domain is huge. And since we are dealing with different other adverse conditions, there are uh, even gaps within the target domain. So the robustness of the model is even more important. We have tested different choice of encoders and finally landed on the fully attentional networks. Uh, the fully attentional networks uh, leverages uh, self-attention mechanisms to enhance the robustness and the performance of the vision transformers. As we can see here, it performs the, uh, both the token self-attention and the channel-wise self-attention to improve the model's uh, robustness. Uh, uh, here we mainly focused on the comparison between the uh, FAM model and the MIT models. From the figure and uh, figure and the table, we can see that the FAM model demonstrates 
uh, stronger model robustness against the, the various image corruptions uh, in the segment uh, semantic segmentation uh, task. So we took uh, so we took the uh, fan large hybrid model as the encoder of our method and uh, which is similar in the parameter size compared to the almighty B5 model that uh, is used in both the DA former and HRDA method. And we initialize it with the weight pre-chain on the image net 22K. And here are the results that we, uh, by simply replacing the backbone of the uh, method proposed in the RMIC, uh, here, here we can see there is improvement of about 0.8% in MIOU, and the results is tested uh, is reported on the on the validation set. Uh, also, we applied knowledge knowledge distillation for the self training process. In typical self training method, the teacher and the student model share the same network architecture, and we can update the teacher model with the weight of the student model in the exponential moving average way. Uh, but this is also a limited the architecture of both the, of the uh, teacher model. Uh, since we have already, uh, we already have several uh, trained domain adaptive models that can already uh, perform, uh, have, or have already have Decent performance on the uh, on our challenge on our task, we can use these models as teacher teacher models for generating reliable procedure labels. Here uh, we use the uh, uh, the MIT uh, B5 uh, model that is provided in the MIC uh, and the, the checkpoint provided in the MIC page uh, GitHub page, and we use it to. to uh, uh in, initialize the teacher model and use it to generate uh, the pursuit label and use the pursuit label uh, to calculate it, the uh, the segmentation loss on the target domain and use the use the segmentation loss uh, to update the student model uh, through the uh, back propagation. And, and th this way, the knowledge uh, can be transferred from the teacher model to the student model by the uh, knowledge distillation in the output space. Also, uh, we used another technique uh, in this method, the model soup. The model soup can produce a better model by averaging the weight of a trained model without additional computa computational cost during the inference stage. It is uh, different from the ensemble uh, process that combine uh, that also combines the, the, re the results of different models. The model soup uh, did not introduce any uh, additional uh, computational cost in the inference stage because it simply added uh, added uh, in simply simp simply. Uh, calculated the average uh, weights of the model recipe. Here we selected the checkpoint at the 24K, the 32K, and the 40K iterations as the um, self uh, soup recipes and used the weighted average model to generate it, to, to generate the final prediction. Uh, here, uh, uh, so let's talk about the results. As we can see in the tables, we get constant improvements in the adaptation results by impl implementing the technique that we mentioned above. Uh, by applying the multi-teacher multi knowledge distillation on the baseline, we can see, uh, we can achieve an uh, improved MIOU by the 0.2%. And in the meanwhile, if we use the BAM uh, initialized model as the student model, we can reach the 70.2, 70.0% uh, uh, MRU on the test set, which is a decent leap uh, in this track. 
Also, if we apply the model sweep technique, we can still squeeze a little bit of improvements out of the fine-tuned model. Uh, so let to summarize, we achieved the competitive domain adaptation performance in adverse conditions by applying the FAN models as the image encoder for robust representation learning. And we further boosted the performance of our model by adopting the knowledge distillation and the model soup. Uh, this is the work I mentioned earlier and I thank, thanks to their, uh, their wonderful uh, contribution. Uh, thanks to their wonderful works and sharing their, sharing their uh, code. Uh, so thanks for attention. And uh, I have uploaded the uh, solutions uh, on my GitHub page. And you can check it if you are interested. Thanks a lot, Chang uh, yeah. uh, Are there any questions uh, on Chang Seng's presentation from the audience? Uh, well, I can ask perhaps a question. So um, you mainly um, uh, considered the different uh, uh, backbones uh, for the domain adaptation and also how to if efficiently and effectively uh, ensemble or let's say uh, combine the results of different models. So do you think that uh, this is like perhaps even more critical than actually um, changing or improving the, the domain adaptation technique itself or is it equally important in your opinion? What is, what is the relative importance of like a good backbone, for example, even for the task of domain adaptation. Uh, yeah, uh, actually, I have used the, the uh, backbone uh, in an other domain adaptation tasks like the GTA 5 to the Cityscape, but uh, I did not see uh, the similar improvements in that uh, benchmark. Uh, so I believe this. Uh, this backbone is particularly effective in the in this uh, area in this pack because uh, I think the uh, the things the, the weather conditions uh, are varying in the in this in this task and, and so I think the a more robust uh, backbone can help in this regard. Uh, so this is what I uh, see from the experiment results. Great, thank you very much. Uh, any question uh, to Chang Sheng? All right, if not, uh, let's thank uh, the winners again. Congrats, congrats for your uh, winning submission. Uh, I will send you the winner certificate uh, uh, later today or tomorrow. Um, so. Uh, we can move on uh, with uh, the next uh, presentation. Let me see. Okay. So the next uh, speaker. Uh, hello. Hello. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, you can also try to uh, activate your your video for for the audience here to to see you. Okay. If possible, mm. uh, we can see your screen. We can see your screen, but we cannot see your uh, your video. Uh, it's okay. Yes. 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 Great. All right, so uh, thanks. Uh, you, you are Wang Wang, right? Because uh, uh, there are this uh, Wang Wang uh, Yang and Jin Ming Su, and uh, I was not sure who is going to present the, the first uh, uh, the first winning submission. The, I'm the presenter, right? Uh, you're, you're Wang Wang, right? Yes. Oh, okay, great. All right. Uh, let's begin. So, thanks a lot, Wang Wang, for joining and for uh, for presenting your method. So we uh, 
the stage is yours. You can start with uh, your presentation. Uh, can you see my slides? Yes. Uh, however, they are not at full screen right now. Uh, okay, now it's fine. Uh, okay. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Yang Wang Wang, an engineering of Meituan Vision AI department in China. It's my great pleasure to be here to share our winner solution in ACDC challenge this year. Our team members have uh, Yang Wang Wang, Su Jingming, Luo Junfeng, and Wei Xiaoling. Um, firstly, I will introduce our solution in supervised semantic segmentation in adverse conditions. This part of the topic is boosting semantic segmentation in adverse conditions with transformer-based segmenter and simple procedural labeling. Um, firstly, I will give a brief introduction of the ACDC dataset used in the computation. For the semantic segmentation track, the ACDC dataset consists of 4,064 images including 1,600 for training, 464 validation, and 2,000 for testing. There are 19 semantic categories in the ACDC dataset, which are consistent with those in the Cityscapes dataset. However, the images in the ACDC face more adverse conditions, such as fog, night, rain, and snow. Um, um, according to the information on the paper with code websites, the state of the art method on various public uh, semantic segmentation benchmarks until 2026 and 23 share the following features. Um, first, most state-of-the-art methods adopt transformer-based model architectures, and their model size significantly increased. Besides, large-scale pre-training is crucial for achieving high performance in semantic segmentation tasks. More data and more modi um, modalities are used for pre-training segmentation models. This trends suggest that uh, the field of uh, segmentation is mo moving towards more complex and uh, data-intensive methods with a focus on leveraging large amount of print training data to improve model performance. Uh, the recent popular work uh, segment uh, anything model known as SAM is also a experience, experience of uh, this uh, trends. Uh, based, uh, based on the above observations, in terms of model architecture, we chose advanced transformer-based semantic segmentation method in the backbone network. We use the VIT adapter, and in the segmentation head part, we use the mask performer head. Um, uh, VIT adapter is a transformer-based model that uh, improves model performance by fine-tuned pre-trained models with adapters. In VIT adapter, a special primer modeler and the two feature interaction operations are designed to inject the image prior without, uh, without redesigning the architecture of VIT. They can supplement uh, the missing local information and uh, reorganize the fine gained uh, multi-scale features for the dense prediction task, such as uh, semantic uh, segmentation. Uh, in the segmentation head network, uh, we went with the mask former, which is a new way of semantic uh, segmentation using transformers. It's uh, different from the traditional pixel-wise pixel classification approach, as uh, it, it defines the task as a mask classification task. Mm. Next, uh, uh, we will in introduce our model training strategy. strategy. We use a simple but uh, effective procedural labeling training. 
especially we first uh, train the model with the real labeled data. Then uh, we use the trained model to predict labels for the unlabeled reference uh, Im images in the ACDC dataset under normal condition. Uh, we didn't uh, use a carefully designed confidence threat threshold to process the model's uh, prediction results, uh, but uh, directly use the predict results as the procedural labels for later use. Uh, finally, we mixed the, the reference image data with the procedural labels and the data set with the real label together and retrained the segmentation model. Uh, to better use the multi-scale features and uh, improve the prediction performance of the segmentation model, we also adopt uh, commonly used test time augmentations. Uh, we use the sliding window testing, multi-scale testing, and the horizontal flip testing. Uh, some, uh, some parameters uh, are listed this. Uh, here are some of uh, our experimental results. Uh, as uh, can be seen, using more urban scene data and the procedural label training both can further improve the pro performance of the model. Uh, and the test time augmentation can always be e effective, um, both in um, value set and the test set. Um, okay, let's uh, me summary our solution. Uh, firstly, we adopt uh, advanced uh, transformer based uh, segmenter to solve the semantic uh, segmentation task in adverse uh, conditions. Uh, secondly, we use a simple procedural label training strategy, um, strategy to further improve the performance of the segmenter in advanced uh, conditions. And finally, we achieve state-of-the-art performance with 18.4.01% MIOU on the ACDC test site. Mm. Uh, that's all, thanks. Next uh, is the question and answer ses uh, session. Uh, I had a question. Uh, so you said that you kind of like generated pseudo labels for uh, the test set uh, to boost the performance. Uh, there are like certain benchmarks for which like you don't have access to the test set. Uh, what would be your approach or suggestion to handle such competitions? Uh, you you mean uh, test set uh, reference images uh, can be used in the competitions? Yeah, uh, suppose like if you didn't have access to the test set, if, they, if they, those were kind of like hidden on the server and like you only had to submit your uh, method or something. Uh, uh, test set the reference uh, image are uh, public uh, for us uh, in completion. Yeah. Uh, uh, we only use uh, its uh, images, uh, not a uh, uh, ground truth. Uh, but let's say like you you had a different competition where like the test set weren't available. Uh, do you have like any suggestions that uh, other other people can use in such competitions? Uh, uh, sorry, um, pardon. Um, so, so, like, if there is a different competition uh, for domain adaptation uh, where we didn't have access to the test set uh, publicly, uh, would you recommend uh, something, some other uh, way of modifying uh, this strategy? Um, uh, sorry, my my English is not well. Uh, you can uh, 
uh, you can just uh, you can send the, the detailed uh, to my email later. Okay. Uh, I will review uh, reply you soon. All right. Thank you. Perhaps yeah. you could also use the Zoom chat uh, if you would, uh, uh, Harish, if you would like to write your question and then uh, you have more time uh, so that one one can answer. Okay. Uh, uh, yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, all right. So I guess uh, in the interest of time, we will have to move on uh, to the next winner presentation by the same team, but uh, is it, is it uh, Jin Ming that's going to give the second presentation? Um, I be have, uh, I'm a half of Jin Ming. The second presentation is also me. Ah, okay, okay, great. Present. All right, uh, cool. Uh, wait a minute, I exchange the slides. Um, okay, then let's move forward. Um, in the following sections, uh, I will introduce our solution for the supervised panoptic segmentation in adverse conditions. Uh, on behalf of my teammate Su Jingming, uh, this part's topic is enhancing adverse panoptic, panoptic segmentation through multitask learning. Uh, the task of uh, panoptic uh, segmentation in ACDC dataset uh, and cityscapes dataset uh, have the same categories de definition, um, both of which have uh, which are 19 categories and uh, have the same split of uh, stuff and uh, thing, um, both of which are 11 stuff classes and uh, 8 thing classes. Uh, there are some challenges in panoptic segmentation in adverse conditions. Uh, uh, ch challenge one is there are many similar instance objects in the scene, such as people, car, and so on, uh, which makes it difficult for instance objects to, to be easily distinguished and divided into different instances. Uh, leading to the different uh, object being wrongly matched as the same one. Mm, the second challenge is uh, staff classes often occupy the, a large area uh, with very different uh, appearance, uh, such as uh, a case, uh, a road partly, uh, partially covered by snow. It's uh, difficult to maintain consistency in a large area resulting a uh, lot of noise. Um, to deal with the challenges of uh, panoptic segmentation, we, prop uh, we propose a panoptic segmentation solution. Uh, in the solution, we introduce one former as the baseline of our um, panoptic segmentation uh, with the uh, addition task of uh, Semantic segmentation and instance segmentation for joint training um, to improve the model performance and the convergence speed. Um, then we use the VIT adapter, uh, the same as the uh, last track, uh, to further improve the performance of staff classes. Uh, Details of process solution are described as follows. Uh, in one former, uh, a multi scale feature are extracted for an input image using a backbone, followed by a pixel decoder. A unified set of n minus one task conditioned object queries are formulated with guidance from the task token. Uh, Q task and the flattened, flattened uh, one for scale feature inside the transformer. Uh, next, uh, Q task is uh, concat with uh, n minus one query from the transformer. Uh, we uniformly sample the task during training and uh, generate the corresponding text queries Q test using a text mapper. A query text uh, contrastive loss is calculated to learn the inter-task distinctions. Uh, 
and the text mapper can be dropped during inference, thus making the model parameter efficient. Uh, a a multi-stage L layer transformer decoder is used to obtain the task semantic classes and the mask predictions. And based on one former, we train it on ACDC dataset with the tasks of panamic, panam, uh, panel fatigue segmentation, semantic segmentation, and the instance segmentation. Mm. Uh, is, uh, in this way, different tasks attract and uh, repel each other, establish the better inter-task and uh, inter-class distinctions, ensure better distinction between instances and uh, semantics, and uh, between instances of uh, same classes with uh, similar appearance. Uh, in order to ensure the uh, consistency of staff targets, which usually occupies a lot of area with different appearance. We also introduce VIT adapter trained on the task of supervised semantic segmentation. Uh, we integrate the result of the panomic segmentation and the semantic segmentation to obtain the final prediction result. Uh, we tried the two example manners. Uh, one is to Supplement uh, the semantic segmentation results of one former with the semantic segmentation results of VIT adapter, uh, while the other way is to replace uh, the semantic segmentation results of one, one former with those of VIT adapter. Uh, the performance of the two manners is close, but the later one performs better. Mm. And finally, we obtained the best performance with 67.51% uh, uh, PQ for the task of uh, panoptic segmentation in adverse conditions. Uh, from the leaderboard, it can be seen that uh, our solution is obviously super, uh, superior to the second place uh, with a uh, 1.4% uh, PQ improvement. Mm, the following are some of our ablation studies results and the uh, visual results. Uh, this is the different backbones results. Uh, this is the uh, different ensemble manners uh, results and some uh, visual results. Uh, uh, from the image, we can see that the proposed, uh, pro uh, that uh, our proposed solution can currently segment stuff and uh, seeing objects uh, in adverse conditions, uh, such as uh, fog, uh, rain, snow, and uh, night. Finally, let me conclusion our solution. Uh, first, uh, we introduced the transformer model one-former with multitask learning, uh, such as uh, um, panoptic, uh, panoptic segmentation, segment, uh, semantic segmentation, and uh, instance segmentation to improve the accuracy of these classes. We introduce uh, semantic segmentation method VIT adapter to further improve the performance of staff classes. Uh, finally, the pro Proposed solution achieves saved art performance with 16.751% PQ on the ACDC test data finally. Mm, that's all, thanks. Uh, this is the question and answer sessions. Thanks a lot, Wang Wang, and congrats again for uh, winning this uh, track uh, for panoptic segmentation. Uh, are there any questions uh, to Wang Wang? Uh, if not, perhaps uh, I can ask a question. So uh, do you think that 
uh, multitask learning is necessary for panoptic segmentation because ideally we would like to have uh, like a single a single architecture since panoptic segmentation is a pretty well defined task and of course there are many many approaches that try to learn it as a combination of instance uh, segmentation and semantic segmentation but and here you also take a similar approach with like having supervision for different tasks but uh, there are also unified architectures, right, uh, that try to, to learn it together. So what is your view? Because from my perspective, it's more like elegant to have a single task architecture. Um, and in some situation, I think uh, uh, in the future, when there are lots of labeled data or unlabeled data, uh, a universe uh, architecture segment uh, segmentation uh, is uh, ha uh, have more plen uh, potential uh, in the future. But uh, uh, now, uh, when data set uh, is limited, uh, maybe one uh, single architecture uh, segmentation architecture can get a higher uh, performance in benchmark. Oh, uh, I had a question I actually posted in the chat. Uh, so given that like this is a task for adverse weather, uh, did you try to uh, use any methods like image enhancement, uh, either like as a pre-processing step or within the uh, training process uh, to, to kind of improve the quality of images uh, no i didn't use some we didn't use some enhancement uh, method uh, i think uh, um uh, why model have enough uh, generative generation uh, it can cover all cases <laughs> um, uh, when we use more uh, normal conditions uh, data, uh, the condition, adverse condition data, data uh, is also have a, a better performance. Uh, maybe yeah. use some enhancement uh, pro, uh, method uh, to produce more uh, uh, adverse condition images uh, can uh, help us, but uh, we didn't uh, do that. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, and also comment uh, from my side regarding like, training semantic perception models for adverse conditions. It's uh, of course trying to do enhancement like uh, low light enhancement for nighttime images or dehazing for foggy images. It's a quite frequent step, but there are also ma many approaches for high-level tasks like detection, segmentation that uh, directly consume the, the input images without having any explicit enhancement. So I think this is pretty legit as an approach. Okay. Uh, any other questions for this talk? Uh, if not, let's thank uh, the speaker once again. And uh, now we'll have a coffee break and we, we will resume at 3.30 with uh, the final three invited speakers uh, who are uh, Patrick Perez from Valerie AI, Felix Heide from Princeton and Adam Kortulewski from Max Planck Institute. So hopefully see you uh, in uh, 35 minutes from now. Thanks. Mm -hmm.
just from the field. So we have HDMI cable that you can connect for your big Okay. You can also hide the, this like a video panel so that uh, so when, if you press more with the the dots there, yes, and then hide video panel. Yes, exactly. Okay. And we can also hide these controls if you like. So, uh, or hide floating. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Is it touch screen? <laughs> Actually, it's easy. To... I don't use yeah. it, but sometimes I do. <laughs> so, 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 it's fine. Okay. I can see. Uh, and now, to... yeah. so, so you just the microphone like this. And it's from the other side. Yes, we will put the thing in the air to record it. Yeah. Yes, I think it's pretty much. Yeah. Okay, but you can speak to our screen. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Hello. Hello. Nice to meet you. You too, Patrick. So the next thing is the Turk. I think it's Turk number one, who is in Germany. Uh, no, no, he, uh, he's uh, currently in Switzerland. Okay. He has recently joined Huawei Zurich. Yes, I know. Which, uh, uh, but I, I wasn't sure whether he had already relocated. I, I knew that it was. Uh, yeah. oh, no, I think he, uh, he's in Zurich. Yeah, yes. he's in Zurich. Yes. But, uh, yeah. So many people, actually. This is you. Uh, Yes, yes, exactly. It was fine. Uh, we had like uh, quite a lot of people. Well, I think the room was a good fit. Uh, we needed most of the space. Mm -hmm. Well, this morning there was a very Daniel, Daniel, yes, So, yeah, yeah, for the. Thank you very much. Okay. Thanks for So you have me. Yeah, yeah. I'm uh, uh, It's the 30 minutes in total, right? I want to Just checking the
the part of the right hand. We have uh, the uh, team members, we have the 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 team
Okay, but still, yeah, so the So, welcome back to the workshop on Vision for All Season. Um, I'm happy to welcome Kathy Parrott as the next speaker. She's a vice president of AI at Valeo and the scientific director of Valeo AI. The AI research lab focused on the way autonomous motor applications, in particular, self driving cars. Before joining Valeo, he was a researcher at Technicola, Emilia, and Microsoft Research Cambridge. His research interests include multimodal scene understanding and computational imaging. Which is all yours. Um, so I'd like to um, to discuss with you guys about uh, uh, perception for autonomous and assisted driving. And before that, I'd like to take the opportunity for a quick uh, historical note. Um, I think it's, um, it's interesting to to realize that autonomous driving has been around for quite a while now, and it's not very well known this, 
30 years ago, from the mid 80s to the mid 90s, there was a big uh, collaborative project in Europe called uh, Prometheus uh, doing autonomous driving. So, uh, guess what? With cameras, lidars, neural networks, they even equipped a van which, that you see here and also a sedan car. And they have actual cameras on the open road, on the highway, uh, driving autonomously, keeping lane, changing lane, detecting, detecting cars. So with the uh, hardware and the neural networks at the time, I think it's, it's pretty awesome. I have put the link to the complete video if you want to check out on, on YouTube. It's kind of interesting. And of course, 10 years later, there was you know, other challenges, the one on the outdoors and the other one on the, for, for the, the wide and the Second one in 2007 for more uh, city-like environments, which were really uh, key for the development of the next phase of the autonomous driving uh, technology. And uh, then there was the Google car starting uh, and the rest is history. So in a sense, uh, one can say that um, autonomous cars are already, already almost in, in cities. At least there are uh, a few um, actual services in the US with Cruise and, and Waymo, but also in China with Baidu. So it, it has become a, a reality and a service. But I think the, the robot taxis at least, they are sort of the tip of the iceberg. And they are, there is a lot more to, to say about these, uh, the applications and the, uh, the type of autonomous vehicles that uh, we will uh, encounter and we are already encountering. Uh, so for instance, there is the dealer the business of uh, last mile delivery with this little drawing, uh, draw it, sorry, uh, that you can see here. Um, uh, this is one application uh, for low speed uh, and uh, small distance uh, autonomous driving. So also you have the shuttle, so they go, you see they, uh, they move people around from A to B and B to A. It's uh, usually, so, so it's a fixed route, not very uh, high speed, and, but it's a very, it's a, it's a business on its own. And then you have way bigger, uh, Vehicles like uh, trucks. We saw uh, that, for instance, yesterday in the uh, in the way AD uh, workshop, and also things that you don't see on the road, like for the mining industry and the agriculture. These uh, these things are completely autonomous. So th there is a lot, but all these things are not uh, the passenger cars. So what about the uh, the passenger cars? Okay. Well, um, I'm not going to dive into this this table, but this is the, um, the, the sort of the level of driving automation. Um, Classification, which is uh, which is usually referred to when talking about the levels of, of, of passenger car automation. So on the left, level two up to level two, two plus, it's essentially driving assistance, and on the right, it's, it becomes to be uh, driving uh, automated driving uh, from conditional automation all the way to uh, autonomy. And when it comes to cars that you can buy, uh, there is already quite a, a few. Uh, high-end cars with extremely um, strong uh, automation, be it for uh, parking all the way to driving on highways. So you see some of the usual suspects in this slide. Uh, but when it comes to um, to, to uh, level three and beyond, there is not much uh, to be honest. But it turns out there are only two models so far in the world which have been um, certified and authorized on the road. So one is uh, the Honda Legend in, in Japan. The other one is the Mercedes uh, Class S in Europe and now in, in several American states. So they allow you to really take your uh, hands off and your eyes off the road on highway up to a certain speed. So it's essentially traffic jam chauffeur. So these are the first systems that are really level three. Level three. And, uh, and among the different things they have in the, the sensors, there, there is uh, the LiDAR, which comes from value. Um, okay, so uh, today, as I said, uh, we focus on, on perception. So just to illustrate the different, the, the typical types of perception that uh, one has to uh, to equip the car with, uh, it can be, of course, the vision-based perception into the, in this example, you see the detection uh, of pedestrians with the pros as well, and, and some degree of analysis of whether they are, uh, they are going to, to pause the street or not, so their intention, their intent, and also their attention or whether they are using mobile, mobile phone in this kind of sense. So this is the typical 2D uh, kind of analysis that the computer vision people like to, to do. Uh, you might want to do that as well in 3D. And this is uh, one uh, example from the way more open data. So you see now the object, this is the ground truth. You see across different cameras, the, the, the objects being annotated in 3D, pedestrians, uh, 
vehicles, etc. Uh, staying with the 3D perception, uh, if you have a LiDAR on board, you might as well uh, do the same tasks uh, in, in the in the point cloud. And here you see both views with the LiDAR and the camera in the new thing data, data set. Uh, and things are evolving, and now you have this uh, this new uh, task uh, which has emerged quite recently, and there is even a CPR workshop on that, which is called 3D occupancy. Uh, and here the task uh, from cameras in particular, but from, from, from LiDAR, is to predict uh, at the voxel level around the car uh, whether the voxel is occupied or not, and what is the semantic uh, task of this voxel. And uh, another top view uh, now, uh, kind of a perception task, which has also uh, uh, which is now blooming uh, in the community. There are many, many papers on this, which is a bird eye view kind of, 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 uh, of perception. In this example, you see the, the work from uh, U et al. Uh, two years ago on the testing the motion in the top view uh, for the different vehicles. And uh, it's quite on the left, you see the uh, sort of the average uh, future prediction. On the right, you see the actual distribution with uh, the idea that when there is a lot of, uh, of, of when you have multiple features, typically at crossing, you, you, you should be able to have your distribution of the features which stand out in the different directions. So it's, it's a very interesting. Um, so this was just a, a very rapidly sample about the different types of, of perception tasks uh, uh, using, in, in this case, the cameras and LiDAR, but we did this not in this data. Um, okay, let, let, let's mention what are the actual challenges and, and why. Uh, I think that perception is not so for autonomous driving, but it's progressing quite fast. Uh, so they are very specific by, by the fact that you, you are putting these uh, vehicles in the wild, um, in open world, there are really uh, specific challenges. Um, in particular, there are different domains, and uh, there are plenty of issues with the distribution, uh, and also we have the long tail problem with rare events and, and loss of perturbation. Now just for the sake of discussion, um, so the obvious and it's it's it's, it's one of the four topic in this workshop. Um, the, 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 the challenge is to the low, low light condition because of the time of day or the weather, and also but also you have issues issues with the, the, the domain shift with the different regions in the world, different type of driving uh, related uh, to 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 this localization. Of, Domains, but also whether you are in, in the city center or countryside, etc., it's very, it's very different. So these are these images are here to illustrate some extreme uh, differences. But also you have some uh, temporary impediment in your perception, either because you are blinded or the sensor is blinded by the, the sun glare, or because of uh, the sensor be, being outside the car, it can be stored, or it can have droplets, etc. So all these things make the perception very difficult. And it's not only for the cameras, by the way, it can be also very as we saw in previous And last but not least, you have a very events or, or, or conjunctions of events or, or rare objects. So in this case, I'm showing just a few examples, uh, like a car being towed by a trunk of cars or the, the same with the motorbike at the back of the van. For well, this guy, uh, the cyclist pulling down the, the pedestrian crossing, and another one which I really like, which is this uh, uh, optical illusion of a 3D uh, zebra crossing, very effective for, uh, for, for uh, the safety of the, of the pedestrians. But I, I don't know what uh, uh, one of the autonomous uh, robot taxis are, but it does uh, do uh, So we have to be obviously uh, able to handle all these things. So. Just to, to, to summarize the, the situation here, so what are the expectations from for the um, the embedded AI for autonomous driving or assisted driving, which is uh, which are two sides of the same coin? Uh, first, important thing to keep in mind is uh, if if your system, your perception is excellent in terms of benchmarking, in terms of accuracy, or whatever the metric, uh, this is not this is not the matter. So this is not uh, the remix. So in order to of course, you have to make sure that for the intended, intended uh, operational design domain, ODD, not to be confused with OOD, so this is also what we call in domain, um, say, uh, driving at uh, daytime in a certain town, 
Um, at, you have to, to already make sure that you're very good in your, uh, in your uh, intended domain, including with, uh, uh, with corner cases, okay? Uh, but also you have uh, in the, uh, in the uh, o, o, ODD, you have to be robust to perturbations, and we, we, we saw that this, this happens. There are always times where it happens. Um, but then uh, you have to make sure that uh, your, your system will be able to, um, uh, to be, to, should, should, should adapt to new domains that you know ahead of time, or even better, should be uh, should generalized to never seen domains or never seen conditions. So I'm extending now uh, the, uh, the the system beyond the original ODD. Uh, and another important feature that I'm not going to discuss today is the ability of the perception system or the all driving stack to self-assess the confidence. So sometimes it's better not to take any decision, but uh, so knowing what you don't know is, 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 is really important for the safety critical systems. So we need sort of additional layers in the system or guardrails saying that uh, um, uh, for some reason, the output is very uncertain. Um, and when you, when you learn all your, your models, you should make sure that uh, uh, they learn something useful about the running world that you can reuse for or transfer to other setups with different sensors. I, I forgot to mention that another source of domain gap is the fact that the setup or the place where you put your sensors or the spec of, of your sensors, they can vary a lot and it's already visible when you look at the available, uh, data, the publicly available data sets. Uh, and the last thing uh, that I, I'm not going to talk about either today is that the, the thing should be extremely good for the to build trust and to make sure that it's adopted by the consumer and the, uh, okay and all the, the the four first points are really about uh, what, what one can call the reliability of the system and not only you need to, to make it as reliable as possible but you should be able to assess the level of reliability which is already a challenge for this one which I'm taking the opportunity to, to advertise this, uh, this workshop that will uh, organize at ICTV in early October in Paris, uh, Bravo for Robustness and Reliability in Autonomous Vehicles in the Open World in uh, conjunction with the ELSA EU project. And uh, uh, we have a great uh, keynote speakers and also the, now you can send me something. So you can uh, all right. Okay. So what, one thing I think is important, and again, it, it, it transpired from our previous talks in the in the in the and probably next talk today in the program of this workshop, uh, it's uh, to 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 uh, to enjoy various types of sensors uh, to get uh, uh, as good and robust and as reliable as possible perception. And the typical sensor suite is on this slide. Uh, so transonics is for really uh, for uh, low speed maneuver, but also, and then you have the radars, the cameras, the laser scanners, the, the lidars. Uh, in, uh, actually, on this uh, on this slide, what you see is the, the sensors that uh, we do at Valeo. So they are automotive grade uh, mass produced sensors that are already installed on, on uh, passenger cars, and uh, with these sensors, we can even uh, put them on a, a experimental platform that can drive. Either long distance across continents uh, or uh, in uh, in urban environments, as you see at the bottom of the slide, uh, given parts. Uh, so, uh, of course, the rest of the equipment is not so uh, auto, or not so um, uh, classic, of course, but the sensors themselves are really the the uh, classic sensors that we that we sell. Okay. Uh, now I'm going to. Uh, in the remaining time, I will say a few things about this, uh, some of the sensors. Uh, the first one is radar, which is extremely interesting for bad weather. Um, uh, so this is a, the vi a video where we recorded at the same time we have the radar signal. This is how it looks like with the classic automotive uh, radar. So it's essentially a 3D volume of, of uh, energy to spectrum. And you see that um, and we have been working in the team on this in particular uh, two years ago. Uh, we showed that uh, with a proper uh, 
uh, data set, we could train an actual um, covnet, which takes the uh, radar raw data volume and, and, and split it into uh, 2D views of, of, of the signal. And then you train your covnet, uh, which allows you to segment at the, uh, at the raw signal level in terms here of, uh, of uh, cyclists and pedestrians. Um, uh, so that was uh, interesting, and also in order to do that, we, we produced a dataset Carada, which was uh, which which is uh, publicly available. And last year at CDPR, we had another one with a different type of radar, which is imaging radar. So if you're interested, just uh, just uh, let us know. Okay, cameras. So cameras. Okay, there are we are computer vision researchers. We, we love them. They're, they they they. The way they, they, they perceive the, the, the physical world is extremely rich. And now you can have uh, multiple cameras giving you, providing you with a 360 perception. Uh, and uh, using only cameras, you can already do, uh, do a lot. In particular, I already mentioned that earlier, but it's called the bird eye view perception, uh, uh, which comes in different flavors. For instance, in this case, it's called semantic segmentation. So the, the, the idea is to be able to, uh, to um, uh, predict where are the different vehicles and we come to map around the Eagle vehicle. In this case, I'm just uh, highlighting here the, the long truck, which is on the uh, on front right of the Eagle car. Um, so there, there is quite a lot of literature on this topic in the past two years in particular, uh, and, and more or less it, it's always at the high level of the same architecture. So uh, the, the, the images of the different, the different video streams, they go through image encoders. So you end up with the visual features which are then fused and, and projected somehow on the top view and you end up with the uh, bird eye view features. And then you have a decoder with a different linear view task. Okay. So uh, one of the, the, the things that we, we did uh, uh, on this task and which was presented at, at Corel last year, uh, which is called NARA for latent and rays. Is a, it's a transformer based architecture. Actually, it's based on the perceiver where we effectively, have, well, the contribution is to, to already to have this, uh, this architecture, which allows us to have a very compact um, representation, internal representation with latents of the, of, 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 of the, of the uh, surrounding of the car. And also, the way we encode the position of each pixel in each of the view uh, uh, was uh, one of the contributions. And then the decoder depends on the task here. Uh, as I said, the task is semantic segmentation of the bird eye view. Uh, so it's uh, the, the, the query, query is based on the, uh, on the geometry of the bird eye view. Uh, and just to uh, illustrate the, 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 some of the results here uh, by night or by uh, rainy time, you see the images on the left and on the right, you see the, uh, uh, the, uh, the Actually, it's not only the, the vehicles, but also the road itself, which is predicted, and you, you see the comparison of the prediction with the ground truth. So it's, it's pretty, pretty good. And another interesting aspect of this architecture is that because we have these, uh, uh, these uh, cross attention between the, uh, the latent and the, uh, the image, then you can uh, visualize that. And this is what you see here uh, in, uh, with, the, uh, with, with a different uh, uh, heat map or a superimposed on the image. And you see uh, what, what is illustrated here is that if you look at the uh, different uh, attention, attention heads and the different latent, you can see that, uh, for instance, one latent in one head is attending uh, some part of the uh, surround view. Uh, and also that there is a nice continuity across the view, which uh, says, which tells that the, uh, or indicates that the geometry of the uh, system has been well captured by the, the perception. And you, we see as well that if we look at uh, different heads or we uh, look at, uh, we average across different nations, we have a complete uh, attention or attending to the OCM for this uh, example. Um, now, uh, switching to LIDAR, um, uh, the, the, the thing that we, we in particular proposed recently and it will be presented uh, tomorrow, uh, this one, is uh, how to use a visual, info, a visual transformer to uh, to to analyze uh, lidar point clouds. So uh, because the geometry is very different, one one very simple thing that uh, and very effective thing which which is presented here uh, or proposed here is to turn the point cloud into what is called a range image. So now you are back to a kind of image geometry for which you can leverage uh, actual uh, vanilla uh, visual transformer. And in this world, then uh, you take a pre-trained VIT. And you essentially 
by fine tuning on the actual upon cloud task, you can uh, just learn the stem and the decoder for the, uh, in this case, the uh, semantic segmentation of the upon cloud. Because uh, of course, uh, the, the VIP is it's hard to train, at least you need lots of data. So in this case, the idea is to really leverage like something which has been already trained on images and, uh, and then, then uh, to, transport, to transport that or transfer that to the uh, cloud. Um, another work which will be presented uh, on Wednesday, still with LIDAR, is uh, uh, how to, uh, to, to, to learn uh, in a self-supervised manner a good representation. And in this work, the idea is to, uh, to, to build on the, the very specific uh, pretext task, which is the uh, prediction of the uh, at the voxel level, uh, something that you can supervise actually at least partially, I'm not going to go into the details. So the first, the, the top is the, the, the self-supervised part. And the idea is that uh, that you can leverage a very, uh, uh, quite simple uh, cue, which is that uh, uh, the, light of, the line of sight from the sensor to any uh, 3D point is essentially empty. So it's empty, something that you can already uh, use in the self-supervised learning. Uh, again, I'm not going to go into the details. You can attend the, the poster on Wednesday. Uh, but what you see on the right is, a uh, some uh, qui uh, qualitative results where you see the point cloud on the left and on the right you see the actual uh, occupancy volume with, uh, with the uh, semantic class once you, you use this representation to train an actual semantic segmentation on top of it. Uh, okay, um, I'm going to skip that uh, and now I know for, for sake of time. And, um, and now uh, one thing I'd like to, 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 to mentioned to finish with is the fact that we can, uh, when we do self-supervised learning for this uh, type of perception, it's, it's very beneficial to combine LiDAR and cameras when they are aligned. Uh, uh, this is the, the slide that I just did. But now moving forward, the, the idea here is that to use on top of that uh, visual language models. So the, um, uh, with a, the objective of uh, leveraging powerful, uh, uh, text align image features, but in the 3D world, uh, you can do that in different ways. So we have two ongoing, uh, or at least uh, preprints on that. One where um, we essentially uh, distill these, uh, these, uh, these features in the uh, voxel volumes in order to uh, in order to to to, to learn uh, voxel uh, based features that can be used both for predicting the occupancy and Predicting the uh, uh, predicting or or probing later the uh, semantic class and uh, it's called POP 3D and uh, you can then because of the of these uh, of the properties of the uh, features that we have distilled we can then query these features these uh, 3D voxel features in an open vocabulary manner in order to do the semantic segmentation as you see on the right or even uh, search so you can search for G image in 3D and that you, we, we saw in the previous uh, slide on here, uh, searching for zebra crossing, and we see how we get the, um, in a zero short fashion, we can retrieve the, the visual, the, the zebra crossing here in the, in the 3D world. Um, and uh, uh, another one, uh, which is also uh, leveraging this idea that uh, by aligning the images and the, the point cloud, then we can Sort of uh, uh, exploit in 3D uh, the powerful uh, or the rich uh, text align uh, visual features. Uh, in this case, it's uh, it's in the uh, we, we, there is no voxel here. We we stay on the uh, on, on, on the on the point cloud and the uh, and the the, the task the, the the dungeon task is um, uh, semantic segmentation. And then here, what is illustrated um, is essentially if you pick. Uh, Say on the right, if you pick one uh, point on the uh, on the uh, on the pole, and then uh, what is shown is the uh, uh, the set, the similarity in, terms, in the feature space which has been learned with other points, and you see that uh, you retrieve the rest of the pole and the same on the left with three points, indicating the good uh, property semantic properties of the representation that, which have been trained. All right, and the last uh, the last thing is uh, um, coming back to uh, Tom Rowley. Uh, perception and related to a task which was discussed earlier in the workshop this afternoon, which is uh, domain notation. We are currently exploring how to do domain notation in a, a fashion, just using a prompt like you have the source domain, 
uh, with annotation you can train on and uh, you, the prompt is driving at night. And the idea here is essentially um, uh, to, to learn how to modify the low level feature in the, in the pre background such that uh, uh, according to the prompt uh, here driving at night such that if, uh, then you can fine tune for this type also to for semantic segmentation then you can fine tune your semantic segmentation model but based on, on features that have been uh, uh, more than a at the beginning of the backbone towards uh, uh, towards the, uh, the domain of interest and uh, this is just an example uh, where we, we show um, on the so in the middle column I'm, I'm just I'm not, I'm not going to go into the detail of the table you see for instance uh, how the uh, this uh, zero short uh, or prompt based adaptation can be, can be uh, done on uh, on the case of driving through fire or driving in sunstorm and you see that it does it does help a lot and but the idea is completely generic so we can do that as well for, for detection all right so let me finish with takeaways uh yes i think uh, uh the autonomous driving or at least uh, uh, advanced system driving systems are already quite uh, of course a reality uh, thanks to many things, uh, the sensors, compute as well, and more on board, and machine learning and AI. Uh, but it's totally harder than expected. Uh, the, there are a few challenges, including uh, how to do the actual uh, uh, validation of these systems in terms of reliability in particular, all the way to their certification. Uh, and I will finish with the new venues. I think uh, uh, striving to do a lot of in all the towards is, is suddenly uh, important, including now with the help of generative models. Skeptical of his learning in particular when you're looking at realities is something very, uh, very uh, promising. And at large foundation models are opening now a whole lot of, 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 of tasks that we can do from zero short analysis to pre-annotation. And with a little visual to finish with, one way we can use this validation so you take a real scene and you, you can you can by prompting and also indicating the location you can change it uh, in this case I'm doing a little bit from the on the home on the zebra crossing and this is of course something that you can use it. I think there are plenty of other applications we can think about so I'm happy to to chat uh, or to discuss with uh, whoever is interested thanks a lot Really, uh, very, very, very close range perception. Uh, the trustworthy is quite interesting, uh, I think, the use for, for talking. But also, we uh, again showed here that uh, I don't think we, we use a lot for most signal measuring in this space. It's a uh, system. We have an impression with those requirements. No, no, it's a key. It's a key. Like a big, big thing. It's a really big cost. And it's very really powerful because of the uh, Camera, camera is very cool. So when it gets to like a few centimeters, camera, camera are not so good. Yeah, camera is good for yeah. yeah. But fisheye cameras uh, for low speed maneuvers certainly and for, for the near field is good. And, uh, and we are currently working on a near field light off.
machine learning, optimization, computer graphics, and computer vision. So we're very happy to have you here, Felix. And uh, please go ahead. We look forward to listening to your talk. Yeah, wonderful. Thank you so much for the for the great introduction. Glad to be here. So let me just keep going. Yeah. So um, yeah. So imaging and vision systems are really all in our lives, right? Um, not only in self-driving vehicles, but also in cameras, uh, mobile robots, um, or VR and XR applications as well. And so if you look at the autonomous vehicles of the future, we really have to handle these harsh cases, which is why we're all here in this workshop, why we're all excited about tackling some of these um, challenging out of distribution cases, the long tails, right? So here's a capture campaign um, that um, we captured in the ASC project, which you heard about earlier. Uh, Mario was instrumental in that among many others. Um, and so we captured data uh, throughout Europe in the February month, and you can see that how rare um, harsh conditions such as dense fog, for example, are in this case. So we can't really get there with supervision and just sticking to supervision is not, uh, not enough. So here's an example of a, of a so-called edge case, uh, which you can capture with a multimodal camera set, which is, is slightly more um, extensive than the typical radar uh, camera setups um, that also include, uh, include LiDAR then. Um, so here you see that um, both on the LiDAR side, um, you see these glitter point clouds on the camera side, you also have um, relatively tricky scattering. Uh, thermal cameras also do not really help you in this case here. Um, and um, gated cameras and another camera that I'm showing you here on the, on the bottom, it kind of does this better, but it's still also challenging to, de to detect. So really tough cases for multimodal um, sensor suites. All right, so what do we observe here actually? I wanna just look at the, at the LiDAR case because that is really the de facto corner case sensor that a lot of the L4 vehicles rely on, right? Um, so as we can see here, uh, which is a paper that we actually did together with Christos, um, we have a clear scene on the left side and a snowy scene on the right side. And I see all this backscatter here. Um, and this is really the tricky part. So you may imagine that um, you can hopefully try to just add augmentation here, right? Uh, so how far do we get with augmentation if you add synthetic data? Um, and let us look at a simple approach of how we can do that. So let's say we sample snowflakes on a 2D disk. Um, as so, and then we don't only do this once, but we do this for all 64 channels of the LiDAR here. So here we um, use a data set that used the VLP64, and then we do this 64 times. Um, we stack those up, um, discard the snowflakes that are out, outside of, of the field of view that we want to cover. Uh, and then for every channel um, of our LiDAR, we have one of these slices here, right? And now um, we can check for every transmitted ray, um, assuming that we have some divergence here as well, um, how much that interferes with the snowflakes um, in, in the path that we consider. So if we now look at one of these individual rays, um, it's possible that multiple snowflakes um, interfere with this ray, as we can see here in this illustration on, on the top because of the divergence, right? And um, so on the bottom, you see received power over uh, time or distance. And so in this particular example here, um, you have this orange snowflake um, causing the strongest return, which kind of overshadows the actual measurement in the uh, back, which is this black target here. Um, so we can augment um, our point cloud now with this um, with such a simple simulation model. And we do get some relatively decent looking point clouds that are close to the point clouds that you um, measure um, with the setup in the wild. And um, so that does much better than existing setups. So there's Lisa, for example, here, um, and you can get a decent way to simulate, or a simple and decent way to simulate your, um, your LiDAR measurements in, in such harsh conditions. So, okay, how does this work now? We apply a uh, point box LRCNN on it or any other um, uh, detector, uh, 3D LiDAR detector. From left to right, you see here um, camera reference frame that we're only trained on clear data uh, then point clouds processed with um, a pre-processing filter. And then you have the point clouds augmented with the snowfall simulation um, and train on this. So in the last column, um, you see now here um, everything together. So the ground truth annotations are in color here, a little bit difficult to see. Um, hopefully you, do, you do see it. And the predictions of the network are in black. So in, in this first example, you see here that uh, this method with the simulation is the augmentation is, is um, able to detect the pedestrian um, in the presence of snowfall clutter here. 
Second example, um, you can do uh, better in terms of not producing any false positives. So it's right here in the back. And here's another example where um, we're also, again, the only method that doesn't produce any false positives. All right, so now if you look at the margins, you measure this on um, favorite data set that you want to evaluate on. These margins are, in fact, um, consistent, but they're not all that high, right? So there's a few percentage, uh, percentages. So you don't really get um, too much out of this in terms of um, overall performance. It does work better, but uh, it brings the question of simulation actually enough, right? So are we looking at the right part of the overall pipeline? Um, and is the sensor stack uh, that we're looking at um, the right thing uh, to work with? So typically we design these stacks in isolation, right? So we first um, get our LiDAR sensor, then we have a bunch of experts tuning that. Um, same goes for cameras typically. And then we'll take the outputs, capture large data sets. Then maybe we do augmentation or we do active learning or any other, right? But what I want to look at in this talk here is, can we actually um, put the LiDAR sensor and other sensors in the loop? And um, does that allow us to do some RL on uh, the LiDAR measurements itself? So tackle the problems already before um, we have these cluttered point clouds. So um, LiDAR systems we do one step, we can go one step back here, measure um, returned laser pulses um, to scan the 3D scene here. So just the one I'm showing you here. Um, and as um, I mentioned before, um, we have multiple echo superpositions that lead to um, snow clutter here, right? Or broad peaks, for example. And now what's happening is that um, actually once we emit it, um, we measure the returns, and then we have um, some conventional DSP that typically is integrated in the, in, in the LiDAR uh, that depends on some parameters um, and processes um, these LiDAR incoming wavefronts. Threshold stem uh, removes noise, does other processing in order to give us the final point cloud, which is not consistent with the exact, uh, with the exact measurements that we have. It may not um, discard uh, certain returns, but only some of them. Okay. So what are the, some of these parameters? So um, let's look at, at some of these hyperparameters. So here's a 128 channel um, alpha prime that we simulate with tunable laser power, pulse duration that we can tune, and a noise threshold, right? Um, so then for instance, a low laser power, as shown here, leads to a relatively noisy point cloud. But now if I change the laser power um, and increase that, then I get, do get a more accurate intensity. Um, but now if I have very high laser power, right, that leads to less noisy point clouds, but also to saturation. Right? So then I get less accuracy on my um, reflected um, intensity estimate that I also want to measure with these lights, right? And this is just a simple uh, dummy DSP here. So now shorter pulse duration can improve the point cloud quality, <clears throat> but also uh, makes it challenging to detect the, um, the return pulses in, in many cases. Now, uh, noise floor, there's a cascade of uh, noise filters and typical LiDAR DSPs, um, and these can filter out noisy points, but they can also can remove uh, valid points, right? So the noising problem can be challenged here. Okay, so now can we jointly tune this entire pipeline um, for a downstream detector task? Um, that's one of the questions. So we looked at directly including the LiDAR <clears throat> and, the, <clears throat> and the DSP um, in the optimization um, loop in an RL approach using a first order a zeroth order optimization method. So here is the raw point cloud, the raw wavefronts on the on the top. Um, we pipe those through our DSP, um, then get some loss functions that can be relatively generic. So it could be um, actually the final metrics, uh, mean average precision or a tree call that we directly could optimize over. We don't need differentiable proxy loss because it's a zero order method. And then we get a new set of parameters uh, that we pipe into our DSP and close this loop, right? So it's really a, a cycle until we get um, convergence. So where do these wavefronts come from? We start by simulating that, but we also have a um, have a method to um, and we'll talk about that later to use real um, hardware black box liners. So we start using Carla here. Um, we get a diffuse color and a roughness. Um, then we use that to approximate an IR BRDF. Um, we sample the scene using uh, simple ray casting uh, to get the ground truth depth. Um, approximate ambient light from the RGB image, and then simulate this entire wavefront um, by uh, downsampling these rays um, from, a, from adjacent points in order to take also then multipath effects into account um, at object discontinuities. 
So um, these wavefronts are then passed uh, through noise simulator. We get um, results from our DSP and finally point cloud. Right? So that then gets piped into um, our 3D detector module uh, or the other downstream module that we're looking at uh, to compute uh, some of these metrics that we're directly outputting on, um, on our validation data set. So we developed a zero order um, solver that's derivative free, and that allows you to be really flexible with this approach. Uh, so we don't have to come up with differentiable proxies. There's a line of work where we also did that, uh, but this is a lot easier uh, to work with, uh, work with in practice and the first thing that uh, worked out quite well. So far we sampled hyperparameter um, that the LiDAR produces, um, we get um, a bunch of outputs and we can compute losses on those. Again, keeping this general so far. Now, one tricky thing that we um, do for the optimizer is that we actually uh, rank each loss component um, and then take the maximum um, of all loss components. So this gives you sort of like a dynamic scalar um, optimization approach um, that weights um, according to importance of these uh, respective objective functions. And the nice thing is you can show that uh, this satisfies two conditions. It minimizes the, the scalarized loss and it's a Pareto point. So you can really do Pareto optimization with this um, solver here at hand. Um, okay, so let us look at this um, in action. So let's say if you wanted to um, optimize our LiDAR for both intensity, so the accuracy of the measured intensity and depth error, right? So how accurate is my depth and how accurate is my in in intensity? And I'm showing these two losses here. Um, for depth at the top and intensity in the bottom. Um, and then I'm showing you these Pareto optimal points in green and the red star is here the champion that we selected so far. So that's the best Pareto point found so far. So you can see that after some exploration, this um, RL-based optimizer improves both losses um, and later on uh, these losses con conflict. Um, and so you kind of have to do, have to look at both good configurations and bad configurations in order to improve the point cloud uh, quality overall. So that's one of the key things. And we compare this to expert tuned um, hyperparameters for this um, particular LiDAR DSP um, in a bird's eye view. And here we encode um, depth error with um, lighter colors being better um, and the darker colors being worse. So, so we can see that we can do substantially better in terms of accuracy in, um, in depth error. Okay, so now we jointly optimize intensity, depth, um, and this IOU downstream loss that I mentioned uh, before um, about um, for 3D object detection. Um, and then what you can get um, is this result here. So it's actually a drastic increase in, in performance compared to the uh, baseline result here, which was also fine-tuned. Um, and this is like really a really massive um, improvement in um, uh, an MAP where we get almost about 50% uh, improvement by just tuning to exactly what the detector preserves. So we do, miss here some points in the very back, but that doesn't really matter, right? So this is sort of the difference that you see by tuning an expert who uh, tries to maximize the range here versus um, the, um, someone that tunes here, in this case, the automated method, method that tunes for um, the performance of the object detector as a downstream task. Um, so there are especially, these parameters are especially beneficial for small objects um, that you want to reliably detect. Um, so in this case here, our data set was biased towards this. Um, objects relatively close. So that is obviously all included in the optimization in, in an end-to-end -end function. Okay, so this was all simulated so far. So now what happens if I actually have a black box LiDAR unit, like a real hardware unit? Well, I can still do the same approach, um, assume that my LiDAR is black box, um, but I don't have any ground truth um, data to compare to in this particular case. So we do a simple workaround that worked well. So here's a Faraha spectrum scan LiDAR. Um, and um, we actually, I'm not sure why this. Okay, um, so we actually optimize for um, for both here. Let's play this again uh, for the uh, spectrum scan lidar, where we um, get ground truth data by by um, acquiring um, a larger scan uh, that we um, then average. Um, so we take about 100 measurements, average those. Um, and then um, use those as ground truth data uh, to compare to. And results are also very um, very good. We get an improvement from about 15 centimeters in RMSE to about six centimeters in, our, in RMSE, uh, which is pretty, pretty significant for this um, off-the-shelf layer. So again, optimize for a completely different thing. Um, here, the um, point cloud um, accuracy for all the closed points is what we are. You can also bias this towards longer distances, 
um, or bias this to points on a vehicle, for example, all of this is um, easily possible with this approach here. Okay, so now I've shown you something that uh, puts the DSP um, inside the, um, and the entire LiDAR sensor inside the entire optimization uh, loop. So we're gonna present this also at CBPR this week here. Um, so we talked about LiDAR so far as a really challenging case for, um, uh, or as a, as a sensor modality that oftentimes fail, there in these harsh weather conditions. So uh, we now know, of course, uh, that uh, cameras and LiDARs are complementary. Uh, we can work together really well. So what about uh, coming up with a hybrid between a camera and LiDAR? So again, instead of looking at all of this after the capture, can we come up with a hybrid sensor that kind of uh, does better than Okay, so why would we want it to do that, right? So granted, 3D perception um, in, in autonomous driving relies on LiDAR really um, heavily. Here's an example of a Velodyne Alpha Prime. But um, while we do get points with accurate uh, density, they're still sparse compared to the RGB data, which are mobile overlaying here. And so here we get dense megapixel outputs, uh, but they're lacking depth precision, right? So um, if we come up with a hybrid, um, in particular, I'm, I'm advocating for, for gated imaging here, then we can maybe try to overcome both um, and come up with an imaging array that um, achieves good depth quality as well as um, the ability to see through it. Fog and snow by gating. Um, okay, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure where these sounds are here, but um, so gated imaging basically um, allows you to emit um, um, pulses of light at a given time. Um, so we emit those in the scene. So here's a flood light illumination um, that um, is, is emitted into the scene. And then we capture these pulses uh, by gating um, an exposure that allows us to capture these images here over time here. So you see um, various different delays of the laser and gates. Um, and we can um, capture images that correspond with illuminated uh, slices to the respective um, objects at the given depth here in the scene. Um, so here's a pedestrian um, and a car in a, in a typical uh, traffic scene. So now we can actually combine this together with um, stereo cues that you get from uh, conventional cameras here. Um, so conventional cameras uh, allow us to do, get these multi-view stereo cues or uh, cues over time. Uh, so we can use self-supervision and we did that um, here in this particular setup where we combine a stereo camera, um, so a gated stereo camera within a single illuminator. So that allows us to get both time of flight cues, as well as multi-view uh, views uh, with relatively high depth performance. Um, so here's a network that we propose, but we call it gate stereo. Again, we present this also this, uh, this week here in the, in the conference. Um, so we start by using a gated input. So three active slices as input. Um, and in addition, uh, we capture also unmodulated passive slices that allows us to handle HDR conditions um, in daylight. So uh, we first begin by uh, processing these gated images uh, through a monocular depth backbone that gives us relatively high fine structure, uh, but with scale ambiguity. Right? Um, so now we pipe these images also through um, a correlation pyramid to get the stereo cues. Um, and um, in the stereo branch, we also predict albedo um, and ambient values, which allows us to self-supervise with the measurements, the gated measurements that we have. So we can close the loop by supervising again against those uh, depth images that we have, those gated images that we started off with. Um, and then in order to enforce depth consistency um, in the presence of occlusions, um, we only supervise really depth uh, with the illuminator field of view uh, supervised. So for that, we use mass that we compute and then we can finally refine the mono outputs together with the stereo outputs and really only use these masks exactly to, um, uh, to enforce the loss where um, we have the illuminator uh, not occluding anything in the scene here. So it looks like a relatively complicated model, but basically um, self-supervised and, and supervised cues. Again, um, we also uh, pipe in the LiDAR here. Um, that allows us to train this method um, in an end to end fashion. So um, in order to train it, we acquired a gated data set. Um, you heard um, earlier today about the AIC uh, capture set. So that was captured 
uh, within um, this data acquisition campaign. And what you see here on the, on the bottom is the range that you can get. So it's a much larger range than um, with the data set that we had before. So um, um, up to about 200 meters. Okay, so now to the fun. So here on the top, you see um, images of the RGB camera um, in the night scene, um, point cloud of um, Velodyne Alpha Prime, so relatively um, high-end uh, scanning LiDAR sensor, our gate to stereo output, um, gate to gate, another method that we developed before, um, a sparse to dense LiDAR method on, and the stereo method um, that you can come up with um, for uh, high resolution stereo cam that we used. Um, here, I'm just playing. Some of these videos are not they're playing for you. No, but um, I'll, you'll, I'll I'll show you later. I mean, you'll believe me that the, uh, that we have live outputs here. Um, here, um, I'm showing you gated um, output images that, that um, you will see that uh, the gated method that we look at here, um, this hybrid um, stereo plus gating images method, is the only one that's able to separate um, the two pedestrians. Um, that we have here in this particular case. All right, so here's another um, example in nighttime conditions. Um, we can have to believe me that this works very really better. I'm not sure whether this video is going to play. Um, but overall, we do substantially better um, than the previous methods that we had, uh, that we came up with, um, and with 50% better in, in uh, absolute depth error and 75, uh, almost 75% better than uh, the best gate method. And uh, so sometime this week, we'll show you these videos um, with some uh, video output here. All right, so next, um, let's talk about um, an entirely new sensing modality that could tackle these harsh conditions. Um, so I wanna revisit acoustic signals. Um, so I've shown you um, hardware in the loop approaches um, that look at the LiDAR DSP, uh, this hybrid gated uh, imager together with um, stereo cues as well, but what about acoustic cues? Right? So can we come up with an acoustic method that allows us to um, get passive roadway traffic noise? And so sound carries uh, complementary information uh, compared to light and a human driver um, uses the signal also for um, perception. So in this video, it is not playing, but um, you would see a roadway noise. Um, where the driver would be able to, um, from the vehicle's engine noises and tire noises, um, to extract complementary information to the um, optical signals measured by the cab. Um, so sound travels as pressure waves, um, and so we can measure that by microphones. Um, and if we um, add additional microphones here, we can actually capture directionality as well. And we can do substantially better the more microphones we add here. So that explains why we have this big array here in front of uh, mounted on a car. So now we can extend this uh, with a relatively large array of microphones. And by delaying the uh, by by changing the time delay um, of the measurements between the various microphones, we can do substantially better um, and measure um, and, and scan the entire scene uh, in terms of the sound that is uh, present here. So we can locate where exactly that sound is coming from, and that's called beamforming. So we constructed this array of microphones in front of a car, um, mounted on a car, drove through um, a, an urban scenario, and then we can capture these acoustic beamforming maps. Um, so yeah, videos for some reason don't play, but um, that's how these um, scenes here look like, um, where we can localize uh, the sound intensity um, you displayed on an, on an RGB sensor. And we don't really have to go with such a big array um, of microphones. We can actually, and we show that in our, in our paper, upsample relatively efficiently from a low resolution um, microphone array to a higher resolution array, um, where we have several, uh, where we can save several hundreds of microphones um, and live with sort of like a 20 by 20 centimeter um, array um, if we uh, set up sample the data with a neural network. We capture some data in an urban environment here in, in, in Montreal. Um, where uh, we use our beamforming apps then to um, acquire relatively um, um, typical urban conditions, both at nighttime as well as daytime, in order to learn from this data set. And that data set is online. You can download it, um, and it has a large variety of typical scenarios um, added in this data set here. Okay, so really simple approach. It shows you the power of uh, this new modality that we have added. So, um, we start off uh, with a scene here, 
um, then compute a beamforming output, um, upsample this beamforming map a little bit with a neural network, and then um, we get these beamforming maps at relatively high temporal resolution, so 48 kilohertz. Um, we can combine that then with an RGB frame at a much lower rate, um, stack all of these up, treat them as one image feature um, tensor, and um, run any detection network on it. And that works really well already, and you can supervise your network super efficiently um, and relatively easily. So here we show some object detection results and um, scenarios which are typically very challenging for um, RGB-only cameras. Um, so your night nighttime conditions where we can accurately detect these uh, these vehicles here. And in all of these cases, the um, RGB detector um, failed in, here in these cases. So that's just, that's just to convince you that there's some um, multimodality in here and some redundancy that you can really explore. Okay, so we can now with these acoustic sensors also capture scenes or um, objects of a scene that are completely not visible uh, to a visible sensor, which use the direct line of sight information. So here, for example, you see an object behind this curved wall, and we can capture this, actually this non-line of sign object accurately and can accurately detect it uh, with our detector, which is not visible. And obviously high occlusions is something, occlusions are not really um, an, an issue for these sound maps that we can also accurately detect. So you can see around the corners and through objects uh, with these sound-based detections. Okay, so just very quickly, um, the final uh, sensor that I want to convince you of that is also exciting is a sensor that handles in harsh conditions occlusions. So in particular occlusions on the windshield, um, such as um, soil um, or dust, um, that is also challenging in these harsh weather, weather scenarios. So if you look at a scenario like this here, where we have an automotive scenario in front of um, a um, so camera placed uh, behind the windshield, we want to detect these pedestrians here, then we kind of do not want to have um, occlusions, uh, soil, raindrops, uh, whatsoever on, on the windshield. And so you can try to explicitly detect them, but even if you manually detect them and you paint them, then uh, you still don't do all that. Um, so here's an example with Llama, which is state-of-the-art in-painting method on the right side, loses context here. So we can do substantially better by, again, changing the sensor. Here in this case, we insert um, a PSF modulator in the aperture plane, and we add a reconstruction node. Um, and that allows us to see through these obstructions already in the sensor before we need to do any reconstruction. So, okay, how exactly does this work? So let's say we have an object at infinity here, this vehicle on the road. Now, um, objects at infinity, hopefully if the um, optic is working adequately, are getting focused on the sensor. But anything that's close to the sensor, in particular, this, um, this occlusion here, this, this uh, leads to a blur on uh, the image that gets approximately alpha blended with the background. So now I have these alpha blended um, examples here. Um, and what we can do is we can uh, tailor a PSF. We can make use of this optical blur um, to affect uh, the behavior of the optical system. So what does that mean? Also, I can come up with a PSF that can simulate uh, my PSF of my optical system, introducing this modulator and add a reconstruction network, your favorite unit that somehow allows for uh, gradient flow through the PSF to the optical model. And then I can supervise this thing. Um, and I can jointly learn reconstruction plus um, the optic that I need to change here, um, the blur that I need to take. And then I train this in simulation, right? So I now use simulated data to train this into an end-to-end -end fashion. And what's happening is relatively interesting. So we get these PSFs here, these opt optical blurs. On the top, you see a conventional imager from right to left, that's from near to far. Um, and on the bottom, you see this optimized um, uh, point spread function. So what's happening is for the, for the distance here where we um, optimize our occlusions for, where we place our occlusions, uh, we get a point spread function that spreads that information all over the sensor and therefore is able to see through the occlusion. So it's basically a, um, um, a diffusion-based um, or almost light field camera-based um, approach to see through these um, obstructions on the, um, on the windshield. And uh, you can see that we then turn this in-painting problem, actually, instead of having an in-painting problem into a dehazing problem, which is easier because we have some signal left here to play with, and we can make sure that we actually capture something. And a random diffuser doesn't really help you because that blurs over all distances. 
Okay, so this works. Um, we've done some examples in the in, in the lab here just to convince you that this is yet another approach. Here's a ground truth scene. Here we overlay with a um, with sort of these three um, stripes here um, to simulate some occlusions. Um, if I inpaint now and do that with a conservative mask, uh, my inpainting really loses a lot of features um, of this owl here. And here's an example of this um, this lens, uh, this modulated um, optical blur um, that allows us to see through these obstructions. Um, and that does recover a lot of details and um, finer, finer construction details that you otherwise would not be able to see. All right, so in summary, I've shown you computational imaging approaches that capture or try to um, tackle everything before the capture already, um, instead of trying to uh, tackle some of these problems after the capture, um, which, uh, which is um, the approach that we've been taking for a line of these projects in order to get as good as possible data um, already before to tackle these harsh conditions. With that, I'd like to thank you all. Thanks a lot, Felix, for the great talk. Are there any questions from the audience? If yes, you can come in front to the microphone. Fantastic, Tony. Um, just one question. Sometimes we, uh, when we leverage uh, journeys, some of these uh, interesting modalities, sometimes they contradict. Yeah. Uh, you, you showed the example with all the cameras. So, yeah. So, how do you, do you go? I mean, how do you go about that when they are journey used? Yeah, yeah. So it's 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 challenging, right? So they can they can contradict each other, um, and it's a question of what you want to do with them, right? And what what you I mean, in the end, you have to fuse them in the end in your world model somehow in order to accurately tackle those uh, those conditions where you have maybe one modality giving a detection and the other one not. So that would be my answer. So you have to you have to tackle it later because you don't know what's what's the correct uh, output here in this case. Right? Yeah. Yeah, it is a it is already available. So that has lidar, radar, uh, no lidar, uh, camera, and the um, and the status and this acoustic uh, beamforming maps uh, available. So you can use this. Yeah. Okay. Which sensor? This last set, like, was that just simulation? Or you yeah. Just... No, no. We actually built this, right? Okay. So, yeah. So we're going to talk more. We're going to talk more about it. Um, and th that's just one out of many lines um, of work that look at, at at the optics. So how can we? And that's something you're going to manufacture, like take to market, or? We'll, 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 we'll not take this to market in this particular version. This is just the first prototype. Can we do this, right? Um, how you would integrate this, there's, there's very different approaches. Like if you can do an aperture plane modulation, then you have to integrate this with the optical stack. Um, we're currently improving this for our next version to make sure that we also handle other conditions. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I had a question about the data sets, which we draw some edge cases like ambulances or real souls yeah. that would get road. Yeah, exactly. So the data set is interesting from that perspective because you have a lot of really interesting, strange sounds. So pedestrians uh, chatting, uh, for example, close to the car, emergency vehicles, trucks backing up, right? These are all signals that typically we don't use at all right? in these uh, in, in, in our computer vision system. So they're all they're all captured. Um, and there's some harsh conditions there, which are, which are also interesting from a weather perspective. Right? So uh, thank you very much. Okay. Uh, last question, then we, in the interest of time, we'll have some. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. My question was related to gate the uh, single cameras. If the two gate cubes are driving side by side, they are both equipped with uh, lead gated cameras. Uh, are they still reliable since they work on the light uh, course? Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, the, the gating is relatively brown in terms of the slices, but the interference is something that we also have looked at, right? So you need to make sure actually for your own ego vehicle that you handle that interference, right? So for example, uh, if you have an RCCB camera, you have to handle that relatively well. Right? So it's really a big issue, or I mean, you have to consider it for your own vehicle, which is actually something that you can also then again, make use of, right? Um, if you have that, uh, that IR elimination that's like partially overlapping. Okay, let's thank Felix again.
and uh, we will. Uh, I can ask you to test one. Yeah, I think now it's now it's now it works. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, what I'm interested in is robustness in vision, so or perception, and I'm going to show you. I think a new approach uh, to vision uh, that follows um, analysis by synthesis, uh, and it's a decades old concept. And, but before going into the details, I'm going to show you like a really nice feature of your vision system, now, which is that it's actually super robust. And let me see if I can. Okay, so what we're going to do is a short quiz. I'm going to show you three images, and hopefully you'll tell me what you see in those images, right? So what object is there in these images? Image classification. Okay. Yeah. We start easy. Camera. Yeah. Okay. Very good. Second. A little duck. duck. Okay. Too easy. Last one. Uh, let's see. Cheetah. cheetah. It's a cheetah. Uh, mm -hmm. Once you see the cheetah, you know actually, right? It's from the top, drinking water. There is a. Uh, okay. Took a while. A little bit more challenging, but okay, we found. So, why is this interesting? Our vision system, humans, generalize extremely well in these kind of unseen scenarios, unseen viewing conditions, right? I'm not sure how many of you have seen a camel in snow before, probably no one of you, right? Or these kind of, you know, super uh, difficult occlusion scenarios, or the, here I really tried, you know, the best to find like an image that is so unusual, and then even distorting it a little bit with image processing, right? But still, you know, it takes us a while, and then we figure out, okay. So what is interesting about this as well is that once you recognize, actually in this last example, you've probably already recognized that once you recognize the object, you, you already know, you will know many other things about the object, right? So once you know, oh yeah, it's a cheetah, you know actually the pose, where are the parts, what's this thing doing, right? So it takes a while, but once you're there, you know everything. And that's just a side note here that I'll come back to later. Okay, so robust vision, that's what we want in machines, right? Show a camel in, in, in the desert, but then actually also have it recognize these kinds of things. Also, once you know, for example, there is a duck here, you also know what is behind the occluder. Right, you can actually estimate oh, where's the rough shape of this thing, what color would it have behind the occluder, things like this. Right, so this is like really a feature of human vision that is extremely nice. We all want to have also in our machines. So, what's the current state of computer vision? Yeah, I think it's actually uh, the current state is that we all love deep learning uh, because it, it you know it made made things work. So we have you know ImageNet performance way above uh, 90. We have you know, semantic segmentation almost solved. We can do even panoptic segmentation, which is much more challenging, right? Uh, we can do essentially superhuman 3D estimation from a single image. Uh, so when you look at the human pose estimation results, they are now, nowadays even below four centimeters in 3D error, right? That's like way beyond what every human could 
could, could ever do. Um, so really nice. We can even ask machines really complex questions about, about images, like you know, look at this image and what is the material of the vessel in this image, right? So, and in order to answer this, these visual question answering systems, they need to know what is a vessel, where is it in the image, and how do I disentangle material from lighting properties and things like this, right? So really challenging in order to find out then the answer of this. Right. So we, are, we have all of this already. Yeah. Cool. Seems vision is solved. Yeah. So lots of progress, right? But so there are also fundamental limitations in vision, and they are very well known. So what vision systems can do, and this is like, you know, simple example, image classification, right? We take an input image, we feed it through the feature extractor, we have this fully connected end, and it predicts the output car, right? So this kind of large scale visual recognition, I think that was kind of the main, you know, contribution of deep learning. We can now really do it on large scale, very pretty well. Yeah, so that's cool, fantastic. But for example, these systems, they really fail when, things change in 3D in an unusual manner, right? For example, you see a car in a, in a strange pose, right? so suddenly the error, like suddenly the output, you know, fails. But that's, that's not good, yeah, people have found this very early already. Or any other natural change in individual image components will also uh, induce this. So for example, you have objects out of context uh, or with a strange texture or in strange weather, as we've heard, or, under strong occlusion, uh, all of these things, they will actually lead to deep learning systems typically fail. Not always, but chances are very high. So this is, these things are very well known. Yeah? Now, actually, this might be like, you might be one of the audiences that actually already know why this is relevant, right? But typically I'll, I'll ask, yeah, why is this relevant to computer vision uh, people? And then I'll take, you know, my offending uh, autonomous driving slide. Uh, so saying that, okay, so, you know, when you think about challenges in self-driving, right, um, you think about all of the crazy things that, that might happen, but, you know, what I actually find very interesting is that uh, I think, and that's uh, hypothesis, detecting stop signs is still not solved yet. Uh, why? So I've seen this fantastic talk by Andre Kapati, already three years old, <laughs> you can see it on YouTube, where he talks about how difficult it is to detect stop signs. Right, so they are like, and then he's showing all of those like uh, interesting images where, where you know they are kind of stop signs in different uh, conditions. Right, so there's like different contexts, uh, different poses that stop signs can have. They can be strongly occluded, or the illumination can be can be difficult. Right, so and he's talking about these things and say like we are collecting a lot more data to fix these things. So. Uh, that I found really interesting, but then even today you can go on YouTube and find like Tesla, like Tesla fails to, to detect stop sign and you'll, you'll find plenty of videos, right? So even with the, with the, with the newest fully set driving uh, thing. So I'm not sure if you just see this, uh, there was even a Super Bowl commercial this year where whatever the Dawn project is, I'm not sure who, who uh, Elon Musk offended there, but um, so they even they, there was this like 30 seconds commercial for multi for a few million dollars, I think, uh, that showed all of the failure cases of Tesla. Uh, so really fa like fantastic. Yeah? It really seems to be not solved yet detecting stop signs. And so why is this uh, kind of why is this an issue? Why is this frightening? And um, even we really designed stop signs to be as easy detectable as possible, right? So these should be the easiest to detect objects in the world almost, right? Like visually detectable objects, right? I mean, it's like, there is no changes in shape, right? It's red. We place it typically in positions that should be, you know, that are kind of prominent. And so we're not getting there, right? These are not children in a Batman costume running across the street or something like this, right? This, is, this should be easy, but it's not. Um, so, and the reason is that deep networks do not generalize robustly. Typically I write deep networks do not generalize, full stop. But then people get, uh, we, we start, you know, people start to argue that, oh, they, are, they actually generalize. And then it, so let me say they do not generalize robustly or not strongly, not strongly enough. Okay. So the big question is what do we need to do here? Um, think about it, what, what shall we do? Is it really that we need to collect more data? Yeah. Should, should we really try to do this? Yeah. 
And uh, I think more data is good, but I think it's not enough. It will not, it will not do it. Um, because in the images are really combinatorially complex. You know, so stop sign, think of stop signs in all of the different like illumination conditions, in different rotations, right? In, in, in with different weather conditions. Human, we're not even talking about humans, right? In different articulations, costumes, drunk, whatever on the street, right? Uh, in different illumination conditions. It, it's really, I, I don't think we are going to get there with data. Uh, data is good, but we need, Better models. I think it's in the model architecture. We can, and what I'm going to show you is that we can build better architectures that generalize way, way, way better than what we have so far. Uh, oh, in, in restricted scenarios, but uh, I, th I think that's uh, that's something that we should explore. Yeah. So better architectures. That's where we are going to get. So what if not deep learning? Uh, so what? So if, if not ResNet, then then what? Uh, or if not Parser RCNN or Transformers, uh, then what? Um, so we go back many many years ago in the ancient times of of computer of early computer vision, uh, asking Ulf Grenander, Mumford, or Alan Yule uh, what they think of uh, how a vision system should work, and they will tell you it's analysis by synthesis. So that's actually something people believed in uh, many years ago. And the idea is the following. So you'll have, an, so what we look at is images, right? And, but images are inherently a projection of the 3D world, right, into, into a 2D plane. And the idea there was that in order to understand images or analyze images, what you want to do is to actually reconstruct them. So you'll have a system that tries to, given a 2D image, reconstruct it in a 3D world, right? So vision systems that analyze images by actually not discriminating between things, but really by reconstructing them. Uh, so uh, synthesizing them. Okay, so that's the idea many, many years ago. Um, what, what do we need for this very briefly? Typically analysis by synthesis works like this. Uh, so you have, a, you have an object model. Uh, so it has a shape tip. So this is traditional analysis by synthesis idea. You have an object model, it has a texture, you have illumination conditions. You use rendering, computer graphics, to actually generate an image of it. And by changing the different parameters of your scene, you could generate images in different illumination, different poses, different textures. Right? So you have a model of how a bus would look like. Uh, and it's parametric. And to do vision, what you would do is you take an output, like a test image, you take your 3D model and your graphic pipeline, you render it in some initial condition, and then you compare the output to your rendered in, like the, the rendered image to your test image. And then you'll measure a reconstruction loss. And with this, you'll update your model parameters. And you're trying to find those model parameters that then actually reconstruct this test image of that. Best. Yeah, so analysis by synthesis. Uh, and then like here's a, like an illustrative example. My student uh, did here, like, so you see how the pose of this bus is kind of optimized until it, you know, converges into the correct pose. Yeah. So that's how analysis by synthesis should work. Right? And the advantages of, uh, of a classical deep networks or deep learning here would be that in the system, you're really explicitly modeling an object as a 3D entity. Right? So you really have this object centric representation. You don't have this one feature vector that encodes the whole image. You really have your ob object focus, uh, which means that you know essentially this model would not care, for example, about the context here of this bus. Uh, so it could be desert, it could be sky, it could be uh, whatever, and the reconstruction loss on the bus would not be affected. Uh, so that's just an intuitive idea of why this might be more robust here. Uh, and it's also modeling the 3D, right? So it theoretically could also uh, recognize the bus when it's upside down, although it you now has not seen. So uh, that's why it should be more robust. It's also more robust to occlusion. People have shown this for faces, for example, that these kind of approaches are kind of robust to faces because uh, to occlusion because you know it's generative, and if you cannot reconstruct something, then probably it's it's occluded. Yeah, that's it. And so what I think is also intriguing here is that it's actually inherently also multitasking able. So once you are able to reconstruct the image, 
you know where's the object what it's what is the 3d pose what is the uh, segmentation mask all of these things they drop out once you can reconstruct so that's analysis by synthesis really cool idea uh, unfortunately no one's doing this and uh, you know we, we should ask ourselves why why no one's doing this um and answers are um, manifold but i think uh, basically everything in this process is hard so it's really hard to learn these 3d models uh, i mean this is really an illustrative example here but imagine learning a 3d model of a cat right so you really need to all of the articulations all of the different uh, types of cats it's, it's tough yeah? where do you get the training data from to learn these from 2d images people are starting to do this but it's it's tough then even if you have this model so people have these kind of models for faces actually already um, they are quite sophisticated but even in this case actually the this kind of inverse process here is really difficult uh, so it's full of local optima there are tons of PhD students that wasted their life uh, trying to uh, find, you know, trying to fix this. I've, I've seen them because I was in a lab that actually followed this approach for faces. Yeah. So people get frustrated because this inverse rendering process is really difficult unless you make very strong assumptions. And then even if you get there, uh, you'll evaluate. But uh, our data sets that we currently have, like ImageNet, you know, they are not designed to evaluate these things, right? You will, uh, like, they are designed to evaluate discriminative classifiers. And when you compare to discriminative classifiers, it will always be a little bit, uh, you know, you will always have a disadvantage because you have certain other properties that are not measured. So the question is, can we integrate actually this kind of analysis by synthesis idea with deep networks and kind of retain the best of both worlds? A really discriminative system that is also extremely robust, multitasking. Thing. And the answer is yes, we can do this. So. There's a number of work that we've, that we've uh, done in, in this direction. Uh, I'm going to present here one that we've done in 2021 that we then built on. And uh, yeah, I mean, we extended this in multiple ways. I'm going to present this here. And then one extension that we did very recently. Did. So this is a joint work with the students, uh, Antian and Alan, Alan Mule. So how does this work? So we, we keep our deep network. In the sense that we take an input image, we feed it to some type of feature extractor, VIT, Resident 50, without the fully connected head, just a feature extractor to get a feature map, 2D. And then we, so we get rid of the fully connected uh, head and we replace it with something uh, a lot uh, more useful, uh, namely an object model. So what we are going to have here is a mesh. So a, a, a representation of the object, this is a mesh, like a very coarse prototypical mesh of how a bus would look like. It, it can be even as coarse as just a cube. Uh, it doesn't, in the end, it doesn't make a big difference, but I'm, what I'm drawing here is actually a prototype that looks like a little bit like a bus. And then what we're going to have on this, on this mesh is actually, instead of having RGB pixels, as I've shown earlier, we're going to have feature vectors. So these feature vectors will be learned. It's kind of a, a, texture, a neural texture map that you can then use computer graphics with and render an image. But because these are features, this is not going to be an RGB image like we are seeing in computer graphics. This is going to be a feature map. So we're going to render a feature map. Okay. That's, I mean, it's essentially just rasterizing, but that's the detail. Now, so we have this. Neural representation of an object, render, and then we compare. And then we are going to optimize these C parameters here. And in this work, we have actually done 3D pose estimation and then later uh, extended to 3D detection and classification. I'm going to show later how, how to do classification with this model. But let's focus on pose estimation for the next slide. Good. So, what we are going to learn is this feature extractor and this neural texture here. Um, just very briefly, what we are actually modeling in the in the background here is what we are using is a Bayesian approach. Really. Uh, so um, we have we represent an object as as this uh, variable O that is composed of mesh as a mesh with, with vertices in three D and a neural texture, which means that for every vertex we'll also have one feature vector uh, that is kind of c-dimensional, two hundred dimensional. So uh, so 
this, this is this here. Yeah. So O is this entity here. And then we are following a Bayesian approach, right? So what we are going to say is that uh, instead of directly learning what is the host given the image, which is what a deep network would do, is we are going to actually model the likelihood and the prior here. Uh, so the prior will be not very informative. We are going to say every post is equally likely, uniform distribution, but then the likelihood here is important. Uh, so the likelihood will be, so what is the likelihood of an image in a certain post? Uh, and we're going to approximate this as what is the likelihood of a feature map? Yeah, so we are not doing reconstruction in the image space, which is really difficult because you have all of the nitty gritty de details that you need to reconstruct like shadowing and things like this you don't want to care about. So what we're going to do is we're going to reconstruct in a feature space and our feature extractor will just learn to ignore things like shadows because they are not so important for 3D processing. So that's in a sense approximate analysis by synthesis. Uh, we are approximating this reconstruction process on a feature map. And then we're going to define a likelihood here. Yeah, so these are just, uh, this is just a bit more details here. So we, are, we have our object model. We have a certain post. So what is the feature, what is the likelihood of a feature map of this model, let's say bug, in a certain post, such degrees, arguments, and some background model. So the background model is just uh, takes care of all of the parts that are not uh, where the, uh, the uh, mesh does not project onto the image. Uh, so there will be some parts around the, around the object where the mesh is not projecting, which you need to model by a background model. Very simple though. So, and then this likelihood here is simply a Gaussian likelihood. Uh, so all of these parts, so there will be a variance, uh, not so important, but basically what you're going to have is you're going to have your observed feature in the feature map uh, and the corresponding um, texture, so the corresponding feature in the texture here. So what we, what we are going to do is we're going to project this mesh into an image in a certain pose and then look up the feature vector here and compare it to the feature vector that we observe in the image. Uh, simple reconstruction on the feature map. So we're going to learn the Bayesian model here. How are we going, now the question is how are we going to learn these features? So the feature, these features here and the texture and the feature extractor. So that's the trick. Uh, what we are going to do is contrastive learning. So imagine for the class of buses, we're going to feed all of them into, into the feature extractor, getting um, feature maps. And then we are going to do contrastive learning on those feature maps. How are we going to do this? It works like this. So because we have the pose annotated in those images, what we know is actually the corresponding points. Like for example, we know the front left tire the position of the front left tire in all of the images. Well, what we are going to do is we're going to make those features in these, at these regions, we're going to make them close. Uh, so this, this should be similar. Now, the, but these, it's not just these, that these points should be similar, they should also be different from other points on the car. Yeah. So we're going to have a contrastive dot here. And then we're going to also make all of those features on the car different from the background features. Uh, so because these we also know because we know the post. Um, so this is basically the contrastive uh, learning paradigm. It's very simple, uh, but it's, uh, in a, it's different from other contrastive learning paradigms and that we are doing this on the local features of the feature map. Uh, we're not doing it on the full feature map. Uh, we're doing it on the, on the local features. And after you've done this, um, you can estimate actually um, um, the, the neural texture that I've shown earlier as an average. Uh, so we, you're basically going to, for each vertex, you're going to compute the average feature over the whole training. Year. And once you have this, you get these things here. So what I'm going to show, what I'm showing here is an input image that is occluded. That's the current estimate. That's um, where the model thinks um, the object is occluded. Uh, so what you see here is actually a high reconstruction error, which tells you, oh yeah, this is probably occluded. And this, so what I'm, what is most exciting here is, is what you see here. That's actually the reconstruction loss as a function of the three pulse angles of this car. Uh, and you, what you see is that it's super smooth. And even when you initialize very far from the global optimum, which is here, like 90 degrees off in all three angles, you can even just gradient descent back like basically optimize into the global optimum. There are no local optimums, as you see here. And that's because the feature extractor has learned this. 
So that's a cool thing. Yeah? So you're doing reconstruction on the features, and the features are learned to kind of support this reconstruction. So that's easy to optimize. It's robust. That's what you can see here already. Yeah? So wherever you see uh, why is this robust, because the, the model will expect at the, car, at the tire location, it will expect a feature that looks like a tire, but what it sees is something that doesn't look like a tire. So high reconstruction loss. Basically, auto, like without seeing any occlusion <laughs> training time, super robust uh, because because you know it cannot reconstruct these parts. So 3D aware object centric and can be learned efficiently. Already. Okay. So how much time do I have? I guess we can have like three four more three four minutes. minutes. Okay. So how do we extend this to classification? Super simple. We just run it. Okay. So this I'm going to. Later. Uh, so, how are we going to uh, do, do classification with this? Super easy. We just have one shared feature extractor for all classes. We will have one model for every class. We will have one for buses, one for cars, one for bicycles, airplanes, blah, blah, blah. And then you're going to run. So, in the most naive setting, you're just trying to you take this input image, you're trying to reconstruct it with all of your models. And then you compare the reconstruction error. And the model that reconstructs the input image the best wins. Yeah? So as simple as that. And then you can actually, so if you naively implement this, it will take a few seconds. Uh, you can do this efficiently. And then it's basically the same uh, runtime as the deep network. So it's real time. Um, good. So what you, what you then need to learn, in addition, in your contrastive learning, is that actually the features between object categories become different. So that's the only thing that we add here to the classification. And now let, let us look at the, at the results. So what the, we, we have two settings uh, of, of results. One is the IID setting, where the training and test data look almost identical. Yeah? So that's the classical setting that we've been working on. And then, which is actually something that I think we do not really care about too much. Um, or like, I mean, we should care, of course, but, but it's, it's not sufficient, as we've heard earlier. So, but what we should, should care more about is this kind of outer distribution setting. So we have this training data, and then we've actually made a data set where we annotated out of distribution poles, shape, texture, context, weather, and occlusion. Yeah. And then what, you, what you're going to see is that standard deep networks, they you know, fail miserably here, uh, and our model will do much better. So what I'm going to show here is this. So we'll have ResNet image classification on the Pascal 3D plus data set. We can only do it on the Pascal 3D plus data set, I, will, I mean, at that time, uh, because uh, we need the 3D poles to train this model. Uh, so we cannot do it on ImageNet because the 3D poles are not annotated in ImageNet. But this actually, this data set is con like consists of a few classes of ImageNet, 12 classes. Yeah. So IID classification performance super high, we know this already. Yeah. Then we have occluded, we have generated occluded images. Well, artificial occlusion because uh, yeah, no, they could, like these objects are not part of the classification, of course. Uh, so we had to occlude with whatever giant cats and, and, and birds. Um, but I think we've actually also shown that it doesn't make a difference if you have real or, or these fake occluders. And what you see is that the performance decreases. Uh, the more occlusion you have, one to three levels, the, the stronger the performance actually decreases. And you have this across architectures. Uh, so whatever architecture you take here, uh, basically has the same performance. And then you look at our model. It performs quite a bit better. Uh, it, it doesn't solve the problem yet. Yeah, as you can see here, yeah, we, are, we are at 60 compared, compared to ResNet, uh, which is still 40% away of, but it, it's, a, it's quite a big jump. But more interestingly, uh, why does it work? Because we can actually localize the occluder. Um, so this is the reconstruction error. Blue is high, red is low. And what you can see is that it can actually localize the car and, and the occluder nicely. So what we are going to show, and what is actually super interesting, much more interesting than these occlusion scenarios are these out of distribution scenarios. And there really the jump is high, like ultra high, like 25, 30% high, 35% high. So these are these images, standard deep network fail, our model is, doesn't fail as much. Still fails, but not as much, much less. Uh, so, and we can, actually it gives us pose estimation for free as well, right? And we are kind of competitive to the standard pose estimation method. Okay, so conclusion, 
Deep networks are not robust. They do not generalize robustly and uh, more data is not enough to solve this issue. I think uh, we need more challenging data sets and more, much more challenging ways of evaluating deep networks in these out of distribution scenarios. And um, I think we're like so far the community, I mean, people are interested, but maybe not, not as much as, as, as they should be, I think. Um, and we need better architectures. So we, we should go, go away from these, you know, fully connected layers and kind of have something that has the object in mind as a really explicit representation of the object. So really keep the deep networks to learn the invariances, but then replace the fully connected layers with something that is much smarter, which is I would advocate should be an object-centric generative model. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adam, for the nice talk. Uh, are there any questions from the audience? If yes, you can come to the microphone. Uh, okay. Yeah. Any comments for the subtree of the object detection? Ooh, uh, yeah, we actually have. So we have one work on 60 pose estimation uh, where this, it, it's actually possible. It's not so difficult. Um, you need to implement it a little bit more smartly because you will run into runtime issues. But um, yeah, it, it's super possible um, at, at the scale that we are doing it right now. Yeah, So this is like 12 to 20 objects. Uh, we haven't scaled yet to a thousand objects. The students working on it and it's the main bottleneck there is actually to have the data with 3D annotation. Uh, so Uh, any other questions? If not, uh, time for BM. <laughs> <laughs> One last question. So I liked a lot the contrastive learning framework that you uh, presented for the 3D pose estimation. I'm wondering for constructing the uh, negative pairs for like each anchor sample, uh, because uh, these negatives can also come from the same object, right? Uh, what is your strategy for defining somehow a threshold where you basically separate uh, adequately the positives from the negatives? So, because if you have a negative that's very close, like that comes from a very close part of the object, then you might have, you might be pushing away features that you yeah, need yeah. to actually bring together. Yeah. So what you need to take care of is actually the receptive field of those features. Yeah. And this will kind of define a soft kind of soft radius around the feature that you should basically threshold away. Okay. So you don't sample fe negative features within mm -hmm. this. Okay. So if there are no more questions, let's thank Adam again. Thanks. So uh, this, uh, this talk is concluding our workshop. Uh, so we saw today uh, a lot of interesting talks for uh, vision in adverse weather and lighting. Uh, we saw uh, methods and uh, algorithms for uh, the part about the sensor, uh, the, the like making the sensors uh, and how we can actually design them in order to operate better and provide better signal for the downstream vision algorithms uh, in uh, inclement uh, conditions. Uh, we also saw various, uh, various methodological um, approaches and principles, uh, both at the high level uh, vision tasks, such as recognition, detection, but also from the geometry side, how to be, uh, better estimate the, uh, the depth uh, or the overall 3D uh, structure of the scene. We also had uh, a, few, uh, a few talks that focus, focused more on the low level vision, like uh, enhancement or how to better uh, to improve the visibility of the images. At the same time, we had uh, the ACDC challenge for 2023, where we had like uh, new approaches and uh, improved state of the art for semantic segmentation and the newly introduced task of panoptic segmentation for these adverse condition datasets. Uh, so 
I guess that moving on uh, also for following years where we can hopefully keep uh, keep organizing the workshop, we, we, we want to see like uh, even better results for in particular for the application of uh, autonomous cars, which is arguably one of the most important for uh, outdoor settings where the conditions and the lighting that we need to handle are much less controllable than in indoor scenarios. And uh, hopefully we might see also new data sets, uh, completely new uh, architectural approaches. So uh, thanks a lot, everybody, uh, both here uh, to the physical participants and also online and Zoom for joining us today. Uh, I hope that you enjoy uh, the rest of the conference in the next days. And I will also to thank uh, a lot uh, my fellow organizers, uh, Demsin Dai, uh, who really uh, organized the whole panel of speakers for today. Uh, Lucas Hoyer, who uh, helped a lot with uh, hosting the workshop and uh, uh, hosting the speakers. And also our uh, other collaborators from uh, Toyota Motor Europe, from Max Planck Institute, uh, and uh, especially uh, uh, Luke Van Hood from, from ETH, who uh, has uh, worked uh, also with the entire team for uh, all the years that we are organizing this workshop. Thanks a lot to everyone. Bye-bye. See you, Patrick.